I'm calling to order this hearing. This is a public hearing of the Committee of the Whole of the Council of the District of Columbia. I'm Phil Mendelson, Chairman of the Council and Chair of the Committee. Today is Tuesday, March 2nd, 2022. The time is 9.07 in the morning. Uh, I'm not sure this was picked up by the tape. This is a public hearing of the Committee of the Whole of the Council of the District of Columbia. The subject of this hearing is agency performance oversight, all education agencies. We have two days scheduled for this testimony. Today will be testimony from witnesses or members of the public who are not government agencies. And tomorrow we will have testimony exclusively from government agencies. We do have a large number of individuals who've signed up to testify. Uh, so witnesses will have three minutes to testify. And if they have longer statements, they can submit those. We will look at them. And the address for submitting them is www. No, COW. COW. Forget the www. COW.dccouncil.us. Um, this is the fourth, I want to say, of six hearings that the committee holds having uh, this month on. Uh, on um, Agency performance for the agencies under the committee as a whole. Tomorrow, as I said, is the um, government agencies like Deputy Mayor for Education, DCPS, DC Public Charter School Board, Office of the State Superintendent of Education, the State Board of Education. Uh, Friday, we will wrap up our performance oversight hearings with testimony focusing on the Commission on Arts and Humanities and the University of the District of Columbia. In a month, we will start up with our hearings on the mayor's proposed budget for fiscal year 23. She will be submitting that budget, her proposal, on March 16th. Uh, with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, uh, admit to the testifying room the first 20 witnesses, and they are Jessica Giles, State Director, Education Reform Now DC. David Alpert, who's president of the Ward 2 Education Council. Riley Denilko, who is with DC Action. Robert Henderson, who's with the Ward 5 Education Equity Committee. Kathy Riley, who's executive director of the Senior High Alliance of Parents, Principals, and Educators. Sandra Moscoso, who's uh, with the School Without Walls, HSA, and LSAT. Terry Savage, who's director of policy for PAVE. Katrina Owens, who's Executive Director of DC Scores. Kabila Huddleston, who's with the DC Fiscal Policy Institute. And Danielle Hamer, who's also with the DC Fiscal Policy Institute. Emmanuel Cadillo, who's with DECC. Jamar Day, who's with DC Action. Shara Greer, who's Policy Director at DC Children's Law Center. Jennifer Mampara, who's with Fresh Farm Food Prints. Rose Williams, who's community food educator with Fresh Farm Foodprints. Maria Blauer, who's with Advocates for Justice and Education. Roshanda Hillai Thomas, Executive Director of Advocates for Justice and Education. Stacey Une, who's with Advocates for Justice and Education. Alexander Moore, who's Chief Development Officer of DC Central Kitchen. And Mary Levy. Uh, so, let me welcome these folks in, or they're being let in. Uh, if you are in gallery view, you should have the timer in the top row of your screen. Please be mindful of it. Because we have so many witnesses, um, I'm gonna be a little bit stricter about the clock. Good morning to everyone. Uh, Jessica Giles, if you are here, you are first. And you're muted and you're unmuted. Hello. <laughs> Good morning, Chairman Mendelson and members and staff of the Committee of the Whole. My name, name is Jessica Giles and I'm, the, and I'm a Ward 7 resident. I am the State Director of Education Reform Now DC. Earn DC is a nonprofit organization that fights for a just and equitable public edu education system for all students in the District of, of Columbia. It's been a very difficult two years for our school communities to say the least having to adjust to the fact that the pandemic is not ending and there's no return to normal. 
Still, our students, parents, school leaders, educators, school staff, service providers, and community partners have, under extreme circumstances, adjusted and worked tirelessly to allow for schools to safely reopen and for learning to continue. Thank you. As we finish out the rest of the school year, I urge the district to strengthen its efforts to keep our stu students safe, including keeping um, mass mandate indoors as soon as, as long as possible and ensuring that our students have um, multiple and increased opportunities to be vaccinated. Currently only 36% of five to 11 year, old, year olds are partially or fully vaccinated. The Office of the Deputy Mayor for Education has outlined in its recovery roadmap how it's supporting our public education and workforce systems with local and federal recovery dollars, but there needs to be more transparency. We urge, for our number one recommendation, we urge the DME to provide greater transparency of federal investments by publishing an online detailed accounting of funding that is being used for academic recovery. Students, families, and school communities deserve to know where their, these funds are being invested. Number two, we urge the DME to conduct an adequacy study every five years to determine the appropriate UPSFF increases for all students in each student group. Um, as for the Office of the State Superintendent of, Ed of Education, we strongly support the current system of oversight of the OSI, which allows for the top education agency to be managed and run by the Office of the Mayor and by extension, the voters and parents of the District of Columbia. We urge the DC Council not to weaken this agency, but to continue to hold the mayor and OSI accountable for our education progress. Number one, um, education reform now published an analysis, analysis of OSI's art plan, assigning the district a yellow rating for approaching equity, which means there's more work to be done to ensure federal funding is directed e efficiently, effectively, transparently, and equitably to address unfinished learning and support student well-being. We encourage policymakers and advocates to follow our five recommendations. Um, number two, um, ensure the partnership for advancement of readiness for college and careers. Park exam is administered in the spring. It has been two years since the district has administered the park exam. Number three, urgently reform the dual enrollment enrollment opportunities in the district. Expand the program and deepen uh, its reach to ensure that we have um, students have maximum dual enrollment credit hours. Number four, provide sufficient funding for all K through three DCPS pu public and public charter school educators to receive free and easy structured literacy training. Number five, rethink the DC school report card and star framework. In closing, I've included our FY 2023 budget priorities. Thank you for allowing me to testify. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Ms. Giles. So do we have a copy of your statement? I sent it over just now, so thank you so much. All right, thank you. Uh, David Alpert, and good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I want to speak today about three topics, the new DCPS budget model, DCPS reopening, and Aussie regulation of preschools around COVID. First, DCPS budgets. After a period of secrecy, we now have the data on the new budget model. Is it achieving transparency, equity, and sustainability? So far, this is hard to see. Uh, in graphs I made, which I think I can't present right now, but they're in my written testimony, if you can pull it up and look at the first one, it shows each school with higher at-risk schools at the right and lower at left, higher up if it has more per pupil than last year and lower for less. I'm, this ignores stabilization funds for now. Broadly, high schools are faring best and elementary schools are faring worst. Is this intentional? There is a small positive correlation between funding changes in the new budget model and at-risk level. I support increasing funding for the high at-risk schools. Here, the volatility somewhat swamps the positive effect in that many high at-risk schools lose as well while others gain. For instance, Baloo gains, but Anacostia loses under the formula. La Salbacus loses out versus Whittier, which does not, even though those are similarly situated in terms of at-risk level. Stabilization funds then fill in some of the large holes created in school budgets. Unfortunately, much is one-time funds and there's no information on how they were signed. It's very welcome for schools which otherwise would lose several staff, but they now face a large cliff the next fiscal year unless there's another one-time grant outside an election year or the council passes a bill. Also stabilization did not fully hold schools harmless. Many in Ward 2 lost half a staff member or the like, but others like Thompson say they've lost three to four as of last we heard. Second, I wanna talk about reopening. 
Extended school closures last year led to many hardships for children. Last summer, the mayor committed to get schools open and they have stayed open. I know that was not an easy task at times, and I appreciate the work of everyone at DCPS to make this happen. Of course, there have been challenges, like the promise from October to add staff to help with COVID management, which was long delayed or still not fulfilled. But DCPS has largely delivered for children. I can't be as positive about Aussie's regulation of preschools. My son's preschool classmates under five have missed several weeks this year in January and February due to quarantines, even though we have tests to tell us if they have COVID or not. And the CDC recommends tests to stay, but there is no test to stay and no response from Aussie or DOH to repeated parent pleas. Meanwhile, the administration has been aggressively rolling back other requirements, like at businesses and museums and restaurants and so forth. Either there's a serious health risk, in which case the rollbacks are dangerous, or as seems more likely, there is not, in which case children are just being forgotten. Do the needs of tourists trump DC parents? I hope you can find out why there is no motion on test to stay, which the CDC recommends for preschools, but rollbacks everywhere else. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alpert. Uh, Riley Dinoco. Good morning, Chairman Mendelssohn and members of the committee. Thanks for the opportunity to address the council today. My name is Riley Danelko and I'm a policy analyst at DC Action, home of the DC Out of School Time Coalition. This is a crucial moment for OST and the district. An infusion of temporary federal funds for education and OST are, are bolstering learning opportunities. Leadership transitions are occurring at both Learn24 and the Aussie division that oversees the 21st Century Community Learning Center grants. The strategic, the strategic plan for the Learn24 office is reaching the end of its three-year time period, and young people continue to experience a range of academic, mental, and emotional impacts from the ongoing pandemic. Given all of these factors, education agencies must move forward with community engagement as a top priority in the following ways. First, the district should create an updated strategic plan for OST in partnership with families, youth, educators, OST programs, and community partners to ensure access to in-demand programs for all youth. This plan must be based on current data about OST participation and access, including information about gaps in service by neighborhood and program type, about OST opportunities, including those for students with special needs and those who are English language learners. We urge the district to include OST stakeholders in the planning, data collection, and analysis of this critically important data. Second, as the mayor and council look at priorities for FY23, they must dedicate local recurring dollars to supplant the one-time federal relief investments, starting with investing an additional $2 million in the FY23 budget to ensure that the OST sector does not experience major disruptions when these funds expire, which will undo any, made, any progress made in filling gaps or building capacity in the two years covered by these funds. Third, the OST office should commit to improving the way it shares information about OST programs and opportunities with families. To better connect young people with programs that meet their needs and align with their interests, the office must overhaul the online program finder tool and develop additional ways to match students with programs. Fourth, the district has an affirmative responsibility to improve transparency and accessibility of OST funding, allocation, and spending. The office should provide updates on the progress of the programs and initiatives funded by the investments from federal and local dollars last year, and how they are helping provide greater access to OST for uh, DC youth and families. Programs have also shared concerns about a lack of transparency around individual grant application reviews, scoring, and appeals. To ensure that this process is fair, objective, and founded on evidence-based program offerings, Aussie and the OST office must commit to increasing transparency with, within grant applications. And finally, planning for summer learning has um, already started both in schools and in OST programs, and district education agencies must make intentional efforts to partner with programs now to ensure that DC youth and families have access to enriching, affordable, and joyful activities this summer. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. You should have my written statement with more details, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Tinoco. Uh, Robert Henderson. Good morning. I'm a resident of the Fort Lincoln neighborhood in Ward 5, a parent and vice chair of the Ward 5 Education Equity Committee. My testimony reflects my own views, but is also informed by conversations with Ward 5 parents, teachers, and students, and guest speakers at our Ward 5 Education Equity Committee meetings. 
I think we can judge the performance of all education ed agencies only by the system of public ed education they have produced and the outcomes that that system achieves. And the measure of performance cannot just be how test scores compare now to 15 years ago or how historic the budget increase is over last year. The only standard that matters is, are we adequately and equitably meeting the needs of all of our students? Sadly, I think we are not. Our system of public schools remains highly segregated and deeply inequitable. We inadequately fund our schools, barely or not quite keeping up with rising costs, patching together emergency or temporary funds for vital positions. At-risk funds are routinely diverted from the students for whom they are meant. We have wide disparities in facilities conditions. Too many of our schools have chronic problems with leaking roofs and plumbing, inconsistent or non-functional HVAC systems, or poor ventilation. And our current modernization process leaves too many students waiting in unacceptable conditions. We cannot continue to accept the unacceptable. We have to do something big to achieve educational equity. And I don't see that happening under our current governance system. It is not enough to plod along hoping for incremental progress here and there. We need a fundamental transformation and it can't simply be to create more options that some people might access through a lottery. It has to be a guaranteed right to a higher standard of facilities conditions, course offerings and financial supports and more, even our lunches. We have to budget for something big. We don't really have time for a meantime, but in the meantime, we are facing an ongoing and escalating teacher retention crisis. Both administrators and teachers have had COVID related responsibilities and pressures heaped upon them with no corresponding relief from their usual responsibilities and pressures. We have to treat our teachers as the professionals and experts that they are. They need more autonomy, flexibility, and planning time, less time devoted to tasks they don't believe are helpful to their students like RCTs, and in many cases, higher pay. I urge you to look closely at the findings and recommendations of Empower Ed on teacher retention and to ask the government witnesses about their plans for next year. Finally, on COVID safety, our LEAs have had disparate records with DCPS failing to proactively or responsibly make sound decisions, most recently during the Omicron surge last December. While several charter LEAs took preventative measures such as shifting to virtual instruction or canceling classes as COVID cases ramped up, and required PCR tests for return. I've enclosed as an appendix the recommendations of the Ward 5 Education Equity Committee on COVID safety as the pandemic continues. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Kathy Riley. I don't see her here. Uh, she appears, we'll call her. Sandra, oh, Kathy Riley, are you here? Followed by Sandra Scoso. Oh, can you hear me now? Okay, great. Thank you. Chairman Mendelson and members of the council, I appreciate this opportunity to testify to you on the oversight and budget of public education. My name is Kathy Riley, and I'm the director of the Senior High Alliance of Parents, Principals, and Educators, SHAPE, for, and the convener of the Ward 4 Ed Alliance and C4DC. For Ward 4, I am attaching a letter sent to the mayor. It details some of the crucial issues of Ward 4, including the persistent and serious facility issues, ranging from mice and rats on site to problems with key entry and exit, bursting steam pipes, and as always, HVAC systems. Further, as you will hear today, the deep concern with appropriate swing space for three elementary schools waiting for modernization in Ward 4. The first is Truesdale, a neighborhood school where 85% of children walk are slated to go to a Garnet Pedersen. It is our belief that there is a space in Ward 4 to accommodate the families of these schools. A second issue for Ward 4 and for SHAPE is the unsustainability of two high schools sharing one building. Roosevelt High School is the neighborhood school of right with a projected enrollment of 868. And Roosevelt Stay, a citywide opportunity academy with a projected enrollment of 590. The building was built for 1,000. The plans, as far as we know for next year, with an increase in enrollment and staff for these two schools are not tenable, either educationally or from a safety perspective. Suggestions for two or three days 
Use the week of the library or auditorium from an almost 900 student neighborhood high school is unacceptable. It's also wrong for the state students, many of whom are, are of high school age. Suggestions that Roosevelt High School could possibly schedule large classes of 40 plus and just add a teacher to deal with space limits are irresponsible. DCPS is aware of this issue and has said they are working on it. We do not know what options are being explored. The lack of any process on this has hurt before. Stay was converted. Stay was converted to a um, to a day program in 2014 with absolutely no input. Stay should have its own facility. They deserve more. As has been stated, the high schools fared pretty well in this budget, and this means that for ninth and tenth graders, there may be smaller classes, or three or four, third or fourth year of a language. We'd like to see, you know, more happen on that front, as has been noted. There's a lot of concern about too many schools falling off the fiscal cliff, and then, and final, I'd like to say that the mental health still rose to the top at every meeting I attended, and it's larger than just social workers. The Young Women's Project to talk about highlighted the difficulty in knowing what supports are available. So we need more attention to mental health across, across the system and across the city. One suggestion that came up is maybe this should be a citywide initiative that affects all families. So thank you and we look forward to working with you. Thank you, Ms. Riley. I don't have a copy of your statement. Um, yes, I, I did send it at uh, eight o'clock this morning, so you yeah. should have it. No, apparently I'm being told by staff that the printer ran out of paper. I guess that's what happened. Okay, thank you. Witnesses, but I do have it, so uh, thank you. Thank you. The next witness is Sandra Moscoso. I do not see her. Um, so let me go to Carrie Savage. Is Carrie Savage here? And I'm being told that uh, Sandra Moscoso is here and is being admitted. If we had in-person, nobody would be admitted or excused. But then again, you'd all have to sit here in the chamber. Um, Ms. Moscoso, you're up. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman and Council Members. I'm Sandra Moscoso, a DCPS parent. And today I'm providing testimony as a board member of the DC Open Government Coalition. I'll provide additional detail in, in a written testimony. First, I ask that council insist on transparency around the DCPS budget process. DCPS rolled out a new budget framework changing the way schools are funded, touting transparency as a key principle, but the process was vague, information sessions provided no details, and multiple requests by the community, by community members and by DC council asking for school level mock budgets went unanswered. Budgets were then suddenly released late February, late on February 7th, and principals were given one week to digest the numbers, learn to, use, learn to use a new system, and try to engage school communities. You'll hear more today from experts and activists, but now that the dust has settled, we are learning that the new budget model will mean schools get less, not more. Most schools will avoid cuts in, school, in fiscal year 23 thanks to an array of stability funds allocated via an opaque process. What is clear about these stability funds is that they are one-time, they are one-time allocation and schools feel more uncertain than ever about their ability to fund basic programming and educate the, the children of the city. Secondly, I asked for a hearing to help the public understand the protocols followed by DCPS and related agencies in identifying, reporting, and communicating positive COVID cases to families and staff. In the weeks before the winter break, the system became overwhelmed and failed to keep up with positive cases identified at the school level, effectively suppressing numbers. On December 23rd, the last day of school before break, 887 cases were dumped on the DCPS notifications website, case notifications website, revealing positive cases had ballooned within, these, within schools for weeks while families and staff were kept in the dark. By then, 25 schools had moved to virtual instruction, and to date, there is no transparency over how the decisions to close a classroom or a school are made. While the Omicron outbreak has subsided and may feel like a distant past, it revealed that there was no plan for how to manage a spike in cases within our schools. We all deserve transparency into what went wrong, 
not to pound on the system we're all here to support, but to ensure schools have the resources they need and processes in place to prevent what happened in December from happening again when another spike hits. Especially since as of February 23rd, only 24 out of, of sorry, only 34 out of 116 schools have been assigned a COVID response coordinator. So I will, uh, I will submit written testimony with more details um, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Moscoso. Uh, Carrie Savage, are you here? Do not see you. Katrina Owens, good morning. Good morning, I'm Katrina Owens, uh, Ward 4 resident, DCPS parent, and the executive director at DC Scores. Since 1994, we've provided free, high quality out of school time programming to more than 25,000 children in partnership with DC public and public charter schools. This school year, we've returned to full in-person programming at over 60 partner school sites for 3,000 elementary and middle school aged children. I wanna start by thanking you, Chairman Mendelson, the entire council and the mayor for increasing the out-of-school time funding for this fiscal year. Throughout our organization's history, we've known that DC Scores makes a difference in kids' lives. But during the pandemic and coming into this new normal, it has been even more apparent. We've recently received data that supports the change that DC Scores makes for our poet athletes. Our external evaluators reviewed three years of data comparing DC Scores participants to non-participants. And they found that DC, Ports, DC scores participants had 10% higher attendance rates, 16% higher reading and writing grades, and 15% higher park ELA performance levels than non-participants. DC scores programming is transforming kids' lives. This study was funded through our previous 21st century grant from Aussie. DC scores historically has received funding from Aussie for high quality programming that is deeply embedded into schools. After six years of facilitating this programming, our grant was denied this past, past August. We scrambled to support schools that were excited for this deep partnership this school year and summer that cannot happen since we did not receive this funding. We've met with new leadership at 21st Century and look forward to reapplying next year. We are recommending and hoping for more transparency in the review process upfront to support critical long-term investments. DC Scores also receives funding from our partners at the Deputy Mayor's Office for Education, the Office of Out of School Time. This office has been a critical partner to DC Scores and the entire OST community since it was created. Not only has the office provided consistent funding, but they have also worked in partnership with OST programs to increase the quality of programming through professional development and collaborative data gathering. We are concerned about the transition in leadership and who will be identified to lead the office next. My hope is that the next leader will also prioritize elevating the quality of programming through partnership with the OST community. Again, thank you to the chairman and council. And during this time of continual transition uncertainty, DC scores and OST programs like ours are a consistent, powerful partner for school communities, kids and families. I'm gonna end quickly with the snaps, little snippet from a poem from Burville Elementary School in Ward 7. It's called, It's Me, The Future Me. It's me, the future me. I see myself in a lab coat, maybe a scientist or an inventor. I want to make the world a better place. I see myself in a lab always where I'm trying to make great things, experiments or where I am at my best. I see me, the future me, scientist or inventor. That's me. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Owens. You're getting some clips from staff here. Um, next is Camilla Huddleston, the DC Fiscal Policy Institute. Well, Chairperson Mendelson and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Quavila Huddleston and I'm a policy analyst at the DC Fiscal Policy Institute. My testimony focuses on the need for DC public schools to, to improve its individual school budgeting process and overall budget transparency. DCFPI recommends that DCPS engage principals and local school advisory teams around school budgets earlier in the school year, give schools more than 10 business days to revise their budgets, um, and publishly, excuse me, and publish consistently formatted budget documents and make school budget documents in Excel format publicly available. Um, my testimony, uh, testimony also has other recommendations around um, Aussie, but um, I'm not gonna review that 
um, since I only have three minutes. Um, so as you know, Chairperson Mendel saying the DCPS budget process is disjointed. Um, we strongly urge DCPS to engage principals and LSATs earlier in the school year. Um, we were really pleased to see the council urge DCPS to both release mock versions of school budgets under the new budget model and to release school budgets earlier than the status quo timeline. Um, this is something that our organization and many others um, have urged DCPS to do. Um, you know, the fact that DCPS does not engage schools in budget conversations until early winter, months after the mayor has already spoken to the chancellor and given agencies to determine their programmatic needs um, is a problem. Uh, so and it's a problem for many reasons, such as um, DCPS is, you know, setting a target that is uninformed by what schools actually need. And it also means that principals and LSATs, they're not able to hope for an initial budget that allows them to innovate or grow programs that could help reduce racial and income gaps in student learning. There's also disparities in like budget familiarity within LSATs. And so you have some LSATs that are able to work really quickly or they know who to contact to get what they want. And those LSATs typically are at schools where there are more white families or families with higher incomes. Um, and that certainly creates disparities um, in the budgeting process and outcomes. Um, we also have big issues with the inconsistencies and the DCPS budgeting documents. Um, you'll see different formats from year to year. You may see different information in the initial budget documents compared to the submitted budget documents. There's also different information between the PDFs and what's on the visualizations. And I'm a budget policy analyst and sometimes I struggle to follow the money. I can imagine how a parent or you know, a student who just wants to know what's going on with their school's budget could possibly navigate all of that. So we are really urging DCPS um, to be more consistent um, and provide information that makes sense um, and is, is just it formatted in a way that we can actually make comparisons. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Danielle Hamer. Chairman Mendelson and committee members, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Danielle Hammer, and I am a policy associate at DCFPI. DCFPI is a member of Under 3 DC, a coalition committed to securing a strong start for infants and toddlers in DC. Today, my testimony focuses on ensuring district officials quickly act on the Early Childhood Educator Compensation Task Force's recommendations and continue to advance policies aimed at equitable outcomes for early educators and the childcare sector. This includes efficiently dispersing salary enhancements this fiscal year while securing counseling for early educators who may lose benefits as a result. To achieve parity and equity in the permanent compensation programs, lawmakers should both incorporate health benefits as a crucial part of compensation and monitor the subsidy program to ensure that compensation across the industry supports and doesn't harm DC's lowest income families and those accessing subsidized care. Based on the task force recommendation, DC will ensure early educators can apply for pay supplements before September 2022. It is crucial that Aussie disperses the enhancement payments swiftly to implement these hard won benefits, a first step in addressing the long standing devaluation of care work and economic struggles of the majority black and brown women that make up our early learning workforce. As the task force develops its final recommendations for a permanent program, it should prioritize advancing a proposal that addresses health care. As out, outlined in the birth to three law, parity means compensation equivalent to salary and benefits of DCPS elementary teachers. The parity program should at a minimum include a comparable salary scale to DCPS teachers and then work and healthcare and then work toward incorporating the remaining fringe benefits. Uh, Washington State recently implemented legislation that provides healthcare marketplace subsidies specifically targeted for early educators. Emerging evidence from the program demonstrates that the take-up rate is low considering the pool of educators covered under Medicaid and receiving employer benefits. Those who most need affordable health care have access to it, but program costs can stay low because early educators who can stay in Medicaid or prefer current insurance options will not rely on subsidies. By establishing a program similar to this, district leaders could target the limited but crucial funds necessary to secure health care for early educators who will lose Medicaid benefits. 
Finally, the compensation program should not create further disparities in the childcare sectors and harm the majority black and brown families who rely on childcare subsidies. The task force is considering incorporating an equity adjustment into the compensation formula um, based on the percentage of enrolled children whose family uses subsidy. DCFPI encourages the council to ensure this adjustment along with the task force recommendations as a whole provide high quality care and learning environments. Um, lawmakers should ensure the proposal does not disincentivize providers to care for children enrolled in the subsidy program if it fails to establish a clear prioritization for, for providers who take on subsidy students. There are risks that the number of providers in the subsidy program may decline or stagnate. All educators should be compensated fairly and low income families should have access to high quality care across the district. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hammer. Emmanuel Codillo. Um, good morning, Chairman. This is Emmanuel Codillo. Sorry about that. Just uh, got into the uh, got into the. To, to the speaking part, but um, well, good morning. Uh, good morning, Chairman. Good morning, uh, council members of the council. My name is Emmanuel Caldillo, representing uh, DEC, DC Education Coalition for Change. We are an organization that improves educational equity for our students um, all across uh, the DC. And it, we've been working to ensure our students have the opportunity to succeed here in DC and, and to work to ensure that um, we work together with our communities together to ensure that we have the resources to our students, and especially in the time of, of the pandemic and trying to regain learning loss and ensuring that our students are doing well in regards to mental health and having the resources to succeed here. Um, I wanna make my, my, my remarks short. Um, it really is about uh, looking for budget transparency. Um, DC has been, DCPS has been receiving a lot of federal funding, once in a generation investments in education, but we know that those fundings don't last, won't last forever. And we wanna make sure that the funding that has been received in DSPS is being used um, appropriately. And so in other words, we need to have more transparency to ensure where our funds are going, to ensure that they're going to the schools, to our students who have the most need, for those who have been uh, compounded, not just with inequities, but also with the, um, also with the, the pandemic as well and the things that they faced. And so it's important to ensure that um, our stakeholders, our, our parents, our students, our community members could follow where the funding is going in regards to, to our schools in DC and make it easier to ensure that we're able to, you know, to ensure that together we work together to ensure all our students have the appropriate resources to succeed in, in schools here in DC. And so um, it's something that, that's important to us. It's something that, that we think it's important to have a, a, an easy to follow process that anybody could follow because that's important to know that our money is being used where it's needed and not simply somewhere hidden and we don't know how to follow it. And so that's just, that's the thing that uh, I speak here today is just better budget transparency for our education funding. And I'll be uh, delivering my, um, uh, my written testimony to you uh, later today. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jamar Day with DC Action. Is Jamar Day here? Yes, how you doing, um, Chairman? I'm here. I'm oh, yes, you. There you are. Good morning, Chairman Menderson, members of the Committee to Whole, and my fellow advocates. I am Jamar Day, community organizer for the Under 3 DC Coalition, working for full implementation of the Birth to 3 law. Since the law was passed in 2018, we have come before you with stats and research on why we need birth to three law to be fully funded and implemented. You have listened and become champions for early education. Thank you all for standing on the right side of history. While we have accomplished so, we have, while we have accomplished some big goals in so little time, there's so much more work to do. My testimony today is focused on why we need the Office of State Superintendent of Education, AKA OSI, to rapidly develop and release a timeline that describes how they plan to implement the early educator pay supplements this year. This year's pay supplement will go a long way towards making life easier for some of the district's early education teachers. This past Saturday, we hosted a community meeting to inform teachers about the early educator task force recommendations and what should they expect. Everyone was confused. 
we shared the task force FAQ um, and we discovered that teachers are unsure about their license designa um, designation and therefore they're not sure if they'll be eligible for the pay stipend, stipend or not. We recommend that OSSI quickly create and disseminate the next steps for a timeline of implementation or the agency's plan for um, the pay that supplement this year. Failure to do so sooner than later will further confuse teachers and lead to a lack of trust. OSSI should be in the process of laying out a transparent plan of action to ensure every teacher eligible receives the pay supplement they have earned. Many of these educators have their own family and like other DC families, they continue to navigate uncertain times as we work to recover from the pandemic. They made sacrifices at the height of the pandemic that enabled other parents to work and we must protect them as well too. We must keep our commitment to them while we improve our system of childcare and um, ensure the most vulnerable children in DC are not left behind. I thank you for the opportunity to testify and I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Day. I don't have a copy of your statement. You'll be sending it? Yes, it was sent over. All right, we'll take a look, we'll look for it. Ashara Greer, who's with the DC Children's Law Center. Good morning, Chairman Mendelson and members of the committee. I am Shara Greer, the Policy Director at the Children's Law Center. I'm a resident of the district and a parent of two DCPS students. I'm testifying today on behalf of the Children's Law Center, which fights so every DC child can grow up with a stable family, good health, and a quality education. Through our work, we represent DC students who regularly face barriers in accessing their education. In our medical legal partnership, we represent parents who are fighting for their child's right to access special education services. Our clients in foster care face a myriad of challenges with their education, including issues around educational continuity. Our testimony and recommendations today arise from our experience representing students who are often the furthest from opportunity. As was true at last year's oversight hearing, the public health crisis continues to pose unprecedented challenges for the education sector. Our public schools cannot simply return to normal. First, because normal was failing many students even before the pandemic. And second, because schools are far from returning to their pre-pandemic operations. Schools, teachers, students, and families are continuing to deal with tremendous challenges. As we envision what the future of public education could look like, we encourage the committee and the education sector as a whole to ensure the imposition of accountability measures and metrics is met with investments and supports. Schools, governments have accountability measures to ensure that they are receiving returns on investments and there is progress that is measurable. However, there are limits to which accountability on its own is sufficient to ensure desired outcomes. Public schools have many examples of this. Threats of truancy cases or failure of classes is not sufficient to get students to school every day. Obligations of federal law are not sufficient to ensure that schools provide students with disabilities all the services required by their individualized education plans under the IDA. Threat of consequences is not sufficient to ensure things get done if the task is overwhelming or impossible. Across the education sector, the pandemic has created new challenges for stakeholders to overcome. However, it's also highlighted several ways in which the system was already broken and we've long been failing students furthest from opportunity. If we as a city are to achieve our educational goals, we cannot impose accountability on schools, teachers, children, and families without also supporting them in their efforts to meet those requirements. I did submit extensive written testimony that identifies many ways in which the education sector should do more to support stakeholders in meeting their obligations. Some are relatively simple regulatory and statutory changes. Most are more difficult and require addressing the severe workforce shortages. We have special education teacher workforce shortages, general education teacher workforce shortages, staff to provide services to students with disabilities are at a premium right now and are simply not there. We're also having workforce shortages around school-based mental health professionals and mental health professionals in general. We've asked so much of our teachers, students, and families over the past two years. In order to move forward, we must ensure that everyone has what they need to thrive and learn. I thank you for this opportunity to testify and I welcome any questions. Thank you, Ms. Greer. Jennifer Mampara. Hi. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify and thank you to DCPS and to all the city council members for supporting experiential food education over many years. My name is Jen Mampara. I'm a Ward 6 resident and director of education at Fresh Farm. Fresh Farm's Food Prints program embeds hands-on food education in DC public elementary schools and over the past 14 years has demonstrated a significant return on investment for the city. 
Thanks to city investment in food prints this year, children at 19 DC public schools have additional staff who are exclusively focused on providing hands-on experiences that support food and nutrition education, environmental science, and social emotional learning and healing. We employ a team of 36 people, of which 31 are in schools on a daily basis, working directly with students. 86% of our staff are DC residents, and we provide robust professional development for our team, which is working to build a workforce of food educators in the district who are having a tremendously positive impact in the school communities and neighborhoods they support. Our team engages more than 7,000 students every month in food prints programming. We anticipate that we'll conduct um, at least 2,100 food print sessions this school year. Funding for our staff ensures that gardens at these schools are well maintained all year, that students are directly involved, and that all the produce that's grown is in them is put to use, and that everything we do is directly tied to DCPS curriculum. So what are students experience been experiencing because of funding the city has provided for food prints? They are discovering that they love vegetables. They are engaging in real world meaningful work. They are experiencing pride and joy in their accomplishments. They're making validating, affirming connections to their own lives. They're expanding their dreams for their futures. They're successfully working together with purpose and they're building an understanding of and appreciation for the natural world. We understand that DCPS is hesitant to continue funding this program since we do not reach all schools and that this raises a concern about equity. However, we believe that funding from the city is exactly what does make this program equitable. Otherwise, partnerships like this are much more accessible to schools that have high functioning PTAs. Large foundations have repeatedly told us that Food Prince needs a sustained commitment from the city in order to attract major philanthropy, we hear that if it's clear that the city is committed to sustaining the program, that it is a safer, more desirable investment. Ideally, what we'd like to see is that the city recognizes the value of funding partners for outdoor education at all schools. This funding could be connected to the school meals program and implementation of the DC Healthy Schools Act, and school leaders could choose to begin using it when it feels like a good fit for their community. Providing $100,000 to each elementary school every year for outdoor education would be a transformative investment that would go a long way towards providing equitable access and making the nation's capital a leader in whole child education. There's more in my testimony and there's also links to our curriculum and instructional videos and some research we've done that's been supported by investments from the city. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vampara. I don't have a copy of your statement. I've submitted it, so I'll send it again right now. Please do. Uh, next is Rose Williams, also with Foodprint. Is she here? Greetings. I'm oh, Rose Williams, an actively engaged Ward 8 resident and a native Washingtonian with a, with a true dedication to the city. As parents, my husband and I chose DCPS the same system that, that we attended to educate our now young to adult children. Um, during my son's elementary school years at Watkins, he experienced a phenomenal firsthand exp exposure to the Food Prince program. Um, it greatly has impacted his life. To witness the pure joy of a six-year-old child digging up a sweet potato that grew in, your, grew in his school garden the size of a football is a vision that will never fade. My son learned his love of Brussels sprouts at Food Prince, and to this day, they remain a regular rotation in the Williams family dinner table. Now, many years later, as a community food educator at the Simon Elementary community with this, with this phenomenal program, I'm getting to engage children and families to, to, eat, to eat and enjoy more fresh fruits and vegetables, gardening, and and exploring the food ecosystem from a hands-on lens. I get to engage these, these families as we share parallel, par parallel paths in our lives, and I get to share my, my love and joy of food. After moving to our forever home in Ward 8 and experiencing the food desert from, from the ground level, I Quickly, it quickly led my energy to support the Produce Plus program and the Produce Plus Rec prescription program throughout the ward. 
The area around Simon and its surrounding is amp has ample green space and is bellowing, bellowing to be cultivated and planted upon. With the installation of the wet of the well nearing completion, that is that is scheduled to invaluable outdoor education for young family, young children and their families. I'm fortunate to have witnessed firsthand the support that the Ward 8 Council member and, and Ward 8 native Treon White has made to greatly impacting the, the, impacting the insecurities of food and the other health challenges that have plagued the ward for far too long. Today, I share, I close by asking you to please continue to equally fund, please continue to make a collective decision to equally fund the food print program. So families at Simon and Garfield and other Ward 8 community schools will get to enjoy the opportunities and the exposure to fresh, nutritious food and, and the understanding of the food system in their lives. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Williams. I think you said you were a uh, parent at Watkins? I'm a, former, I'm a former parent from Watkins and a Ward 8 resident, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and we do have your statement, Ms. Mampara. Uh, we got your statement as well. Carrie Savage, I believe you've joined us. Could you? Yes, thank you, Chairman. I apologize for the delay. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson and members of the Committee of the Whole and Council staff. My name is Carrie Savage. I'm the Director of Policy at PAVE. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the district's public education agencies. When I look back at this past year, a year aimed at recovery and adjustment to, persistent, to the persistent pandemic, I'm flooded with emotions. I think first of my own mother, a school nurse in New York, who spends countless unpaid hours beyond the workday, who is dedicated to filling gaps in the system that makes sure kids are safe, healthy, and cared for. Despite her hectic schedule and burnout she feels, she still took time to take phone calls from paid parents here in DC to help them navigate health policies that are not clearly communicated to them. Parents who have not been met with the care or empathy they deserve. I think of the school leaders, teachers, school nurses, mental health professionals, and dedicated school staff in the district who have gone to Herculean lengths to care for our kids during one of the most challenging eras in our lifetime. I think of all the young people in DC who despite all of the pressures, traumas, and fractures in our education system continue to build and demonstrate their potential power through their smiles, artwork, writing, academic progress, classroom conversations, activism in the community, and more. And last but certainly not least, I think of paid parent leaders who despite all that they carry have outlined exactly what they want to see from the system and our DC leaders to improve not just their experience, but the lived experiences of all families in DC now and for generations to come. I've included their full vision statement for their top two priorities, school-based mental health and out-of-school time programs in my written testimony. As you can see, they have put an enormous amount of time and work to learn the existing policies and practices, engage in in-depth conversations with parents across DC about what's working and where there are gaps, and then brainstorm bold and specific solutions together. They will share these specifics with you today and why they are so needed from their lived experience. So I will use my remaining time to sum up what I've heard from countless conversations with our partners. We can and must do more. Here's what paid families who are closest to kids want to see. Around school-based mental health, the comprehensive needs assessment. We have a groundbreaking school-based behavioral health model that was designed collaboratively and strategically blends resources to expand access to care. This model is years in the making and sets a strong foundation, but without intervention, we stagnate its progress. We need robust investments to make sure existing methods we have of assessing needs reach all families, not just those with privilege, and communicate those findings clearly so families can be meaningfully engaged in the plan to meet those needs. We need 300,000 for a cost study to determine the actual cost in, of the need and inform budget planning in the future. We need a strong accountability system. Simply families want to know what investments and resources are provided and if they are being used well. They don't have, have access to that information and we need to know what accountability and oversight will look like for that. Around out of school time programs, we need increased funding. Providers are ready to scale. Let's give them consistent local dollars. We need a strategic plan to expand access to programs with families. We have the office to do that. We need a leader and investments in the work to make sure those conversations are happening. 
We cannot grade performance on anything less on how we provide every child an awesome education with access to an excellent and consistent care. And I urge you to listen to families about these top priorities to make that vision a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Savage. Uh, I don't have a copy of your statement. Can you send it, please? Yes, we'll resend it in. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Chairman, I believe you're muted. My apologies. Uh, you were muted. Uh, you're up. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Um, my name is Maria Boyer, and I am the Director of Programs and Outreach at Advocates for Justice and Education. Um, again, thank you very much, um, Chairman Mendelson and Council Member Lewis George for being here today and other members of the committee. I, we really appreciate the opportunity to testify. AJE is the Federally Designated Parent Training and Information Center for the District of Columbia, and we are also the Family to Family Health Information Center for the District of Columbia. Every year, we, assessed hundred, we assist hundreds of families not through direct services, training, advocacy, in navigating the district's public health and health care systems. This is especially true for children with disabilities and special health care needs. Naturally, this means that we work with many charter families, and my testimony today will focus on the experiences of students in charter schools and the work of the Public Charter School Board. Rashonda Hiley Thomas, our executive director, is also here today, and she'll be discussing ASI and ASI's role in this work, and senior staff attorney um, Stacey Yune will be discussing DCPS. I see that she was able to join, so I'm happy about that. Previously, she was stuck in um, webinar, and our we also have provided extensive written comments um, that are available to you as well. As in previous years, my comments around the charter sector will focus on three areas, governance, school discipline, and charter capacity. I will also highlight throughout my testimony a lack, you know, how the lack of a comprehensive education data system makes those challenges in the areas of governance, school discipline, and capacity even harder to address. One theme that runs through the testimony of all three AJE witnesses is how our education system does not have the excess, does not have any excess capacity in it right now to meet the growing demands that are placed on it. Historically, the PCSB and affiliated organizations have resisted much needed school governance, monitoring and oversight um, of the charter sector by OSSI and even occasionally the council. This tension between the charter's need for autonomy and the state's need to oversee the charter sector did not benefit children. However, I'm happy that one thing that the COVID response made clear and that unfortunately needed to be made clear is that there are real limits to the autonomy of charter schools. And we were happy to see that there was no serious opposition from the charter sector to um, increase regulation and oversight by both the executive and the council during this time. We hope this portends an increase in collaborative problem solving um, between the charter sector, the council, executive agencies, and also the PCSB. However, awareness of and compliance with their obligations still remains a challenge for many charter schools, especially in the areas of school discipline. Another continuing concern we have is the fact that students in the charter sector do not have the right to be taught by licensed and credentialed teachers. We again ask the council to work with OSSI, the PCSB, and other stakeholders to create a clear democratic structure over which the charter, over the charter sector, that ensures that students in the charter sector are not less protected and have fewer rights because their parents exercise their right to school choice. Um, this is again another place where the lack of a data system negatively impacts students. I see I'm short on time. So I will just remind you again, school discipline remains a space where we see significant disparities in school discipline, and we are still working with charters to establish full implementation of the Student Fair Access to School Act. Um, some charters are still embracing the zero tolerance policies that the school, the Student Fair Access to School Act was designed to um, limit. Restraint and seclusion is another area. You'll see my written comments where we have significant concerns and would ask that the council take Ms. action. Ms. Blair, you are over your time. Yep, and thank you. Thank you. Uh, Roshonda Hillai-Thomas. 
Good morning, Chairman Mendelson um, and members of the committee. I am Rashonda Halley Thomas, a War for a resident, a DCPS and public charter school parent, and executive director of Advocates for Justice in Education. Today, I'm testifying on behalf of AJE on the Office of the State Superintendent of Education. Um, my colleague Maria has already identified our role as the Parent Training and Information Center. The last year remained challenging for families, children, educators, and schools. We recognize the steps and the efforts Aussie has taken to address some of the educational challenges experienced, including providing updated guidance on IDA resources and technical assistance to LEAs to serve students with disabilities. However, there are areas where we think Aussie can strengthen its efforts to address the needs of DC children. My testimony today will focus on three of those areas. One, compensatory education services. We were pleased to see that Aussie updated its guidance to LEAs in November, incorporating the U.S. Department of Education's return to school roadmap, which made clear LEA's obligation to consider compensatory services for students who missed out or had limited or reduced access to special education services. Some families AJE has worked with upon the return to in-person learning were unaware that compensatory services should even be considered by schools. We therefore urge Aussie to have LEAs take a proactive approach in assessing individual students' needs for compensatory services. And also consistent with their monitoring and compliance responsibilities um, to ensure that LEAs are carrying out this obligation in accordance with federal and local guidance. Two, transportation. Families are still experiencing challenges with transportation, including late arrival and drop off, not having updated pickup information, even though it has been provided by a parent or instances where a child has been suspended from Aussie's transportation. While Aussie provides reimbursement to parents for transportation costs when there's a failure to, of Aussie to transport a student, this approach alone is inequitable and does not account for families who are not financially positioned to bear the upfront costs of transportation, especially to certain non-public schools that are miles away and are not accessible by Metro. Aussie has come up with some innovative solutions that could address some of these challenges as was represented by uh, Maria at the last special education roundtable, but they remain unimplemented or haven't been implemented yet. Uh, some of those solutions that remain unimplemented include a parent portal that allows parents to verify address, information, pick up or drop off locations, an app that parents can use to track buses their children are riding on. This was supposed to be piloted um, most recently as of January, but it has not occurred yet. And three, an upfront stipend for parents to assume the responsibility of transportation themselves, if necessary, but without the burden of bearing the cost. Uh, we also encourage Aussie to make sure that information for LEA reimbursement is widely available so the LEAs can step in and help ensure students receive a FAPE and then seek reimbursement. Um, the last item touches on chapter 30 regulations. We just urge Aussie to issue those regulations, final regulations sooner rather than later. So there's time for technical assistance to LEA and to make sure that there's a public campaign for families to be aware of those new regulations so they can know what to expect from schools. That's important to accountability. Um, as Maria mentioned, we have provided detailed written testimony and I see I'm out of time and I will leave with that. Just recommend that um, Aussie take those additional steps and that the council continue to ensure quality early education remains a priority. We stand with our under three DC coalition on that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Holly Thomas. Uh, Stacy Une. Good morning. My name is Stacy Une. I'm a resident of Ward 1, and I'm senior staff attorney at Advocates for Justice and Education. My testimony will highlight areas of DCPS's performance relevant for the council to consider. Since DC schools returned to in-person learning, DCPS schools have ramped up its use of suspensions. AJE has advised and represented several families whose students were suspended without due process or in violation of the Student Fair Access to School Act. Several families have reported that DCPS staff suspended their students without providing any written notice or even summaries of facts to describe the alleged behavior violation. We have also seen that schools will suspend students before their school discipline hearing can even take place, although there are no emergency circumstances to justify it. Improper emergency suspensions are usually violations of a student's due process rights that are often never remedied, even if it's later determined by an administrative law judge, DCPS did not have authority to suspend. We're also concerned because we have seen multiple cases of schools using involuntary transfers to remove students from its behavior 
as a way of sidestepping their responsibilities in school discipline regulations and laws. DCPS attorneys have attempted to justify involuntary transfers for quote, safety reasons, saying it is not about behavior or discipline, but these are meaningless distinctions when at least in at least two instances, DCPS made this argument while citing previous misconduct students had already been suspended for as reasons for the involuntary transfer. AJA is also concerned about staff shortages and understaffing at DCPS schools. DCPS continues to tell its families they don't have enough teachers, dedicated aides, or school nurses available to meet the current student need. There's no clear protocol on what to do or how to prioritize staff when there are teacher absences or increased shortages due to COVID. We have heard some special education teachers are pulled from self-contained classrooms to provide coverage to other classrooms, and teachers are asked to take on multiple jobs and roles, contributing to their burnout. For example, in one DCPS elementary school, due to teacher absences, they just combined two self-contained classrooms, even though the students have different educational needs and require lower student, lower teacher to student ratios. DCPS has a new realignment plan for self-contained programs that involves unilateral decisions on changing the school location of students with disabilities in self-contained programs on a much larger scale. According to DCPS, 48% of the students in these self-contained programs are from Ward 7 and 8. We're concerned about the way they're communicating these changes to families and its negative impact on students. While it might be legal to change the location of a program with advance notice, DCPS should still engage families about these changes in a manner that treats them with dignity and recognizes the disruption changing a student's school site could have on families. For example, families with siblings who will no longer go to school together, or relocating a class of students on the spectrum who often have rigid attachments to established routines and structures. We recommend DCPS convene IEP meetings for these parents to discuss the appropriatenesses of the changes so their needs are considered instead of plotting the moves of children like chess pieces. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. There's additional recommendations and um, comments in their written testimony. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Well, thank you, Ms. Finney. And I do have your statement. Um, Alexander Moore. Good morning, Chairperson Mendelson and Councilmember Lewis George. Thank you to you and your staff for convening today's very efficient hearing uh, and for the chance to testify regarding the performance of DC public schools. My name is Alex Moore and I'm representing DC Central Kitchen. Since 2010, we have been a proud food service partner of DCPS. And today, uh, our healthy school food program serves scratch cooked locally sourced meals at 12 DC public schools. Along the way, we have won national major recognition from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine and the Center for Good Food Purchasing. Today, the role of school nutrition programs has never been more efficient, or excuse me, more significant or essential. Serving top quality school meals is no easy task on a normal day, but we haven't had a normal day in two years. When schools closed, we set up meal distribution stations outside of schools and individually packaged every single meal to minimize exposure risk. We also provided supplemental groceries to help families prepare meals at home. When schools reopened this academic year, we faced more upheaval, but our team has ensured that nutritious meals prepared with care are still available in cafeterias and classrooms every day here in DC. Just last week, we deployed a food truck at 11 DCPS locations to ensure access to healthy meals during February break. Thanks to our resolve and our partnerships, our meals received an outstanding 94% student satisfaction rate this school year. The Office of Food and Nutrition Services deserves significant credit for their partnership during this difficult time. When the supply chain shortages forced unexpected changes to our menus, they helped us manage thoughtful adjustments that maintain nutritional quality and standards for local sourcing. They have been strong thought partners as we reintroduced our Fresh Feature Friday initiative, which collects student feedback on our local produce offerings and allows us to design new recipes kids love. Other partners have played critical roles as well. DC Food Project has stepped up tremendously during this crisis to provide DC Central Kitchen assembled grocery bags at an additional 15 schools. DCPS should be applauded for investing in DC Food Project's work. This fall, DC Food Project launched an innovative new pantry program, and DC Central Kitchen contributed to the purchase, installation, and ongoing stocking of dignified pantries at 13 DC public schools. These pantries allow expert school staff to work directly with 1,600 children they know are in need to obtain supplemental nutritious foods during the day, after school, or ahead of school breaks. As DCPS rebids its food service contracts this spring for the coming school year, we hope the district treats this process as an opportunity to further enshrine and enhance our city's commitments to top quality school food service, to sustainable sourcing practices, 
fair wages and job opportunities for DC residents and leveraging cafeterias as hubs for health promotion and learning. We look forward to the release of this RFP and to ultimately hearing from DCPS about its final vendor selections. If we are selected to continue serving the district in this capacity, we pledge to fully cooperate with council to ensure effective oversight and transparency around this new contract. We know there is no shortage of important questions facing this committee and DCPS, and we appreciate the chance to weigh in on the role food plays in contributing to our students' health, academic achievement, and future success. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, you're at 12 schools. I see them listed at the end of your statement. That's correct, as well as uh, six additional public charter schools and tuition-free private schools across DC. Great, great. thank you. Uh, Mary Levy. Um, Ms. Levy, you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, because uh, budget drives so much of DCPS performance this morning, I'm testifying only about the local school budgets. Uh, I have analyzed them and worked on their methodology for about 25 years. Uh, there have been three major problems with local school budgets, all of which exist this year and are repeating next year. Uh, first, instability. Uh, many schools do not receive enough money to prevent their having to cut staff and other resources. Now, DCPS says that schools are not losing money, no school. Uh, that is only because they don't count the librarians that the council uh, required last year, and they don't count $39 million of COVID funds, which schools this year are using for teachers, aides, and so forth. The result is that 61 out of 116 schools are currently budgeted for less money next year than what they actually have this year. Typical loss about $250,000. Uh, adding in inflation by updating this year's budgets to next year's prices, 76 schools have budgets too low to maintain existing staff and other resources. Uh, the second big problem uh, is major disparities among schools in per pupil spending for basic school staff and programs serving all students. That's general education and it excludes funding for special populations. Uh, because of these disparities, schools don't start in the same place, but instead of leveling up the lower funded schools, the disparities are actually expanding next year. I have found differences of thousands of dollars between schools of the same size, up to $5,000 per student. Uh, I have lots of schools whose enrollment differences are in the single digits and funding differences more than $1,000 a student. Third problem is the historical uh, diversion of at-risk funds from extra services for at-risk students to basic general education programs. Um, since so many schools are not getting enough to keep up, uh, I expect this to repeat, but I'll have to uh, finish the analysis later. The budgets for next year do represent a $20 million increase over all fiscal 22 funding. Uh, the mayor's 5.9% increase for the funding base seemingly presents an opportunity to change all this, but the opportunity has not been taken. Uh, what I've described should not be happening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Levy. Um, that's this panel of witnesses. Uh, five minutes of questions and then uh, Council Member Janice Lewis-George. Um, 
several of you uh, from, um, I believe, the first or second witness to the last witness uh, testified about uh, problems with the budget. And it reminds me of Bill 24-570, which I introduced and which had a hearing uh, called Schools First in Budgeting Amendment Act of 2021. I would urge folks to look at that again. Um, several witnesses testified uh, almost in shock that uh, there is no transparency with regard to how this DCPS budgets its local schools. And I suggest that that will never change unless we put into law a formula that they have to follow. Now, I'm not saying that Bill 24-570 has got it right. Uh, and I definitely want to speak with some of you and some other folks to work on that legislation so we get it right. But as long as DCPS uses a formula that's not in writing and also a formula that they don't have to adhere to, because any formula they have that's not a matter of law, they don't have to adhere to, uh, we're going to continue to find these mysteries in how they do budgeting. Uh, I am struck by the fact that um, I had not seen, a, seen it quantified, but Ms. Levy, you're saying that 61 of 116 schools are currently budgeted for less than what they actually have this year? That's correct. And then I assume the 61 is included in the next figure, 76 of 116 schools have budgets insufficient to maintain existing staff and other resources. That's correct. That does not take care of or take account of enrollment decline. Um, but right now that's pretty thinly spread among schools and among grades within schools. Your uh, bill does take account of that. And uh, let me say enrollment decline that's thinly spread across grades or schools is enrollment decline that does not necessitate the loss of a teacher or a classroom. That's important. Yes. And um, Bill 24-570 tries to address that. So again, I urge folks to look at that bill. And um, I'm very much open to comments on how to perfect that. Um, I did have a, I don't have a lot of time here. Uh, Mr. Henderson, you made a reference in your testimony about uh, testing. And I wanted you to just put a little bit more on the record about that. Uh, Robert Henderson, I think you were suggesting there's too much testing. Um, I mentioned RCTs specifically um, that teachers are being asked to do from central office that they may not believe are, are helpful or the best use of their instructional time. Anybody else? That may also be true of testing. Anyone else want to comment on um, whether they think there's needs to be um, a little more efficiency in testing? Um, I could say that I hear that a lot at the meetings also, that teachers feel they're spending far too much time testing. And while students are being tested, they're not being taught or exposed to opportunities. So it, it comes up at almost every meeting. So I think that should be looked at. And especially right now, it came up in the context of more demands from Central and more data at the same time as they were trying to do all the COVID quarantine, contact tracing and everything else. So it, it was magnified this year. And I brought it up as a source of frustration for teachers. Um, it, it undercuts their autonomy. Uh, I think I have time for one more question, Ms. Mampara. Um, did you, I'm looking to see, yes, there you are. Um, so did you get your money this year? And I shouldn't put it in personal terms, but we budgeted money for food prints. And I know that uh, I was having conversations with the chancellor about why that money hadn't gotten out the door. Have you finally gotten it? I think that they're sending um, the contract for approval to council, either, either they just did yesterday or they are today. So I, it seems like it's moving along, but that's for this, you know, that's covering this school year through the beginning of the fall. Um, there's no commitment right now for what will happen uh, for FY23. Yes, as you know, our council members like the Food Prince program. Uh, we like the idea of um, exposing students 
young students to uh, something as novel and unusual as gardening. I, I say that with a little sarcasm since I have a garden. Um, but this is, we're now in the month of March and that contract has not been completed and that means you haven't gotten the payment yet. Uh, no, because there, we're, we sort of had half a contract. Um, so we're able to use, we're okay. Um, and DCPS, the contracting team has been working hard on that and hopefully it'll go through approval at council quickly. Yeah, I don't think there'll be any problem. Uh, time. Councilmember Lewis George, do you have any questions? Yes, thank you. Um, I obviously not going to get to everyone. I do want to say to Ms. Um, Para from Food Prince, Katrina Owens from DC Scores, Alexander Moore, you, I love all of your programs and uh, we'll be advocating during the budget to make sure you stay uh, in support um, and continue to serve our students. So thank you. Wanna to go to you um, first, uh, Ms. Kathy Riley, to talk about the overcrowding issues um, at Roosevelt and sort of what you're hearing, what you're seeing on the ground, but what you're hearing from DCPS as far as solutions. Oh, well, on the ground, I see that it, it, it looks untenable next year. And the, I, in talking to the communities, I'm on the LSAT, we have not heard of solutions. I have heard from DCPS that they're working on solutions, but I don't have any idea what the options are. But to put that many students who are a majority at risk in one facility and with added staff and plenty of, you know, a special education and ELL smaller classes, it, it's just a, an accident waiting to happen. And it's so much stress in addition to all the stress. So I, I don't know what else to say. The solutions I've heard is that there might be, they might just put 40 students in one class and just put the two teachers there. They have, I don't know if I was got a chance to say this in my testimony that they would only be able to use the larger spaces like the auditorium and, uh, you know, for two or three days a week or the library, you only get it two days a week for each school. It's just, it's not real. It, it shouldn't happen. Yeah. And I know you also spoke a little bit about sort of uh, um, Truesdale, I guess it's, it's wanting to have, um, I guess be walkable during, have a walkable location during renovations. I think they would settle for something in Ward 4 and not something all the way downtown that they feel, especially for such a robust three and four-year-old program, they don't feel confident putting their children on buses or feel confident that they can get to their child if their child has to come home or whatever. So it, it's raised enormous anxiety. And this is one of our, you know, our treasures that 85% of the kids walk to school. So, you know, I think that's, that there should be a better solution than putting them in a middle, you know, in Garnet Patterson, which has no play space, no parking for staff that has to travel. Okay. Um, I, I have some, you know, pending questions right now with them regarding sort of swing space and the issue we have in War 4. So I'll, I'll be following up on that um, as well. Well, as maybe the two could be solved together. You know, I mean, is there a stay is a citywide program. It should stay in our side of the park. That's why it went into Roosevelt initially. Mm -hmm. But I can't believe there's not a solution either of satellite space for this year and then a long range plan that yeah. benefits those stu the, the students at both schools. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, the, for the AGE uh, e group, Advocates for Justice and Education group, um, any of you can take this. Can you say about the reforms you're recommending to OSSI to improve uh, DOT services? So I can start that as I serve on the OSSI working group um, to collaborate and work on that. I think you know, there are some innovative ideas that Ms. Hiley Thomas mentioned. The stipend to families is big. Mm -hmm. um, the, the app and the parent portal would go a long way okay. to um, you know, make things more transparent. But also, and I mentioned this at the round table, we need to have a comprehensive conversation around transportation. The council has looked at that in the past, and I think it's important to come back to that um, for all of our kids, not just our kids who are. Yeah. Oh, I 100% I agree with you. 
Um, so I appreciate that. That's going to be a big portion of my Austin testimony is going to be big, big, big focus on transportation. So I appreciate sort of the suggestions you all gave. I didn't have a, a number of those on the list. Um, I think we've been hearing that there's going to be an uh, app, but we're not sure where it is in the process. So um, I'm looking forward to, to following up on that more. Um, this is tough because I have to make a decision. Uh, Ms. Greer, I'm going to come to you. I'm trying to, I was trying to decide between you and Ms. Ms. Levy here. Um, well, I don't see Ms. Greer on the screen. So, uh, Mary, I'm going to come to Ms. Levy. I'm going to come to you. Um, oh, wait, Greer's here. Okay. <laughs> We're going to try to do both here. Um, or let's see what the chairman does. Ms. Greer, I had a question. You testified a little bit about needing additional funding for tier, I think you said tier one and tier two in your, in your testimony. Um, but then I think you also testified to it, sort of what we heard from the BBH director during oversight when I uh, during their oversight hearing was there was a supply chain issue um, in in general with being able to service schools and service students. Um, and so if for the tier one tier two funding would the supply chain issues impact the ability for that funding to to actually have the impact we needed to have this this year um, and if if not sort of um, wanting to hear your suggestions about even addressing the supply chain issue. It is, it is a great issue that I, from Dr. Bazron, um, sort of how we're servicing our schools is completely inadequate at this, at this moment. Yeah, I mean, and I know we're really short on time. And the really quick answer is, I mean, there's, a, there's definitely a supply workforce issue. Um, and part of that is actually just making sure we have competitive rates because right now we're, we're paying uh, mental health professionals in the schools at the 2016 rate. And that's just not keeping up with inflation in the market. But you also don't necessarily need a graduate level educated person to be doing tier one and tier two work in the schools. And so I think there needs to be also some creativity and some real thought into how do we also make sure those really important services are getting in the school and think about some more flexibility in, in how we're providing services to the schools. Okay, okay, thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you, council member. Okay, if you wanna ask Ms. Levy a question about budget though, Chairman, that would be great. <laughs> that would be great, but we have another 160 witnesses, I believe. Got uh, it, thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you uh, each of you for your testimony. Uh, this is helpful. Uh, you all are excused, I'm gonna call the next 20 witnesses. Yep. Chelsea Coffin, who's with the DC Policy Center. Becky Ballard, who's a parent. Uh, Michael Johnson, Danielle Hamer, although I believe she already testified. Taria Azell or Ezell, Maya Walker with Black Swan Academy, Scott Goldstein, Executive Director of Empower Ed, Thomas Mangrum is co-president of Project Action, Commissioner Salim Adolfo. ANCHC, Colleen Crino or Crino, Hardy Middle School Civic Liaison, Lucy Leblay, co-founder of DC Food Project, Teo Bell, School Justice Project, Neil Saxena, who is Chief Advancement Officer at Fair Chance, Stephanie Wolf, who is Project Manager for Reading Partners, Curtis Leach, who is Deputy Director at Kid Power Inc., Audrey Walker, who's Director of Youth Services for Jubilee Housing. Marla Spindel, or Spindle, who's with DC Kin Care Alliance. Stephanie Lim Aguirre, who's with the Latin American Youth Center. Heather Gustafson, who's owner of the Palisade Montessori. Zachary Israel, who is ANC Commissioner for with ANC 4D and also with the Truesdale, Truesdale Elementary FTO. Person. I'm uh, Far Faria Ahmed, who's also with Truesdale Elementary. Ms. Coffin, uh, you're first of this panel. Thank you for waiting and good morning. 
Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Mendelson and members of the Committee of the Whole. My name is Chelsea Kaufman, and I'm the Director of the Education Policy Initiative at the DC Policy Center, an independent think tank focused on advancing policies for a growing and vibrant economy in DC. Today, I will preview findings from State of DC Schools 2020-21 to show how the pandemic has disproportionately impacted students designated as at-risk, students with disabilities, English learners, and high school graduates. It is critical to invest both in supporting these students moving forward and monitoring their outcomes. The forthcoming State of DC Schools report shows that the pandemic year had disparate impacts for many students, including students designated as at-risk. First, likely because of the economic impacts of the pandemic, there was an increase in the percentage of students designated as at-risk to 45%, two percentage points higher than the previous year. During this year of largely virtual learning, students designated as at-risk were less likely to engage in school. Compared to all students, they were 1.5 times more likely to be chronically absent, and they missed three days of pre-kindergarten every two weeks compared to all pre-kindergartners who missed two days over the same period. State of DC Schools report also finds that although virtual options are preferred by some, certain services for students with disabilities and English learners can be challenging to deliver virtually. Performance oversight data from OSSI indicate that the percentages of English learners and students with disabilities likely en entering DC's public schools for the first times have declined. This could mean that identifying needs was delayed during virtual, um, the virtual year for many reasons. The percentage of students who are English learners declined by about two percentage points in both pre-kindergarten and high school grades. With these grades, um, with pre-kindergarten and grade nine as com common entry points in a typical year for English learners. In addition, the percentage of pre-kindergarten students who are students with disabilities declined from about 8% to 6% in 2020-21. Each age group and grade band had unique challenges last year, but the pandemic had particularly harsh impacts for youth getting ready for college and career. The State of DC Schools report finds that although high school graduation rates increased, other measures of college and career readiness for high school students showed a decline. For DC's high school alumni, performance oversight data show that a smaller share continued with post-secondary education compared to previous years. In FY20, the percentage of students enrolling in post-secondary after graduation declined to 40%, four percentage points lower than the previous year. In addition, the percentage completing a post-secondary degree within six years declined to 22% in FY21, 11 percentage points lower than FY20. For many students, recovering from the impacts of COVID-19 will be hard. Tracking how students are doing and how schools are serving them will be key to recovery. We are glad that the DME recovery roadmap is focused on this. In our State of DC Schools report, we have also suggested recovery metrics in the areas of student academic success, supports for students, and community factors that influence students' ability to fully engage in school. Using these frameworks, we need to focus on equitable recovery and invest in collecting information that can help track these outcomes, especially for students designated as at risk, students with disabilities, English learners, and former high school students. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Coffin. Uh, Becky Ballard. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity to testify. I am testifying today in my capacity as a parent with two children presently ages two and four, although they were respectively four months old and two years old when the pandemic first started. My two-year-old goes to a neighborhood preschool whose rules are set by Aussie, and my four-year-old is in pre-K four at our neighborhood DCPS school. I live in Ward two and I'm a proud Washingtonian. I testify today with two requests. First is for daycares and preschools to be able to incorporate test to stay like DCPS pre-K programs have been able to do. So the only children who actually have COVID are kept out of school and childcare. And second is that when DCPS changes a policy that makes life easier for children and parents, that it is also immediately implemented by Aussie at daycares and preschools. First, some context. The past two years have been brutal for me and many other working mothers. You can see this in the national workforce participation rates of women, which resemble that of the 1980s. Mental health is awful, and you hear stories about mothers around the country meeting at night to scream. It's been particularly hard for DC mothers. We had the longest lockdown in the country and have had some of the strictest COVID restrictions for our children. And those of us with young children have to fully engage in childcare when they're at home as they lack the independence to care for themselves. We now know more about COVID, and when we know better, we can do better. Children ages two to four are at low risk for severe illness. We are able to vaccinate everyone age five and up. Yet there is no provision for tests to stay for children in daycares and non-DCPS preschoolers, despite the CDC recommending that months ago. Preschoolers under five have to miss at least a week of school if there's a positive case in their classroom. Our two-year-old daughter joined her current preschool in late October, and in those four months, there have been multiple closures in her classroom alone. 
We don't know if or when a vaccine will be approved for children under five. So waiting until tests to stay um, to happen, only when that happens, moves parents like myself into a third year of tremendous childcare uncertainty. When CPS established rules to ensure it could open classrooms and keep them open, Aussie did not allow that flexibility in preschools. For example, Aussie at times forced preschools to have overly broad travel restrictions that DCPS wasn't imposing. I'll close with a story about this morning at breakfast. I explained to my four-year-old son that today he could choose to not wear his mask outside if he wants. DCPS just made that rule. However, my daughter, who was sitting right next to me, had to be told that, um, and this is for outside. My daughter sitting right next to me, I had to tell her, nope, you still have to wear your mask outside. The two-year-old has to wear the mask. The four-year-old doesn't, both too young to be vaccinated, unfortunately. All of this is now against the backdrop that adults can congregate indoors without masks. We shouldn't put the greatest restrictions on our city's youngest children, but put their needs first. Thank you, Ms. Ballard. I don't have a copy of your statement. Would you please send it? Happy to. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Johnson. Good morning, Chairman Mendelson and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Michael Johnson, Jr. And I'm a state policy fellow at the DC Fiscal Policy Institute. Today, my testimony will continue with the theme of budget transparency, but focus specifically on improving transparency of the DCPS enrollment reserve. The enrollment reserve is used to meet mid-year staffing needs, uh, mid-year staffing needs at schools that exceed their enrollment projections in the fall. Unfortunately, limited visibility into this fund undermines DCPS's goal of budget transparency and places schools at greater risk of receiving inadequate funding to meet mid-year student needs. Budget transparency is a goal that DCPS holds, which is listed in their community budget guides. However, to date, DCPS has not lived up to their own transparency commitments, as many of DCPS's budgeting decisions continue to be less than transparent and accessible to the public. For example, DCPS has continuously obscured the uses of at-risk funds and supplants rather than supplements these dollars for core staffing positions instead of their intended purpose. The enrollment, the enrollment reserve is even more opaque, and the chancellor has received significantly less scrutiny for the lack of transparency around this pot of money. Fiscal year 2022, DCPS initially budgeted $6.7 million towards the enrollment reserve, which was later reduced to just over $3.5 million. Unfortunately, the information that DCPS has shared publicly regarding this fund is extremely limited. Although the DC Council published approved enrollment reserve reprogramming amounts in fiscal year 2021, it does not include requests that are pending or requests that have been denied. Additionally, DCPS nor the Council automatically publishes which schools receive funding through their enrollment reserve and only publishes that information after a formal information request is made to the agency. Equally troubling is DCF, DCPS's failure to publicly provide specific guidance on which staffing positions can be, be, can be covered with the enrollment reserve. Without greater transparency of DCPS's rules and practices for the enrollment reserve, it is difficult to determine to what extent this fund is adequately and efficiently covering the costs associated with mid-year enrollment gains. Supporting the staffing needs of schools experiencing the largest mid-year enrollment gains is an issue of educational equity considering differences in mid-year mobility across student groups. Schools experiencing the greatest gains in mid-year enrollment are those with higher proportions of students who are at risk and students with disabilities, students whom DCPS has continuously shortchanged year after year. Because mid-year enrollment fluctuations significantly impact the accuracy of DCPS enrollment projections and school funding, these students will likely continue being shortchanged if their schools are not properly supported through the enrollment reserve. Greater enrollment fluctuations during the COVID-19 pandemic have illuminated and further reinforced the need for a more transparent enrollment reserve. And the public deserves to have a stake in assuring that this part of funding is adequately and equitably enabling schools to meet mid-year staffing needs. In particular, DCFBI urges DCPS to publish and describe in detail all allowable uses of enrollment reserve funding and the methodology that DCPS uses to estimate annual need, annually publish accurate total approved enrollment reserve appropriations and actual funding amounts of the year prior to DCPS budget data website, to publish all enro enrollment reserve reprogram reprogramming expenditures for each school year directly to the DCPS budget data website, and to annually publish all enrollment reserve requests. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. I provided additional uh, commentary on my written testimony. I'll be happy to answer any questions during the Q&A. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Taraya or Taria Azel. Let's see that person, Maya Walker. 
the Black Swan Academy. Scott Goldstein. Good morning. Good morning, Chairperson Mendelson and council members. Today, I'll focus on the performance of DC's education agencies with two guiding questions. Do education agencies have the trust of those they serve? And are they setting the right goals and approaching them with enough consistency to achieve the objectives? Finally, we'll share educators' idea to truly re-envision education post-pandemic. When Chancellor Farabee took office, he said we can only move at the speed of trust. After two years of the pandemic, it's clear that education agencies have been significantly eroded and trust due to top-down and untransparent decision-making that often happen without the voices of our most important stakeholders at the table, demonstrated by the lag between when students, educators, and parents shared important ideas and the time it took, if ever, for DCPS and other agencies to act, whether on test-to-stay policies, virtual learning, outdoor learning, and eating, and so much more. So what is, where does the public turn? Often to the only place that provides a venue for them to be heard, the monthly public meetings of the DC State Board of Education, to the call-in lines of their sister offices, the Ombudsman and the Office of the Student Advocate, which saw dramatic increases in call volume during the pandemic, while council hearings happening just a few times a year, some with 189 witnesses like today, leave little time for in-depth back and forth with witnesses. The State Board has been an essential venue for the public during the pandemic, and they deserve power commensurate with their confidence from the public. For the last two years, the executive has used the SBOE chambers at the Barry Building, preventing them from holding in-person hearings, which don't even conflict in time with the mayor's press conferences. It's time to give them their space back. Let's discuss the public-facing goals of our agencies. DCPS sets a goal of 92, retaining 92% of educators they label highly effective and effective. In reality, of the educators who have left in this last seven years, 57% have been rated effective or highly effective, with another 20% developing. They're setting the wrong goal. Our goal should be to focus on the professional growth of developing and effective educators, not wish them the door. So targets should account for whether we've retained developing effective and highly effective educators over the three to five year window. We expect high turnover this year and to address this now before it's too late, the council must compel DCPS to give DINR declaration of intent not to return data compared to last year at this point now. When it comes to student satisfaction, DCPS states the goal for 41% of students to indicate they feel loved, challenged, and prepared, and the goal of 60% of students who say they feel loved. That's a shamefully low target for our beloved children. One way to ensure we center our student experiences is for ASI to submit back to SBOE a revised student accountability framework that eliminates the summative rating and replaces it with a more holistic dashboard that prioritizes metrics like student, parent, educator satisfaction, school climate, retention, and other factors. We must also address student wellness with historic investments in school-based mental health, outdoor learning, expansion of community schools, restorative justice training through school talk, and rethinking the school day with flexible schedules that allow for more student enrichment and experiential learning. We can't forget that one of the best things we can do to ensure student success is retain educators they love and have trusting relationships with. A year ago, we were awash in talk of reimagining education post-pandemic, but this year we've seen very little reimagining. There's more in my written testimony, but I wanna add based on what you said earlier that the most effective way to address learning loss is by adding nearly six weeks of instructional time to the schedule without adding a single day by shifting the time spent on redundant and unuseful standardized testing and prioritizing time for learning. We look forward to sharing more about our budget recommendations and teacher solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colston. Thomas Mangrum. Commissioner no. Adolfo. No. Colleen Crino or Crino. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Okay, um, great. Well, thank you, Chairman Mendelson and the committee of the whole team for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Colleen Crino, and I'm a DCPS parent and the VP for Civic Affairs for the PTO at Hardy Middle School. And I have a few concerns and considerations that I'd like to bring before the council today, most of which are related to the tremendous and positive growth that Hardy has experienced. Since the 2017 school year, Hardy has seen its student population expand by 35%, and enrollment continues on a strong upward trajectory. This is in many ways due to the tremendous and inspired leadership of Principal Lucas Cook, who has invested in our students and staff in a remarkable way. This leads me though to my three areas of concern. First, ensuring that the budget allocated to Hardy can keep pace with the growth it has been experiencing. 
This year's budget is roughly equivalent to last year's budget despite continued growth. On the lines of what you heard from Mary Levy, this means that Hardy is unable to staff to the appropriate level for the increased amount of students, and it is, in, it is causing hardship on the existing staff team and the school administration as they strive to support our students in the way that they deserve. Second, the growth of our student body and the increased amount of responsibility related to COVID impact and management have created tremendous strain on our staff, as you've heard from others, and particularly our principal. Our PTO is very concerned about the issue of principals being overburdened and underpaid related to the tremendous responsibility that they carry to ensure the smooth functioning of our school and schools across the district. We have seen how our own principal cook has taken on innumerable roles within the school and the community in order to keep the wheels from falling off the bus during and following COVID. But we are extremely concerned with how DCPS can better support our administrative staff in order to reduce the burden that they are under and prevent them from burning out and resigning. And number three, back to Hardy and the growth of schools in Ward 3. So we, and, and Ward 2 and 3, I should say. We have seen the city take positive steps to ameliorate overcrowding, but we believe there's a significant opportunity to renovate the existing Hardy facility, which will support both short and longer term growth. We're grateful to Chairman Mendelson for his support at a recent Ward 3 EdNet meeting in saying that any renovations to Hardy do not need to be delayed by other decisions related to Ward 3 schools. Through a proposed $100 million renovation, we believe enough seats could be created to support the growth of Hardy and address significant updating and facilities needs that currently exist. We also believe that this fits well into an overall agenda of smart growth planning in a way that gets ahead of having a facility and a school community busting at the seams. I appreciate your time today and the engagement with our Hardy Middle School community. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Crino. Uh, Lucy LeBloy. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you, Chairman Mendelson. Um, my name is Lucy LeBloy and this is Alyssa McClellan. We are testifying together today as the DC Food Project co-founders. Um, we are both moms to children in DC public schools, including Hardy Middle School. Thank you, Colleen. Um, we would like to first thank Chairman Mendelson and the council for allowing us time to speak with you today. We DC Food Project are here today to talk about the crisis that the district is facing among its school children that is food insecurity. When we launched DC Food Project in 2018, our goal initially was to bootstrap a backpack program at our kids' school with the intention of expanding it throughout Washington, DC over time. What we would quickly learn was the magnitude of children in the district who are facing food insecurity at home and are in dire need for help. When COVID-19 hit, schools shut down and kids went home. Those kids who do not have what they need at home suddenly face that harsh reality of not knowing where or when their next meal would come from. And we knew it. And while our own worlds came to a halt, we immediately shut down all of our operations and pivoted all of our programs. We began collecting food from neighbors' front porches to bag and donate to families. The harsh reality is that pre-COVID, this city had one of the highest rates of food insecurity, with one in five children deemed as food insecure. It is estimated that food insecurity rates in the district almost doubled, marking our city, our city one of the most impacted across the country. At the height of the pandemic, our team launched an emergency weekend bag program, and from the few dozen families we had been supporting, we began to bag hundreds and then thousands. Since March of 2020, DC Food Project has delivered over 2 million meals to families in need, working with 20 DC public schools, administrators, and volunteers. We gained tremendous partners along the way, including DC Central Kitchen, who has been a steadfast partner, helping us procure and transport food. We are also very thankful to DC Public Schools, in particular the Office of Food and Nutrition Services and DCPS Connected Schools. We'd like to recognize the efforts DCPS pushed through throughout the pandemic it is not lost on us amongst uh, the amount of pivoting the FNS team did to ensure that the children in our city would gain and have access to food as schools had closed. But we also recognize that there were gaps and they leaned on their partners and organizations such as DC Food Project to meet those needs and better understand what families need. Our team continues to distribute food through our community bag program. And this past fall, we have also implemented a pantry program in 13 DCPS schools, providing access to food and toiletries to students on an as needed basis. As you consider how best to support children in the district, as you think about what DCPS means for children who rely on schools for food, for support, for comfort, considering going beyond the classroom. We have learned that over the last two years is just how much student, students lean on their schools for support. We're here to help many organs, um, we are here to help and many organizations are, but we cannot do it alone. 
we need a lot more funding to keep up with the demand. We are here to ask the council to keep thinking about how programs like ours can become a part of the school landscape and budget. And we applaud the council for being champions of this issue and know that you're keenly aware of the food insecurity issues facing the city, but it's time to act. Thank you on behalf of DC Food Project. Thank you, uh, each of you, for your testimony. Uh, Teo Bell. Good morning, council members, and thank you for the opportunity morning. to provide testimony at today's hearing. My name is Teo Bell, and I am the senior staff attorney at School Justice Project, as well as a Ward 4 resident. SJP is a DC-based legal services and advocacy organization that provides special education representation to older, court-involved students with disabilities. My complete remarks will be submitted in my written testimony. First, I want to address correctional education within the DC jail. From the outset of the pandemic, our detained clients regularly reported that they were not being provided with any in-person instruction, nor any virtual distance learning by DCPS. Instead, students at the DC jail were only being provided with work packets containing materials to complete on their own in their cells with no assistance or feedback from teachers. Because DCPS continued to fail to provide an appropriate education to these students, and Aussie continued to fail to properly supervise DCPS to correct this issue, in April 2021, we filed a class action lawsuit against the district for its failure to educate students at the jail. While we have seen positive changes in education since a new education provider took over in October, the Department of Corrections, who runs the jail, continues to be a barrier. Due to the DOC restrictions and policies, many students at the DC jail are still not receiving a full day of in-person learning. Instead, students are receiving one or two hours of school a day, are denied access to educational technology, and are not being permitted to reside on the education unit established for that purpose. These continued failures have led a federal court judge recently to hold the district in contempt of the court's previously entered preliminary injunction issued nearly eight months ago. We urge the council to inquire with the agencies as to why they're not in compliance with the federal court and the law. Second, I'd like to address compensatory education for students who missed many educational hours while detained at the Youth Services Center during the pandemic. To address the lack of education for young people at YSC, SJP and other advocates submitted a letter to Aussie, DCPS and the DME regarding the need for, to provide compensatory education to YSC students, many of whom have since been released. The letter requested that the agencies, with the support and oversight of the DME, begin the process of identifying and contacting all students who were detained at YSC to hold meetings to determine the type and amount of compensatory education services that the student should receive. We ask that the council seek information from the agencies, in particular the DME, to learn what, if any, efforts are being undertaken on this end. Finally, I'd like to address the ongoing credits issue facing court-involved students with disabilities. Each and every client that our team has represented has had some issue with work counting, credits being earned, being accepted, and securing a stable path to a high school graduation. After the introduction of the Credit Continuity Amendment Act of 2020, the Credits Act, the DME's Office for the Students in the Care of DC convened a cross-sector working group and met to revise this legislation for a year. At this point, we would we are very hopeful about the bill, and we hope the revisions will be finalized soon and that the council will be able to receive an update from the DME on its status. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions the council may have. Oh, thank you, Ms. Bell. Neil Saxena. Good morning, Chairperson Mendelson and council members. My name is Neil Saxena and I'm the Chief Advancement Officer at Fair Chance. I also serve as the co-chair of the DC Out of School Time Coalition, 63 organizations strong and housed at DC Action. My perspectives and testimony is guided by my 20 years in the DC youth development community, serving as a youth worker, volunteer mentor, and executive director. At Fair Chance, we believe that small community-based nonprofits are critical players in combating the effects of poverty on children. Annually, we select cohorts of small nonprofits predominantly led by people of color and provide unique capacity building program that strengthens organizational infrastructure and sustainability. I'm sure today you'll hear from numerous youth and direct service providers today. My testimony is connected to the nonprofit and OST programs who support the academic, social, and emotional well being of our youth, employ our neighbors, and serve as social and economic pillars in our communities. The work of the district education agencies and OST nonprofits intersect at varying levels of engagement and partnership. 
These nonprofits are an essential part of our education system and provide a safe learning environment for students across DC. Today, I ask you to consider the following continuous performance improvements. Embracing the spirit of partnership by working with nonprofits to address challenges faced by the school system. For example, this past year, education agencies went in alone in identifying COVID protocols, and it led to challenges in connection, communications pathways between schools and OST providers on COVID-19 status of youth, putting youth workers and other youth in programs at potential risk. Engage in, engage in community-driven strategies as the district updates its strategic plan for OST. In addition to listening to families, youth, educators, OST programs, and community partners, youth, youth workers, and staff in OST have unique perspectives to offer and inform strategy. The outcome of this engagement can be youth solutions for youth challenges and a shift away from adultism. Ensure youth safety through a comprehensive approach that invests in OST as part of youth and community safety solution. Research shows that the peak Juvenile crime school days occurs between 2 and 6 p.m. And then after school programs provide youth an alternative that keeps them safe and gives parents a peace of mind. Imagine the positive impact of an expansive OST structure that supplements the efforts of the already robust education agencies. In conclusion, as we see the signs of an emergence from the pandemic, the opportunity for OST and education agencies to innovate and prepare youth for DC, prepare DC's youth for success in education, career, and life can be achievable. Through a well-resourced out-of-school time DC government partnership, all youth can have access to high quality enrichment, academic support, and social and emotional development programs. Thank you for the opportunity to share and your time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie Wolf. Good morning, Chairperson Mendelson and members of the Committee of the Whole. My name is Stephanie Wolf, and I'm the Development Manager for Reading Partners DC. I am also a member of the DC OST or Out of School Time Coalition. As a member of the coalition, our organization understands that there is significant unmet need among DC youth and families for high quality, affordable OST and in-school programs. We believe that the district should commit to ensuring that the OST sector is fully funded, including committing to dedicate local recurring dollars to replace federal relief funds when they run out and providing detailed information about how they've been spent. We believe in the importance of ensuring that all students who wanna access these opportunities can do so regardless of which ward they are located in. Prior to COVID, we served um, over 900 K through fourth grade students working to achieve grade level reading proficiency in 21, 19 to 21 uh, Title I elementary schools across DC, providing consistent measurable results in our participants literacy growth. Due the, to the pandemic, we have modified our enrollment goals over the past two years and anticipate that we will now serve between five to 600 students this year. Despite these challenges, a recent DCPS study examining last school year found that there is a positive significant relationship between our student enrollment improvements on students' double scores from beginning to the end of the school year. And this year we are implementing a hybrid model of our program, providing one-on-one -on -one individualized tutoring where some students receive our traditional in-person program while others work with core members, AmeriCorps members at their schools to log into virtual Reading Partners Connect sessions using trained community tutors. We work closely with our school partners to ensure our program complements their overall goals. During this past year, we've expanded our program to two additional schools in a non-school-based site, the Terrell, that serves youth experiencing homelessness in a new partnership with the Department of Human Services. And we hope to continue um, to increase access to our program outside of the traditional school model. This year, we have faced multiple challenges from DCPS background check clearance delays impacting volunteer tutor start dates to COVID-19 outbreaks at schools postponing tutor sessions. For example, some COVID, um, some DCPS clearance delays have taken up to three months for tutors to get started. Although we appreciate that DCPS is working on this and has um, a new vendor now for background checks. Additionally, one of our government grants requires completely in-person uh, tutoring, and we have found it difficult to recruit enough tutors even when paid who are comfortable with being back in person due to, their ever, due to the ever-changing nature of the pandemic. We are grateful to Mayor Bowser and the DC Council for your ongoing support and helping to ensure that DC students and families can thrive. We hope that funding for early literacy programs remains a key priority for the upcoming budget season and we are asking that the district education agencies will work to increase communication and collaboration with OST and in-school programs like ours and continue to offer opportunities such as today where programs can share their experience. 
And we, again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Wolf. Curtis Leach. Good morning, Chairman Mendelson and members of the Committee of the Whole. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the importance of out of school time programming and how we can work toward making improvements for future years. My name is Curtis Leach and I'm the Deputy Director for Kid Power Inc. Kid Power is a local nonprofit that inspires youth leadership by promoting academic advancement, physical, social, and emotional wellness, and positive civic engagement throughout the district. I have more information in my testimony about Kid Power and how we've adapted to this school year. However, for the sake of time, I'd like to jump directly to some improvements for next year. I'd like to address three key challenges experienced this school year in order to improve out of school time program partnerships moving forward. First is the DCPS suitability clearance process and timeliness and how it needs to improve. Unfortunately, many applicants throughout the school year faced extreme difficulties in obtaining their DCPS clearances in a timely manner. This has been a common theme throughout the entire school year. We've had numerous applicants withdraw their job offers because the DCPS clearance process has taken too long. DCPS's estimated timeline at the beginning of the school year was upwards of two months, and our staff have experienced significantly longer wait times beyond two months. It personally took me five months to get my DCPS clearance renewal to be completed. We've lost qualified applicants due to the DCPS clearance process and our staff capacity was hamstrung as we couldn't get any staff into schools to work in a timely manner. We still have seven applicants awaiting their clearances. Furthermore, I actually had one staff member resign during this, during this committee meeting. As a direct result, Kid Power had to push back program start dates and reduce enrollment numbers. Ideally, additional resources need to be allocated towards hiring additional vendors and or staff to assist the DCPS clearance team. Secondly, communication from DCPS needs to improve. I've had to directly contact the DCPS clearance team throughout the school year to inquire about the status of clearance applications, oftentimes sending emails on a weekly basis. The clearance team has been inconsistent with their response and communication. I was informed by a DCPS representative that the clearance team was stretched thin given staff capacity. Ideally, additional resources need to be allocated to create an online portal for DCPS applicants so they can receive updates, see their clearance statuses, and directly communicate with DCPS clearance team if needed. And lastly, equity for OST providers from DCPS needs to improve. Earlier this year, DCPS acknowledged that there was a backlog of clearance applications and DCPS's stated plan of action at the time was to prioritize DCPS employee applications while continuing to work through contractor and volunteer applications. Our staff experienced three to four month wait times on average. Kid Power recently received confirmation from a newly hired staff member that their DCPS clearance was actually completed within seven days. However, that's because it was accidentally submitted as a DCPS employee application instead of a contractor or a volunteer application. A clearance that was labeled and submitted as a DCPS employee was drastically expedited in comparison to OSD contractors. These issues with DCPS with timeliness, communication and transparency and inclusion are clearly visible throughout the clearance process. But furthermore, the issues are endemic and visible more broadly in the context of partnering with OST providers. DSP's lack of inclusion with OST providers during last year's summer planning, return to in-school planning and COVID-19 protocols and policies has demonstrated that OST providers are an afterthought in larger decision-making processes. DCPS's timeliness and lack of communication has put OST providers in difficult situations to wait for decision-making results before we can adequately plan for our programs. And we'd like to improve collaboration with DCPS to ultimately allow OST programs to run and serve students more efficiently. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Leach. Audrey Walker. Good morning, Chairman Nendelson and members of the committee. My name is Audrey Walker. I am a Ward 4 resident, DC charter school parent, and the, and the Director of Youth Services Program at Jubilee Housing. And I am an active member of the DC Out of School Time Coalition. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Jubilee Housing strives to create justice housing that is affordable to those who need it most and is located in thriving neighborhoods with resources such as quality schools, grocery stores, transportation, and nearby supportive services that enable us all to succeed. One of the critical services that Jubilee has been providing for the past 14 years is a high quality out of school time program. The past two years of the pandemic relating school closings, transitions to and from virtual education and increased worries about public safety have exposed the inequity experienced by low income communities of color in the District of Columbia and throughout the country who face additional burdens and lack equal access to resources. Strong OST programs can effectively intervene to address some of these issues by providing academic and emotional support, individual tutoring and support for families. 
District officials must recognize that OSC programs keep youth safe and invest in OSC as part of a youth and community safety solution. In response to the increased attention on crime committed by youth, the district must refrain from excessive punitive reactions and instead focus on prevention and restorative justice, as well as positive youth development. In addition to recognizing the value of OST to community safety and youth outcomes, we need an updated strategic plan for OST in partnership with families, youth educators, OST programs, and community partners to ensure access to in-demand programs for all youth by fully funding OST. After the surge in funds from last year's American Rescue Plan's allocation, we must ensure funding stays at the level needed to support demand for these programs. The district should allocate an additional $2 million in local recurring dollars to the OST office for fiscal year 23 to begin replacing the one-time federal relief funds. The out-of-school time grants and youth outcomes received a major boost excuse me, we received a major boost in year 2022, thanks in part to federal relief funds increasing the OST budget by nearly $10 million. The federal funds will expire in 2024 and the district must commit to supplanting them with local recurring funds to assure sustainability of OST. I believe the district should also really focus on investing more in high dosage tutoring. We have seen so much promise in academic growth among our program participants with implementing high dosage tutoring for the past two years. Education agencies should also increase collaboration with OST, starting as soon as possible as we get close to the summer. Research shows that out-of-school time programs with stronger relationships with school teachers and principals are more successful at improving student outcomes. The pandemic has tested us all, but it, it has also demonstrated the incredible resilience of our program staff, our students, and families. We are proud to be part of the district's diverse and dedicated OST network and a member of the DC OST coalition. We look forward to continuing to work together with local agencies and leaders to ensure students emerge from this challenging period, happy, healthy, and fully prepared to reach their potential. Thank you for your time and consideration and I am available to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Walker. Marla Spindo. Good morning, Chairman Mendelson and members of the DC Council. My name is Marla Spindell and I'm the Executive Director of DC Ken Care Alliance. I'm pleased to testify today regarding the DC Child Care Subsidy Program administered by OSSI and specifically as it relates to eligibility for children who are being raised by non-parent caregivers. The mission of DC Ken Care Alliance is to support the legal, financial, and related service needs of relative caregivers who step up to raise children and their extended families in times of crisis when the children's parents are not able to care for them. DC Ken Care Alliance is the only organization in DC focused solely on serving relative caregivers raising DC's at-risk children. To date, we have served more than 500 relatives raising over 600 DC children. Here in DC, at least 9,000 children are living in the care of relatives with no parent present at a rate that is double the national average. These relatives are primarily black women who live in Ward 7 and 8 and live at the economic mar margins of our society even before they're called on to raise a relative child. Unfortunately, the established systems are set up only for traditional families, not kinship families, therefore resulting in severe barriers to access for relative caregivers in the district. One area where this occurs is with, with respect to the child care subsidy eligibility for children raised by relative caregivers. We also often have clients who seek the assistance of this program so they may continue to attend work, complete school or vocational programs, or search for jobs if they're not already employed. The purpose of the program is to allow caregivers to pursue these goals when they might not otherwise be obligated to vote time to child care responsibilities. Without these payments, caregivers are restricted in the opportunities they can pursue. OSSI's current practices exclude many of these children from CCS eligibility because their caregivers are unable to show an accepted legal relationship between themselves and the children they're raising. Federal law includes eligibility for CCS payments to children living with a parent or someone acting in loco parentis. This term is defined as anyone who's acting in the place of a parent. 
However, the DC child care subsidy manual generally does not permit caregivers to prove an in loco parentis relationship other than through a court custody order. Obtaining such an order is burdensome and requires caregivers to take off from school or work to file pleadings and attend hearings. This is in direct contradiction to the purposes of the child care subsidy program. Caregivers of children should be able to prove their caring for children through other documentation showing the caregiving relationship, including through a custodial power of attorney or OSSI's own other primary caregiver form, which is already accepted by OSSI for caregivers to enroll children in school. Unfortunately, OSSI's manual explicitly states that OSSI will not accept a notarized letter from a parent or guardian, such as a custodial power of attorney, showing that the child's under the care of the caregiver and is silent on accepting the primary caregiver form. In our experience, all the staff have told our, our clients that they must obtain a court custody order. A minor change to the OSSI manual is all that would be required to ensure that relative caregivers can, and can go to work, go to school, and have training while they're caring for these children. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Pindell. Stephanie Lim Aguar. Good morning, Chairman Mendelson and members of the Committee of the Whole. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm looking forward to addressing you all today. My name is Stephanie Lim Aguiar. I'm a Ward 4 resident, and I currently serve as the After School Programs Manager for Latin American Youth Center's DC based 21st Century Programs. LAYC has deep roots in the district. As a multi-service community organization, we support youth in successful transitions to adulthood and have been doing so for over 50 years. I'm here today to speak to you about some of the challenges our after-school programs have been facing and what we need to continue to be a presence in our communities. The programs I oversee are funded by OSSI and operate in wards one and four. This past year has put a particular strain on us. As we return to in-person after-school programming earlier in the school year, DCPS clearance delays heavily affected our staffing and recruitment capabilities. My after-school site supervisors have been feeling the pressure to provide meaningful support to their program participants under incredibly stressful circumstances, but also to reach grant benchmarks that have been stretching them thin. In short, they are under-resourced. One of my team members has been looking after up to 40 youth most days a week on his own for most of the school year. Another is running out of chairs in a classroom that is one of the few available in the building. One of our sites closed their doors to us after last summer due to conflicting partnership expectations. At the same time, we maintain close relationships with our youth and caregivers and provide safe and familiar spaces daily so that our young people's academic and social and emotional health is supported on a daily basis. We need the following. Better communication and transparency between offices so that programmatic expectations are clear, programs can function, and background checks can be processed expediently and more funding to support out-of-school time programs to account for indirect costs, inflation, and COLA. My team members on the ground do, their most do, the, do the most important work for the least pay and operate with limited funds. If we say we value education, we must make the right moves together so that the people who support our school communities can continue to do so. I want to acknowledge the support of Dr. Valerie Brown at Aussie, who I count as one of my most valued mentors. Her generosity and guidance has helped me gain perspective on how to balance our responsibilities as a direct service provider and as community members who engage in this work purposefully. And while purpose gives us direction, we cannot subsist on purpose alone. We need clear guidance and increased funding to continue to do this work. Our program youth and caregivers deserve well-funded, sustained out-of-school time programming. Thank you for listening, as I know you have many more hours of testimonies ahead. Your time is greatly appreciated. Thank you again. Thank you, Ms. Aguiar, and I apologize for mispronouncing your name. Next witness is Heather Gustafson. Is she here, Heather Gustafson? Uh, how about Commissioner Zachary Israel? Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman Mendelson and members of the Committee of the Whole. Uh, my name is Zach Israel and I represent single member district 4004, which includes parts of Petworth and Brightwood Park in Ward 4. I also proudly represent Truesdale Elementary School, which educates 450 students between pre-K three and fifth grade. I am testifying today on behalf of Advisory Neighborhood Commission 4D, which represents 13,219 Ward 4 residents 
and a majority of the households currently located within Truesdale's in-district attendance boundaries. I was pleased to see the district's enacted FY22 budget includes $64.4 million to expedite the full modernization of Truesdale's campus one year ahead of schedule. The expedited modernization of Truesdale means that the planning and design phase will now take place during school year 22-23, and the physical construction will take place over school years 23-24 and 24-25. The original location for Truesdale's quote-unquote swing space was supposed to be located at the former Sharp Health School campus located at 4300 13th Street Northwest, only 0.8 miles from Truesdale's campus. However, due to Dorothy Height Elementary School's ongoing modernization, the former Sharp Health School campus will be occupied by these school students through at least school year 23-24. This fact has pushed DCPS to propose utilizing the former Shaw Middle School at the Garnett Patterson campus located at 2001 10th Street Northwest in Ward 1 as Truesdale swing space during school years 23-24 and 24-25. As this school campus is located two and a half miles south of Truesdale, DCPS will provide school buses for transportation, including for children as young as three years old. This proposed swing space location for Truesdale is incredibly problematic for numerous reasons, including the inability for many families to be able to get downtown to pick up their child in the event of an emergency, prospective in-district families considering alternative school options due to the swing space being located so far from their home, losing the majority of the school's enrollment, which has occurred at other schools that have had swing spaces located outside of their neighborhood, and no outdoor green play space at the Garnett Patterson campus for Truesdale students to utilize. As you will hear from many, many Truesdale parents and staff throughout today, these concerns will have a dramatic negative impact on Truesdale school enrollment and budget, and we need DCPS to change course with regard to its proposed swing space for Truesdale students. DCPS has the financial resources to construct or lease new additional swing space located right here in Ward 4 for not just Truesdale, but also Whittier and LaSalle Bacchus Elementary Schools, which are scheduled to be modernized in the years following Truesdale. We need DCPS to budget between five to 10 million in its proposed FY23 budget for a new Ward 4 swing space and work to identify an adequate space that can be utilized by Truesdale students beginning in the fall of 2023. Anything less will be a complete disservice to Truesdale's 450 students. I have attached ANC40's resolution on this topic that we passed a few weeks ago and the response letter we received from DCPS Chancellor Farabee. I hope that you and your staff will follow up with DCPS to ensure that they follow through with the new Ward 4 swing space beginning in fall 2023. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any, any questions you might have. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Faria Ahmed. Hi, good afternoon. Good, good morning. Good afternoon, um, Chairman Mendelson and Council Members. Thank you, um, ANC Rep Zach Israel for setting me up really well. Um, my name is Fadia Ahmed. I'm a DC resident for the last 18 years and award for resident for the last five. I currently serve as the executive officer or president of the Truesdale Family Teacher Organization. Um, our school is a hidden gem in our neighborhood and as such our community is quite concerned with the swing space for Truesdale's modernization potentially being located downtown. Our school currently serves a 60% in boundary population and that number is likely, is likely greater as many families are from right outside of our boundary. Um, as mentioned earlier by Kathy Riley, we have 85% of our student population that actually walks to school. We want to see that in-boundary number grow, not decline. Engagement with families have indicated that many are choosing to lottery out of Truesdale, given the possibility that our swing place will be moved downtown. We understand that space is limited and we do not want to have our modernization pushed back to accommodate a swing space in Ward 4. But um, Trues especially given that um, ADA compliance is at Truesdale is inadequate. However, we also do not want a swing space without green, green space, play space, or parking that will cost, cost significant amounts of time and resources for family and staff to access. Um, other schools such as Hyde Addison and Georgetown, which swung from Ward 3 to Ward 1, now serve only a 29% in-boundary population. We do not want to lose our community, our diversity, or our neighborhoodness. Um, if that's actually a word. Uh, if schools such as Merch Elementary can have a whole campus built for their swing space, costing the city $6 million, I don't understand exactly why the same courtesy cannot be extended to Truesdale. I recognize the limitations of buildings and space, but I do have not seen a comprehensive review of options by DCPS. As Zach mentioned, a swing space within War 4 could serve Truesdale, Whittier, and LaSalle, um, all awesome neighborhood public schools. I would also just like to take my last minute to advocate for gardening and nutrition programs and composting and sustainability programs to be included at Title I schools like Truesdale. 
Um, organizations such as Fruits and Street DC have had outstanding impacts on our, our school and its programming around gardening and nutrition. Uh, Truzo was for, fortunate enough to be able to support Foodprints this past year, but critical programming should just be part of our public schools. Um, and also, I would like to advocate for more support for DC scores. Truzo and our scholars have benefited greatly from our partnership, and we aren't able to meet the demands of our community. The program builds deep connections between families and schools and benefits scholars greatly. 96% of DC scores participants attended school during the pandemic. Reading and writing grades were increased, as well as standardized test scores. These programs are incredibly important for family engagement and social emotional learning, and we hope that they are part of the DCPS budget always. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Ms. Ahmed. Um, we'll have a round of questions. And I'm actually gonna start with um, Truesdale. Um, so DC has offered uh, Garnett Patterson. That's a bit of a distance. I'm trying to remember my daughter, uh, her swing space was at Meyer, which isn't too far from Garnett Patterson, but she also was in high school. Um, the alternatives that you are suggesting, and I guess the you would be Commissioner Israel or Ms. Ahmed, uh, are trailers on the site, which is like a $10 million, or, and I'm like filling the blank. So could you say more about the alternatives? Yeah, so that's a great question, Chairman Mendelson. So from, from what we've gathered working with uh, Councilmember Lewis George's staff, who, who've extensively explored this, um, you know, from what DCPS has, has said, um, you know, roughly 100,000 square feet of space would be necessary. So the, the soccer field at Truesdale is about 50,000, 55,000. So it's not going to be big enough for this. However, there are a couple of options elsewhere in Ward 4. Um, at the corner of Sheridan Street and 3rd Street Northwest at the Coolidge Rec Center, there's a massive, massive field that's over 100,000 square feet. Um, it's actually basically across the street from Whittier as well. So when they undergo their modernization, that's definitely an option. It's on DC-owned land. Um, and so uh, we just need DCPS to explore every possible avenue and opportunity and exhaust everything, which I, I publicly I have not seen that yet. In the letter I got from the chancellor, he did say there, there'll be a public engagement process in the next month or two, but we really need them, you know, all hands on deck. Let's be collaborative here. Let's, let's find whatever we can. Um, I can't remember the name of the uh, site, but uh, Goading is currently swinging to a space in Ward 5, but I think... Uh, actually, I just heard it might be Spin Garden. That's pretty far away, too. Uh, let me, I'm going to move to a different line of questioning. Several of you testified about um, the clearance process being so slow. Can one of you speak in more detail there? Why is this happening? Um, is it because the government has figured out how to be more bureaucratic and slothful about it? Or is it because there are so many more requests? Or was there some change? Yeah the law that we enacted? Um, so I can speak on part of it. So um, it used to be that the, um, I think now the CPR, CSFA clear, um, yeah, CPR child protection registry is also included as part of the clearance process. Um, and that is like a form that is easy for people to make mistakes on. So sometimes the people make mistakes and then that has to get sent back again. Um, and then if it doesn't get sent back to them it just kind of stays there, I think that could be part of it. I'm not really sure why um, it's been taking so long, other than that, I think that contributes to like one of the reasons. And I know on our end, I think there's about 340 or 370, something like that, but over 300 um, potential tutors that the only reason they can't start is because of the clearance issue. This, this clearance form, uh, how is it designed that it makes mistakes? Yeah, I feel like Curtis, do you want to jump in here? I saw your hand. Yeah, sure. So uh, DCPS implemented a new application form over the summer for this year uh, to house everything uh, all on one application form. So that includes the drug testing, that includes the child protective registry. Um, and so it's 
a bit confusing for some people because if you take or like originally earlier in the year for the CPR, it would take you off into a new window and then you'd have to input your documents and upload your ID and then send that off. And then uh, come January, they had a new vendor start because that just wasn't working. And really there hasn't been a ton of progress made even with the new vendor. There's been a ton of emails that I've received from our staff, just like getting constant emails saying, you know, the information's invalid, you haven't uploaded your documents and they've pleaded like, I've sent it in, I've sent it in. And then first advantage, which is the new vendor, isn't very communicative. Uh, DCPS isn't very communicative. So we just have a lot of staff just sitting in limbo, just not knowing what to do next. And so really the only time I get anything is if I CC someone from central office um, and then they might, you know, get back to me within the week. But then after that, then it just falls off and we just get nothing. So. So this sounds like it's more the bureaucracy than it is something that uh, the council did legislatively. I mean, there's, there's a lot of moving pieces. I mean, yeah, that's definitely a part of it. I think it would just be helpful if, like I had alluded to in the testimony, like in all honesty, if there was just some sort of online portal for applicants to really see, you know, kind of where they're at with the process, I think that their minds would be at ease a bit more. But at the moment, it's just like shooting all of your information into the ether and then kind of just waiting to see what happens. So, I mean, it's, it's just been really taxing on our staff and, yeah, we just had tons of applicants just drop out and, and just resign because they just they can't afford to sit around and wait to get cleared in order to work. And I get that. Um, and, and I don't want to disagree that uh, better communication would be helpful. Obviously, it would be helpful. But if it takes three months, having a window into seeing the three months tick by very slowly. I'm not sure that's any more satisfying than... Sure. I mean, the staff capacity issue is a big thing too. Like DCPS has told us they just don't have enough employees to sort through all of the applications that have come through. And I mean, to be fair, there are a lot of volunteer applications. There are you know, a decent amount of contractor applications for OST providers. And then there's the DCPS employee applications. So um, I mean, as far as the OST community is, in my opinion, you know, we just kind of take the back seat a bit because they prioritize the DCPS employees, which is understandable. But, you know, just have, having some sort of transparency and saying like, you know, hey, it's going to take this amount of time, you know, and just trying to put more, uh, yeah, staff efforts into, you know, getting, getting the clearances run through. Thank you. My time's up. Councilmember Lewis George. Uh, thank you. I'm going to go to Scott Colsey first. Um, Scott, can you say more about the efforts to um, expand the outdoor education this year and sort of what more we can be see, more we can see from DCPS I guess, or Aussie to, to expand opportunities? Yeah, thank you. So last year, after a lot of our advocacy, DCPS invested $9 million in outdoor learning and other innovations. A lot of that actually went to other things, but most of it was for outdoor learning infrastructure. Um, and, and infrastructure is not the right way to prioritize this. We have amazing organizations that do outdoor learning, like Foodprints, like Capital Experience Lab, Urban, Urban Adventure Squad, City Green, so many. And um, they are the way to do this, right, through our amazing partnerships. And so what we're asking for, much like Foodprints asked for, is first the dedicated uh, partnership with Foodprints to be fully funded in years continuing, but then also to have $6 million, um, $6.5 total, another $5 million, two and a half for each sector, so that uh, we can have 20 schools, at least in each sector, have full funding for an outdoor learning partnership. You bring the partners into the school, and then the partners design the programs, and then the programs figure out the infrastructure that they need. And that's how we can make sure students are actually outside learning. Okay. Uh, thank you. I appreciate your comments. Um, Ms. Ms. Tao Bell, I wanted to come to you. Um, can you um, uh, briefly try to elaborate on the lawsuit and the current status of education for students at YSC? W what's happening for them now? Right, so the lawsuit is actually against the district, but it specifically pertains to the DC jail. Um, uh, there is a separate complaint about the youth services center that was brought by uh, my colleagues at DRDC, alleging similar issues. Um, but the current status of the lawsuit against the DC jail for the lack of education, special education during the pandemic, um, most recently the federal judge uh, held the district in contempt 
it, the district judge ordered that uh, plans be made for March 15th for the district to figure out ways in which you can properly educate the students at the jail um, in compliance with federal law. Uh, okay, all right, um, I'm gonna follow up on some um, issues with that because it's a huge issue to provide a fair appropriate public education, especially uh, during a pandemic. Um, and that probably ties in a lot to some of, you know, Scott, what Scott was talking about with outdoor learning and creativity and getting creative there, um, especially when it relates to that particular population. Um, Faria, uh, I'm going to come to you um, about sort of what, what are you hearing from parents um, and, and even educators alike about the, the issues uh, with, you know, you know, with, with Truesdale and, and sort of the fears of, of students going all the way to, to Garnet Patterson. Yeah, so the, major, the majority of parents that I've spoken to are of um, mixed feeling. They really don't want to leave Truesdale, but are looking at options to lottery out uh, of Truesdale for the two years that we would be under modernization. Be a huge blow to our enrollment, obviously, and therefore our budget. Um, in terms of our ECE program, it's quite robust. Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's, and we just, we've, we've heard from a lot of parents who are incoming prospective parents who are saying, Oh, well, I don't know if I want to go to Truesdale next year, and then I'm going to pull my kid out because I don't want to. I don't want them taking the bus all the way downtown. Um, we've heard a lot of uh, concerns from staff about parking. Many of our staff either live in the neighborhood and walk to school, actually, or they actually live right in Maryland. So for them, adding 30, including our principal, adding 35 to 40 minutes to her commute every day is um is pretty significant. So these are these are some of the, the bigger concerns. Um, I have heard from other schools, I've talked to other schools that have done the busing before, and they've said that it's, you know, really painful in the beginning, but people get used to it, and it's all going to be okay. But, you know, if we could get a school, uh, a location that is closer to home that we could still walk to and, and engage with, uh, we, that would be our, our preference. Yeah. Um, I appreciate I appreciate that. I know we do have some issues with some enrollment drops. Uh, Raymond is currently swinging for their modernization, and they've dropped about twenty percent um, enrollment because of it. Um, we have a number of uh, Hyde Addison who's experiencing issues now after coming back. Um, I will say I, I sent a letter to the to the chancellor last May of twenty twenty one regarding potential options. Um, uh, the, the Christian Post was one I asked, and I, that one's unavailable right now. What we're told is that you would need obviously a hundred thousand. We would need a hundred thousand square feet to build a modular space. So I ran around and looked for a hundred thousand square feet in War Four, and that's how we landed at Sheridan and Third Street, where that Tacoma, uh, that large Tacoma uh, oh, field yeah. is. Um, right now, what I was what I was told is, oh well, we have a lot of programming there, but I'm like programming where because the there's a large field. So there's two baseball fields essentially there. One baseball field's never been used. Um, so if any program could move to that field, we could still have that space. Um, and so we're kind of in a back and forth about that. That looks like the only location where I can get 100,000 square feet out of, um, but I'm going to continue to look uh, and do that. But we'll probably have to do a mix of DPR and DCPS uh, advocacy as a result of that. So thank you for um, testifying and thank you to Commissioner Israel for, for helping organize and continue to advocate as well. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Henderson. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and good morning to everyone who testified. I um, joined a couple of minutes, well, not a couple of minutes. I joined midway through this panel, so I didn't get to hear everyone's testimony, um, although I'm taking some wild guesses based on um, some of the things that some of you have testified about before. Um, Mr. Leach and um, to the others who testified around the background check issues, um, I hear you. And in fact, this is something that I've actually raised specifically with the city administrator, um, who I'm still waiting Mr. City Administrator, if you're listening, or Mr. Deputy Mayor, if you're listening, I specifically asked, they, they, they say that there's something in terms of legislation that the council did a couple of years ago that has added to the timeline. And so what I have asked is, okay, well, tell me what the fix is um, in terms of how we can help expedite the process. I'm pretty sure I asked that in December. What month is it? March? So I still haven't gotten any information in terms of how we can resolve that issue, but I definitely... Um, hear you all in terms of the needs for us to to fix what's happening there um
Um, I'm like going back here. Um, I'm going to have to follow up with some of you more specifically um, once I uh, get more information in terms of um, your testimony. Uh, apologies again, There, this hearing is going on, DGS is going on, and there is also um, a Department of Corrections hearing happening at the same time. So I apologize that I wasn't able to get to everyone's testimony today, but those are all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Ms. Ahmed, I'm told by my staff that you had a statement you wanted to read on behalf of a parent who lost their child. Yes, I do. If um, now is okay, I can do that or I can wait for the next panel as they were supposed to be on the next panel. Uh, why don't you go now and then, Okay. since you're here. Okay, great. Um, I'm reading this on behalf of Jess Young, um, a parent at Truesdale, a parent at Truesdale. Uh, dear council members, thank you for your attention today. I'm a Truesdale parent asking for your help to keep our young scholars in Ward 4. Number one, Truesdale Scholars Walk. A large portion of our scholars walk, bike, and ride scooters to school. For my family, this is a choice that we make to benefit our own health as well as well-being of the planet. I advocate regularly among my neighbors and friends not to drive if they can avoid it. I reached out to DDOT for bike racks to support and encourage families to ride to school. We cannot bike, walk, or scoot to 10th and V, which is where Garnett Patterson is. My family chose the neighborhood specifically for the opportunities it possesses for walking, biking, and scooting. The same is true for many of our friends both current and future Truesdell parents, we cannot choose differently now. Not all families choose to walk, but do so out of necessity, often with an older child walking the younger child to school. Family members walk their Truesdell scholar to the school as part of their walk to work, asking them to add an hour or more to their morning commute time is unconsciousable, as any parent with more than one small child knows. We are concerned about the impact additional commute time will have on our families, stress levels will go up and family time will go down. Um, at Truesdale, we don't have a PTA in recognition of the fact that Truesdale scholars rely on and love a broader group of adults more than just their parents. This is both a wonderful and necessary means of getting children to school and watching over them after school. Sending our scholars three miles away from their homes and support systems will strain the whole community. We are concerned about being able to be there for our children, about not being able to go to school in a timely fashion should they fall ill or be injured. Truesdale builds community. My family loves Truesdale. We meet neighbors and their dogs on our walks to and from school. We have made good friends, both kids and adults, that we have that we would not have without the walk. We are afraid that the added time to our commutes will strain our connections. Families will consider and try to lottery out of Truesdale. I personally had several conversations about the possible possibility and likelihood. We are afraid our school community will be broken up. Our teachers are a big part of our community and a huge part of why we love Truesdale so much. We are afraid that the commute and lack of parking will discourage our favorite teachers from remaining at Truesdale and their loss would weigh heavily in our hearts. Thank you. And her name again is? Jessica Young. Thank you. Uh, I have Thank no you. questions for you. Thank you, each of you, for your testimony. You all are excused from the... Um, whatever this room is called, the witness room, oh, but you can continue to watch. I'm gonna call the next uh, 20 witnesses. Pat Brantley, who is the CEO of Friendship Public Charter School. Eric Anderson, Shannon Hodge, who's with the DC Charter School Alliance as the executive director, Tishan Puta, who is with ANC 2E01, Gianluca Bangara, it says here with PACT, Lauren Wolf, who's with Truesdale Elementary, Benjamin Vaughn, instructional coach at Truesdale, jo Jacobo Larios, community schools coordinator at LEYC, Gavin Ware, the Chesapeake Bay Outward Bound School, Andrew Lee, who's with DC Strings, founder and artistic director. Ariel Cote Collison, or Collison. Eric Lundgren, who's with Truesdale. Max Broad, who's with the DC Voters for Animals Education Fund. Tanya Hollis, says MD, Development of City Year Hollis. Jeanne Gaynor, with Truesdale Elementary, Grace Hu, who's with the Digi Digital Equity in DC Education, 
Regina Bell, who's with the Washington Teachers Union, Jacqueline Pogue Lyons, who's president of the Washington Teachers Union, Luis Falquez, who is Spanish teacher at Roosevelt State High School, Jaco Barden, who's with the Truesdale Elementary School. I think I'll leave it at that. Ms. Brantley, you're next. Good morning. Good morning. Or Good morning, I'm Pat Brantley, the CEO of Friendship Charter, where we educate nearly 5,000 DC students, employ 900 staff, half living in DC, and manage a million square feet of educational space. We are charged with ensuring a quality education for all children, and we do that through the efforts of our staff and by ensuring safe, appropriate learning spaces, whether in person or online. The past two years have been the most challenging I have ever witnessed. I'm sure many of you feel the same. My heart is with the children, families, teachers, and school staff. They have experienced trauma, loss, disruption of normal life, and fear. Fear of getting COVID, fear of spreading COVID, and fear that they or their loved ones could die from COVID. There's also an unprecedented level of anxiety driven by COVID, yes, but also driven by inflation, worsening economics for many of our families and staff, and of course, what's happening in the world. Still, there is also joy, progress, and growth. On joy, we saw that very clearly when we were able to welcome back students to our facilities and reunite them in person with each other and with our staff. It is here that I wanna focus my comments on how we can best deliver on our promise of a quality education. While we are grateful for the mayor's historic investment in public education, there are four areas where council action and investment are important. One, educated retention through housing assistance, two, facility support, three, at-risk funding, and four, safe passage for students. First, in your efforts to support staff retention, please consider housing. Be bold and make a historic investment in rental and housing assistance for educators to live and work in DC. Friendship teachers, leaders, and staff are committed, passionate, and caring. The dramatic rise in rents and housing costs is pricing teachers out who would live and work in our city. Help them grow deep and lasting roots in the communities in which they work. Second, increase the facility's allowance by at least 3.1% to ensure schools can continue to meet strict requirements for delivering safe buildings. Some believe charters like mine that operate multiple facilities need less than others. Nothing could be further from the truth. Each child and every staff member deserves a safe and appropriate facility for learning. I can't tell children and staff at Friendship Chamberlain that they will have upgraded HVAC, but too bad for the children at Friendship Woodridge or Friendship Ideal. I can't tell the fire marshal that we will meet requirements at some buildings and not others. Third, increase the at-risk weight to the level recommended by the adequacy study. We are grateful to the mayor for proposing a 5.9% increase but this is a COLA increase in today's high inflation environment. This increase doesn't allow us to have more staff or more purchasing power. Here's the math for those who are interested. The majority of our at-risk funding is spent on additional staff for intervention, tutoring, counseling. Only an increase in an at-risk weight will allow additional positions and non-personal items needed. Inflation did not overlook at-risk expenditures. Fourth and finally, we support expansion of safe routes and safe passage legislation. None of us can make whole the life of a parent who loses a child. The roads around our schools must be safe, and right now, in too many cases, they are not. Thank you for your leadership and for your support of our families. I have submitted my testimony in writing, and in doing so, included a recent article which highlights the effectiveness and demand for Friendship's online programs. I hope you'll re read it and consider future policies that support families seeking an online option. Thank you again. Thank you, Ms. Brantley. Uh, we're checking, I don't have your statement. We'll see if we've got it. Otherwise, maybe you could resend it. Uh, Eric Anderson, um, I don't see him. Shannon Hodge. Good morning, Chairman Mendelson and members of the Committee of the Whole. My name is Shannon Hodge, and I'm the founding executive director of the DC Charter School Alliance, the local nonprofit that advocates on behalf of public charter schools to ensure that every student can choose high quality public schools that prepare them for lifelong success. We must recognize all the hard work and dedication everyone involved in educating students has put in over the past two years and match that recognition with action. 
Today, I'm going to focus on what schools need from the District of Columbia's agencies and officials to accelerate recovery and serve our students better than we ever have before. I'll share a high level overview this morning and my written testimony includes more detail. First, we need a budget that demonstrates commitment to adequate funding for our schools to continue providing the opportunity for every student to acquire the knowledge, skills, and values necessary to be successful and find fulfillment in their lives. Our city's most under-resourced and vulnerable students need full investment for a full recovery. Our specific funding requests are included in my written testimony, and they include at least a 5.9% increase in the UPSFF foundation level, fully funding the at-risk weight and adult schools, creating housing and tax incentives as educator retention and recruitment tools, and increasing the charter facilities allotment by 3.1% so that charter schools can continue to receive the funds necessary to secure and maintain buildings. We know that we all need to think boldly about the future of public education in the city. That's necessary to create a truly equitable system that provides a high quality education for every student. Next, beyond adequate funding to support our students, we need city agencies to better coordinate and communicate with school leaders. Greater coordination and communication between city agencies and charter schools is both possible and critical, and a relationship that can benefit both. My written testimony and our testimony at last week's DC Health Performance Oversight Hearing include specific recommendations for how DC Health, DDOT, and OCTO can engage schools in the service of improving the education of DC's public school students. Finally, charter schools' flexibility has allowed them to be nimble during the pandemic and responding quickly to needs. And frankly, a lot of those needs had nothing to do with school. Whether it's getting students from point A to point B because public transportation isn't working, or finding low or no cost internet service for families who can't afford it, charter schools have gone above and beyond to serve their students. And while they've been able to fill those gaps because of their flexibility, they've done so at great expense. If we're going to address all the equity issues that the pandemic has exposed and exacerbated, charter school leaders need to have a meaningful role in the discussions around accountability and what recovery looks like going forward. And let me be clear, we don't anticipate recovery will happen overnight. It will be a multi-year process and we will need the space and opportunity to innovate in a way that not just gets students back to where they were, but accelerates their learning and prepares them for success in life. But that only underscores the need to work together across agencies and with school leaders and to orient our entire accountability system around equity for our most vulnerable students. Thank you for your time and attention to this matter and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Ms. Hodge. Uh, Commissioner Puta. Luca Bancara. Hi, yes, that's me. Yes, please proceed. Hi, so my name is Gianluca Bengara. I'm the um, parent of two young children attending Truesdale. My son Elio is in um, kindergarten. My daughter Nina started this year in pre-K three. Um, I really want to echo all of the testimony that was shared earlier, um, just sort of about the sentiment of what uh, our experience with Truesdale has been like. It's really been amazing. I've really been blown away. Um, you know, sending your young kids to school can be sort of nerve wracking, emotional, especially all things considered, but we've really been, um, you know, impressed and really felt really welcomed by by Truesdale, which, which in some ways uh, to me operates as like a center for the community. Um, I understand the need for modernization. Um, we were really happy with the new playground that Truesdale got, um, um, but, but obviously do have concerns with the proposed location um, for the swing space. Um, again, echoing what everyone else shared, the disruption to commutes, uh, the potential for losing staff, um, and, and what it could do to enrollment, sort of keeping Truesdale at the center of the neighborhood in Ward 4. Um, but taking it out of Ward 4 and, you know, what that, what that will do for potential future families who are considering sending their schools, their, their children to this school. Um, and, and so, and, and another um, one of my grave concerns, obviously, we've talked about traffic safety um, around the school. Um, there's probably room for improvement where Truesdale is now, but of course, moving the school further away, we'll probably see more parents and more teachers and more folks just needing to drive into school. And increasing the likelihood of of um, of accidents, um, and so 
with that, I, I want to I want to ask the council to consider reevaluating the location of the swing space, finding something that that really meets the needs of, of families, keeps teachers at the school who have been really great, um, and also takes into consideration um, the health and safety of of, of everyone um, concerned. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's not a decision of the council, which is not to say that we can't speak out, but this is DCPS's decision. Uh, Lauren, is Lauren Wolf here? Yes. Hi there. Hello. Thank you so much for the time today. I really appreciate the opportunity to testify. I am Lauren Wolf. I'm a concerned parent at Truesdale Elementary School. My daughter is a PK3 student at Truesdale. We've been exceptionally happy with our experience and we do have concerns over the current modernization plan for the following reasons. When this transition happens, my daughter will be in kindergarten and my son will be entering PK3. I do not feel comfortable with having them bus to school rather than our current walk. Additionally, I worry that by moving our school out of the ward, we'll lose our amazing teachers and staff who won't have an easy or affordable way to commute to work. Our sense of community that we have at pickup, drop off, and school activities. In these COVID times, being unable to enter our children's school means the only opportunity to meet parents and classmates is at pickup and drop off. And I worry with the proposal for the swing, swing space, we won't have this. We'll also lose an easy way to get our children to and from school and an easy way to get our children in case of emergency or sickness. And also access to a wonderful outdoor space that is safe. Part of the reason we moved to this neighborhood was because we wanted a neighborhood school. We don't wanna give up the community that we've built in Ward 4. When I look at the proposal, for the swing space, I worry that the commute for many parents, faculty, and support staff will be prohibitive and will reduce enrollment. I know personally as a working parent, I used to live in Shaw, and although it's less than three miles away, that commute could take upwards of an hour round trip. I ask you to reconsider the options being provided to our school based on what we've seen for other schools in wealthier wards. Thank you for your consideration. We appreciate the time that you are putting into this and we do want Truesdale to be modernized, but we would love options for the swing space that hit the needs of our children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wolf. And we have your statement, uh, Benjamin Vaughn. Yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman and to the Council Committee of the Whole. My name is Benjamin Vaughn Jr. I'm a proud member of the Truesdale Edge Elementary School community. And I've been with Truesdale since the start of my career seven years ago, around the time when Truesdale was deferred for its funding in model, uh, the remodeling. I currently serve as a math instructional coach, a member of the Truesdale Family Teacher Organization, and a member of our local school advisory team. I come to you today concerning Truesdale's modernization process, which begins next year with the planning phase. And I'm here to share my concerns about the lack of community engagement regarding the modernization process, the current plans for the temporary relocation for students and staff to the Garnet Patterson site, and the needs for our school community during this transition. I am elated that we are slated for modernization. We need it. Our school building is not only old, but has several external and internal issues that need to be addressed to increase the safety and compliance with federal and district expectations. It lacks an accessible floor plan, elevators to support access to the floors and to the playground for those with mobility challenges, and physical spaces to support our growing class sizes and population in the Petworth neighborhood. I additionally hope part of the modernization planning takes um, traffic patterns into consideration. I do not want any more of my babies to be injured during the arrival process to school. And I truly hope a functional solution is found in conjunction with DDOT, although this might be a different meeting that I need to attend, because speed humps will not solve the problem of pedestrian and driver blind spots due to the two-way traffic at our tight street. 
Another issue I would like to discuss is the selection of Garnet Patterson as the relocation site. Being that it is over two and a half miles away from Truesdale, students are to ride buses from Truesdale to Garnet Patterson, and staff members will also have to commute to the, to the school, to my understanding, and use street parking in the neighborhood um, because school parking would not be able to facilitate are more than 35 commuters. I personally live near Columbia, Maryland, and public transit is not an option for me um, in terms of coming to work. Um, more importantly, this, will, this move will dramatically impact learning time, which is antithetical to DC Public Schools' mission to make sure that every kid has an excellent education. In addition to the additional burden on families, I fear on enrollment will be dramatically um, decreased with this move. I think that it was an idea, it was not ideal, it was not equitable, but it was fairly a convenient solution. In conclusion, our school community needs to relocate to a space that is closer to our neighborhood, has the accommodations and resources to support excellence of our students, and most importantly, causes the least disruption to the student learning experience as possible. In my opinion, if solutions such as Merch's modular campus on UDC's property can be created and executed by DCPS, then this sort of solution is just as good for my students, my ward, and my community. I'm a solutions-oriented individual, and I hope to have opportunities to engage on this subject further. I honor and appreciate the attention you have given me, and I equally will answer your questions with the same attention and respect. This has also been submitted in my written testimony um, to the council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vaughn. We do have your statement. I'm gonna back up a little. Um, we double check, we don't have Pat Brantley's statement. So if she could resubmit that, that would be appreciated. And I skipped over Kishan Puta because he wasn't here, but he's here now. So you can go next, Commissioner. Thank you very much, Chairman Mendelson. I had a issue with the link and a sick toddler at home, but hey, thanks for fitting me in. Um, and thanks for coming to the Ward 3 Ed Network recently. I'm in Ward 2, right at the border of the two wards, and Hardy Middle School is in my district. I work closely with their PTO, uh, and hope my son will go there someday. He's only three, but uh, we're advocating hard. I'm the school's liaison for ANC2E, uh, Georgetown and Berleith living in Berlin. Uh, we got um, uh, our ANC and ANC3B to support uh, modernization of Hardy Middle School. Uh, I know that uh, uh, you also were speaking about that at the Ward 3 Ed Network, that uh, despite the MacArthur situation being unresolved, uh, that should not uh, stand in the way of uh, improving the situation at the Hardy building, no matter what uh, improvements are needed there because it's it's old. It hasn't been renovated since 2008. Uh, the field is in terrible shape and unsafe. The auditorium, way out of date and too small. The cafeteria, too small. And then the classrooms uh, are, are getting filled. Uh, the Fillmore School, Fillmore Arts program has moved out, but all that space has already been filled. We're already at the 2027 projected levels. And uh, Councilmember Pinto knows about this. She cares about this. She's uh, asked for only $1 million so far for um, for the field and court. Uh, and so uh, and we appreciate that uh, because that's needed, but a lot more is needed as well. It may not be needed tomorrow, but it's needed uh, very soon. And we should get the process started soon since we know how long it can take. That's pretty much all I have for you. Uh, and I want to thank you for your support. Oh, sorry. I have one last thing. Um, I apologize. I, I, I thank you for meeting with me and uh, the Digital Equity Coalition in your office three years ago before the pandemic uh, to make sure that we got more uh, devices in schools. And that was so prescient of you and everyone else uh, because uh, when the pandemic uh, caused shutdowns, we got those devices in to, uh, to, for all the uh, parents to take home. It was, it was very... Uh, lucky and it was after due to a lot of hard work by us and you and so now we need more we need uh to make sure we get to one-to-one -to -one. uh and i know grace who is coming on to talk about that please listen to her and please uh, uh please support the uh the, the request of the of the coalition because they were right last time and they're right this time thank you uh, thank you commissioner um Yes, and we have a bill, digital equity bill, that I hope we will mark up finally very soon. Uh, please come visit Hardy. 
All right, I've been there already, but I'm happy to come back. All right, great. Um, next is Jacobo Larios with LAYC. Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman, uh, for allowing me to be in this hearing and council members. Uh, my name is Jacobo Larios. I am a community schools coordinator at LAYC. Um, LOIC Community Schools Program represents a set of partnerships between the school and community resources that support students and families in a beyond the classroom. The goal of community schools is to integrate academics, health and social services, youth and community development, and community engagement to improve, to increase the student academic achievement, and to ensure family well being. During the COVID 19 crisis, our community schools program pivoted all programming to meet the new and evolving needs of the students and families that we work with every day. This meant that within weeks of the shutdown, LOIC and Community Schools Program pivoted to all virtual services. Today, we continue to provide critical services remotely and in person. In fiscal year uh, 2021, LOIC Community Schools Program had the following results. Over 398 uh, youth served, over 116 youth received food distribution, 45 students received clothing, 70, 73 students participated in workshops, and over 78 families received toiletries. As LOIC has implemented the community schools program in DCPS schools, we successfully uh, support the student body, community, and staff members. In 2021, like many of our youth struggling because of the pandemic, I would like to share uh, one story with you. Junior and his family were struggling to deal with the pandemic. Both of his parents lost their jobs and didn't have money to buy food, toiletries, or even access to computers and the internet. Understandably, all of these factors affected the student performance in school because of the community schools program. We were able to provide Junior and his family with the essential needs of the student's family. For example, LOSC provided hotspots, food distribution, toiletries, detergent, and financial support. Providing these resources had an immediate effect on students' performance in the school. We were happy to see Junior's doing uh, better in his academics because we know that we that he could focus on his academic work and not on the stressors uh, his family was facing uh, before our intervention. LOC Community Schools Program is generally a win-win model that connects the community's resources to DCPS schools to support students and families in a beyond the classroom and provide added uh, capacity to schools we work with. We know how critical this program is to the community, and we know that the funding levels are that are supporting our work are a mixture of local and federal dollars. Uh, when those federal dollars are used up, we would like to ask for continued support for our work today and beyond the pandemic funding by ensuring that funding levels are maintained at their current levels with, uh, local, do uh, with local dollars. We truly appreciate all the support of the Community Schools in Initiative uh, Program and have allowed us to accomplish over the last few years during these uncertain times. We look forward to working with, uh, with them in the upcoming years. I yield my time. Um, Chairman, thank you. <laughs> thank you. The next witness is Gavin Ware with Chesapeake Bay Outward Bound. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gavin Ware. I'm a Ward 5 resident and I also serve as the Deputy Director for the Chesapeake Bay Outward Bound School. The Chesapeake Bay Outward Bound School, otherwise known as CBOB, is a part of an international network of Outward Bound schools in over 30 countries with 11 chartered schools in the United States. Our experiential curriculum focuses on teaching social emotional learning skills to predominantly middle and high school age youth through challenging outdoor experiences ranging from one day to multi weeks in length. CBOBs serve students of all ages from all backgrounds, but our priority is serving youth in high need communities in Baltimore and Washington, DC. CBOBs was established in 1986 and has served nearly 100,000 students in that time. Our mission to change lives through challenge and discovery has remained the same but our organization has grown and adapted to the needs of the community for the last four decades. We are constantly evolving our program and how we deliver it, serve, strengthen our staff, and how we grow to serve even more students across the region. Our programs provide an evidence-based approach to character education that can significantly shape the future of our young citizens. A study by the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health shows that our students acquire vital skills in leadership, conflict resolution, and compassion. According to Dr. Peter Wench, Director of the Social and Behavioral Interventions Program at the Bloomberg School of Public Health, there is growing evidence that our outdoor education programs, which focus on strengthening life skills and social skills, are effective at promoting healthy adolescent development. In 2019, 
With the support of the A. James and Alice B. Clark Foundation, we launched a much awaited new campus in Washington, DC. While we, we have been working with schools and youth serving partners in the district for years, we know that there is no substitute in being in the community and working shoulder to shoulder with our public and charter school partners to deliver the highest quality social emotional learning programs to district students. Alongside overwhelming support from government officials and philanthropic leaders, we have already embedded ourselves within several schools such as Hart Middle School, Capital City Public Charter School, and the Truth Montessori School. In a short amount of time, the demand of our out-of-school time programs has been considerable. Despite the constraints brought on by the pandemic and a lack of physical campus to deliver our programs, more than 1,300 students from the district have participated in our Outward Bound program. We also launched our first DC expedition since our expansion into DC. This was not just an expedition. This was a transformative experience for students. And quote, I was in the first Washington DC expedition and we did the Appalachian Mountain. They helped me become a better person and leader. They pushed my group to the core and I really appreciate it. I will forever keep my patch as a symbol of a week's worth of hard work, a wilderness expedition student. So now more than ever, our programs are essential to the overall well-being of youth in Washington, DC. Every student deserves the opportunity to engage with differentiated experiential educational experiences. We hope outdoor education is considered as a part of the mayor's budget. Support from Mayor Bowser's office can directly affect access to social emotional learning programs that improve academic performance and social emotional well-being for students. As a result, we are able to serve more students and educators in the district, many of whom would not otherwise be able to participate in an outward bound program. We are extremely grateful for your time and continued investment in our young people. Thank you all for your time and thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank you, Mr. Ware. Andrew Lee with DC Strings. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson, members of the committee, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Andrew Lee, and I'm the founding artistic executive director of DC Strings Workshop, also known as DC Strings. Uh, we are at East of the River serving nonprofit, committed to bringing music to all parts of our city, particularly underserved areas, and are proud to be one of the few ensembles in the region to keep our concert season going throughout the pandemic. Collaborating with district agencies and organizations, we presented over 15 concerts across the region, safely reaching thousands online and in parks and community spaces. I don't have to tell you about the challenges of the pandemic, especially for vulnerable families. At one point, our teachers were delivering instruments door to door to students to keep the music alive in the district. Our summer programs with support from Learn24 had a waiting list of over 50 students. Currently, we're serving more than 300 students weekly across several DC public and charter schools. We also know the impact of gun violence and crime has had on our community. Misinformation regarding COVID-19 has led several of our students to disenroll from school and become disengaged, further exacerbating the achievement gap. District officials must recognize that OST programming keeps youth safe and engaged, and the district must invest in OST as part of youth and a community safety solution but we wanna know what the plan is to keep youth safe this summer and off the streets. Programs like DC Strings offer high quality music activities to keep students focused, growing, and able to respond to the trauma they're experiencing. We offer music therapy from a clinical psychologist in our classes and know that enough resources are not being allocated to support youth and their families. From gun violence to trauma, of the pandemic and job loss, our youth are hurting. Mayor Browser recently announced a year round partnership to address violent crime in Ward 7 and 8. We believe that Safe Routes to School and other partners should be a part of this conversation. The clearance backlog has been also made things difficult for our teachers and staff. We would appreciate you looking into the DCPS clearance process to make sure that we're able to get folks cleared safely and ensure that this program is working effectively. Um, as I move through my testimony, I think you have a copy of my remarks, but I, I do want to bring up that um, with the additional funding that the district has received federal dollars for OST, um, it has brought the budget, it has been increased by nearly 10 million, and we're definitely supportive and grateful for that, but those federal funds will expire in, in 2024, and we want to work and have a conversation about supplanting them now with local reoccurring funds to ensure that OST is able to absorb all of the interest in all the programs um, that they want to be able to have to ensure a smooth process for partners and families. Um, as I close, I just would um, really appreciate 
uh, your focus on this and your attention to this so that our students are able to continue to learn music and the arts and keep it alive in the district throughout the pandemic. So thank you for the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Lee. I don't believe we have a copy of your statement. So if you would send that, I'd appreciate it. Okay, I'll resend it. I checked with my staff. Um, the budget this year for out of school time is uh, I believe $30 million. And if the funding, including federal funding is good through FY23, which is what the mayor will be sending down. I doubt that the council is going to be making cuts to supplant the federal dollars with local dollars. Uh, but I'm also fairly confident that the council not only supports OST now, but will continue to support OST. So, And also supporting staff for OST. I mean, there's a lot of programs. There's a, a lot of our programs are at capacity, both in students and in resources. So any additional support to the actual OST office, I think would be helpful to help them. Sure. Fair okay. point. Thank you. The next witness is Ariel Cote Kalisan. I don't believe she's here. Uh, Eric Lundgren, who's with Truesdale. Hello, good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson and council members. Thank you so much for your time today. My name is Eric Lundgren and I'm a proud longtime Ward 4 resident and parent of two current Truesdale Elementary School children and a third in the near future. In lieu of repeating what my fellow Truesdale community members have already said, I'll simply say that I wholeheartedly agree with their concerns about Truesdale's proposed move to a downtown swing space and would also ask the council and DCPS to consider a shared ward for swing space that could be used not only by Truesdale, but also by Whittier and LaSalle Beckus. It deeply saddens me to think how disruptive, both academically and emotionally, a two-year downtown move will be to the students of these schools and want to know that the city council and DCPS have done everything in their power to, pre to prevent this. I certainly understand that the city operates with a limited budget and with physical space restrictions. And in the event that a neighborhood swing space that prioritizes keeping the school community together is not possible, I kindly ask DCPS to provide the following publicly to the community. Number one and most urgent, Regardless of where Truesdale ends up, I urge DCPS to immediately provide clarity on how the logistics of a downtown site would work in the event that we need to move there, especially regarding transportation and access to outdoor space. Many of the other parents that I have talked to have concerns around these two areas specifically as has been shared already today. While we have heard that DCPS will provide busing, I understand that DCPS has provided vans with appropriate child seats for younger children in other situations, and in fact is legally obligated to do so. I'm also aware that DCPS has previously built temporary playgrounds on sites that do not currently have them. These types of details have yet to be commun communicated to the, communi the Truesdale community and I believe that immediately providing this information ahead of the May 2nd enrollment deadline will help alleviate family concerns and help keep the neighborhood school community together. While Truesdale would not move off site until the 23-24 school year, I'm disappointed that these kinds of details have not yet been shared ahead of the lottery submission deadline, as some parents, as you've heard today, are already considering changing schools for the next school year. And number two, I urge the council and DCPS to provide a comprehensive review of space options and why a downtown swing space may be or may not be cho chosen and an exc explanation of why other schools such as Merch have been granted this kind of temporary build out um, neighborhood swing space previously. Um, I thank you again for your time and um, welcome any questions. Thank you, Mr. Lundgren. Max Broad. Hello, Chairman Mendelson and uh, Council Member Janice Lewis George and Council Member Christina Henderson. Um, thank you for the opportunity to weigh in on DC Public Schools' meaningful contributions to the wellness and impact of DC youth. Uh, I'm the president of DC Voters for Animals Education Fund, an organization that seeks to build awareness around animal issues and strengthen the ties between DC residents and other species. We're a member of the DC Good Food Purchasing Program Coalition, which works to improve institutional food across five value categories. Those five are uh, valued workforce, local economies, health, animal welfare, and sustainability. 
And uh, I, I'm just arriving today in regard to the important role DC Public Schools has in providing nutrition to students across DC. Through, through our work in the GFPP Coalition, we have gotten to know DCPS as a good faith partner in efforts to make headway on, with school food. In 2019, DCPS even conducted a baseline audit of its food systems. It's a required element of the GFPP process to use a benchmark for future gains across the five value areas. The pandemic and supply chain shortages stalled implementation of the GFPP. This is understandable given the unforeseen challenges and DCPS stepping up to feed so many students as the school shut down. However, over those past two years, we have lost ground on important gains and improving the impact of school food that the DC Council signed off on with the Healthy Students Amendment Act. As an animal protection organization, DC VFA Ed Fund sees GFPP as one of the most meaningful levers we have in DC to advance animal welfare. Through the guidelines of GFPP, DCPS can improve the outlook for animals by sourcing from animal welfare certified farms and by including more plant-based dishes. This is directly reinforced by research that came out this January, which found that environmental health and animal conditions can be improved by meat reduction and less worrisome meat consumption in dining. Implementing the GFPP standards can make the difference in the lives of millions of animals every year that are often raised in some of the most inhumane conditions. Moreover, the GFPP extends our ability to make an impact on animals beyond the borders of DC by recognizing the impact of our consumption patterns of the lives of animals, regardless of where they are born. We hope that DCPS will take the lessons learned from the past two years of the pandemic to resume the GFPP process. DCPS has done an amazing job as both the coalition partners and as providers of sustenance to so many school children. We thank you for your attention to this issue and hope to be a further service as invested members of the DC community and of the DC GFPP coalition. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Broad. I believe Tanya Hollis is not here. It's Tom J and she likes it. So Sam will be um, in her place. Just Uh, looks like Sam Peterson is here to speak for her. Yes. Thank you, Chairman Mendelssohn and all members of the Committee of the Whole for your time today. My name is Sam Peterson and I proudly serve as the Senior Manager of External Affairs for City or DC. I'm testifying today on behalf of Tanja Hollis, who's unable to be here. We would like to thank the council and the mayor for the generous dedication of funds to support high dosage tutoring in the needs of our students in DC. As a result of your efforts, we were able to serve over 7,000 students and in 20 of DC's highest need schools. However, as you all know, there is much more to be done. Since the start of the pandemic, we have expanded our footprint to meet the demand for our services, serving 20 schools. However, demand continues to grow and we have 19 schools on our wait list and receive new support requests daily. The funds provided via the support tutoring grant, if awarded, will ensure we are able to support more students reaching their academic potential and more students attending school on time and ready to learn. In addition to the long-term funding support, structural elements within DCPS will ensure partners are able to do their work effectively and efficiently. City Year has worked with DCPS for the past three years on yearly contracts written often after services were rendered, which is neither helpful for us nor a best practice for government procurement. While we are operating with our partners in the district under good faith in order to support our schools, grow responsibly, we need a more consistent and simplified approach, which would look similar to previous council approved multi-year agreements we had for the 13-14 school year, the base year, and followed by four option years for 14-15, 15-16, 16-17, and 17-18. We kindly ask that the district provide and the council approve a similar contractual structure and agreement for city year in the future, which would allow us to provide support for more than 20 schools in the district. Further, Due to the total cost of the DCPS contract exceeding $250,000, we ask that the council supports a waiver for city or DC to forgo the need to outsource 35% of our program model to subcontractors. As we are an AmeriCorps program, our members performing services are contractually obligated through that program. We have proven that we are a reliable and effective partner for the district and care deeply about our students. They are our sole mission. We cannot let the warning gap, the learning gap between wards continue to grow is it will only get worse if we do not invest immediately within the next school year in our mission. Is a valued partner with DCPS, DC Charter Schools, teachers and schools since 2000, our AmeriCorps members serve as student success coaches by cultivating learning environments where all students can build on their strengths 
fully engaged in their learning and experience success. For schools we partner with, City Year is a 78% more cost effective than contracting with individual providers to deliver our holistic set of services. Our average cost per core member per school is less than $15,000. A national external evaluation demonstrates that there is a City Year effect in driving full school improvement. Schools who receive support from City Year experience a 2x growth in math and a 3x growth in ELA. Thank you, Chairman Mendelson and the Council for your time. I look forward to helping DC students together. Thank you, Mr. Peters. Janae Gaynor. Hi, yes, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jenny Gaynor. I'm a Ward 4 resident and parent of twins who attend Truesdale Elementary. I'm also a new parent representative on our local school advisory team. And I'm testifying because I'm concerned about the proposed option for our school swing space during modernization, the details of which you've heard from our great community of advocates already. So just to reiterate the distance, we live at the south end of Truesdale's boundary, closest to Garnett Patterson, and it would be a 25 or 30 minute bus ride, if we time it right, a 20 plus drive in traffic or 20 minutes on bike. And I'll say Google Maps says it would be 15, but I know that even with the assist, getting up that hill on the way home with two kids on back, it would take me longer. Um, and I expect that our commutes would be on the shortest end of that scale that would be experienced by the community. And so, as you've heard, even with buses to and from school at the beginning and end of the day, I think it's gonna be really challenging that it would take over an hour to pick up our children in case of illness or emergencies. And it's just a big change from our current expectations when we enrolled our kids at Truesdale. Um, I'm concerned that the distance is gonna cause us to lose families, especially those of our English language learners because they would not wanna deal with some of these complicated logistics. And as Eric said, we just don't know anything about these logistics. So just kind of opting out earlier is, is something I'm really afraid that we're gonna do and lose, um, lose families. Um, and then third, I'm really concerned that the distance is gonna cause us to lose our amazing teachers, staff, or administrators, just because that lack of parking and increased commute times is a really big problem. I just don't want this to be that final straw after several difficult years of teaching through COVID and, and many other changes in our school. Um, our family chose Truesdale because we believe in investing in and being present in our neighborhood is a shared responsibility. And so I'm just deeply concerned that our school, that 60% in boundary and 50% English language learners will face significant barriers to maintaining enrollment and effectively supporting our current families if we're at this proposed swing space for two years. The long awaited investment is coming, but we risk not being able to share those benefits with people who can't um, and don't want to commit to this time in the swing space. Our school does need modernization. Not being ADA accessible in 2022 is unacceptable. And our students deserve a building that's safe, comfortable, and promotes effective learning. Um, I'm sure DCPS made this recommendation for a reason, but we just want Truesdale parents, teachers, staff, and admin to have more input and opportunities for engagement given the potential long-term impacts. I just don't want it to go from a 60% inbound community-centric school with a promising project-based learning initiative to a school with a brand new building that doesn't serve local learners or engage with the community. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ms. Gaynor. I believe Grace Hu is not here. And I believe Regina Bell is not here. She's here. Grace is not here. Uh, I'm told Regina Bell. Yes, I do see her. Okay. Ms. Bell. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson. Uh, my name is Regina Bell, General Vice President of the Washington Teachers Union. The WTU is committed to fighting for social and educational justice for the students of the District of Columbia, as well as the well being of district teachers. It took a pandemic for people to recognize the critical role that schools, teachers, and staff have in our community and economy. Teachers have gone above and beyond the school year. There's a dire shortage of teachers, substitutes, and paraprofessionals. Teachers are resilient, but now they're at a breaking point. They are under unimaginable stress, and we should all be concerned that there will be a mass exodus at the end of the school year. Let's turn the disruption that the pandemic has created into a renaissance at DCPS. Here are a few ideas to revive DCPS. DCPS needs to stop excessive testing, student testing. Don't treat them as data points. Let teachers teach and nurture students through academics, math, science, music, arts, literature, 
and athletics and give periodic assessments to gauge growth. Principals need to ask their teachers, how can I help you succeed? Instructional superintendents need to ask their principals the same thing. What do you and your teachers need to succeed? DCPS needs to streamline the hiring process. It shouldn't take 60 days or more to onboard a new employee. DCPS, OSSI, and the WTU need to work together to support teachers who need to obtain a license. It shouldn't be a foreign concept to have these groups working together. We all have the same goal. DCPS needs a fair teacher evaluation system. We shouldn't be losing 20% of our workforce annually because of a biased evaluation system. Special ed teachers need a coordinator who will do the per paperwork so they can teach students. DCPS and GGS need to maintain the school buildings. Council members shouldn't have to visit a school in order for repairs to be made. Vic Murthy, the Surgeon General has warned that the pandemic has intensified a rise in adolescent depression, anxiety, and mental health distress that was underway before the spring of 2020. He even visited Jefferson Academy to bring attention to the seriousness of this issue. DCPS needs to make sure each school is equipped with a mental health team to address the needs of students. Otherwise, no learning will take place. And I'm having a deja vu all over again about the budget process. We need true budget transparency. I hope and pray that the council has the political will to see that these changes will take place. We all know what happens when we do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. DCPS has about 50,000 students in the school system. If we all work together, the students will succeed. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank you, Ms. Bell. Uh, Ms. Pogue Lyons. Thank you, Chairman Mendelson and city council members. Good afternoon. I'm Jacqueline Pogue Lyons, president of the Washington Teachers Union. I've taught in public schools across Washington, D.C. for 28 years. COVID-19 and the subsequent school closures have made it clear that schools play an outsized role in our community. They are so much more than places to learn. Despite the rhetoric you'll hear, our city has not made real progress across the district for all students. In fact, achievement gaps grow. Over the last 15 years of reform in DC, the achievement gap between students eligible for reduced lunch and those who are not eligible has significantly grown. The true measure of our city is how we treat our most vulnerable. And it is time that we do more for those furthest from opportunity. This past year, our city saw an unprecedented investment from the federal government via the American Recovery Program to help us overcome the kind of excuse me, the COVID pandemic. I hope the council will ask our city's educational agencies how they have utilized these funds to not simply help students regain lost learning, but how they have utilized this once in a lifetime investment to overcome our city's longstanding growing achievement gap. The path forward for public education in the district will require difficult conversations. I would like to commend the deputy mayor for raising concerns in May 2019 about the continued expansion of public charter schools in a memo entitled A Facilities Assessment of New Public Charter Applications Spring 2019. This memo outlined concerns about the impact that new charter openings and program expansions will have on existing schools, especially small high schools and middle schools. Yet unfortunately, we haven't had further conversations about our city's path forward. The DC State Board of Education continues to do important work raising issues of concern and providing a voice to district residents in debates about our city's educational system. The board has done incredible work with limited budget to support the update of our city standards for social studies, as well as in facilitating debates around reopening schools. Over the past several years, the DC State Board has led efforts to help our city understand and fix the district's rates of teacher turnover, which the WTU continues to believe is driven in large part by DCPS's punitive and racist evaluation system known as IMPACT. We thank the board for its important work. The Office of the State Superintendent works to sustain, sustain and accelerate and deepen progress for students and serves as the clearinghouse for federal funds, as well as for information on our educational systems. Unfortunately, OSSI continues to operate in a black box with little engagement with the WTU and educators on the ground. Additionally, OSSI serves as the main licensure education, licensure educate, 
agency for educators in the district. We continually hear from educators that they have difficulty navigating the licensing process, including difficulty receiving responses or answers to basic questions and delays in processing required paperwork. We hope that OSSI will work over the coming year to address these deficiencies and improve the certification process. The past two years have been trying for everyone. And while we have seen progress on items such as technology, we have moved to one-to-one -one student device ratios with teachers and students and they have provided computers and COVID protocols, we especially would like to thank DCPS leadership for working with us to establish a rapid response desk to confront challenges with health and safety issues in an urgent manner. DCPS, however, still has a long way to go to achieve the goal set forth by the five-year strategic plan. With regard, regards to facilities, it should not take city leaders visiting a school to ensure HVAC systems are fully operational. Yet that is what often what it often takes to ensure basic repairs are completely taken care of in our school. We respectfully ask that DCPS provide a thorough list of repairs, vendors, and costs that were completed in our schools over the past two years, including a full accounting of any repairs or enhancements completed with ARP funds. For special education and English language learners, achievement rates for these students continue to lag far behind their peers. Teachers assigned to serve these students are overburdened with paperwork and often are pulled from their regular duties to support these students. The WTU would like to thank the council for acting last year to ensure that every DCPS school has a full-time librarian. Thus, we call on the council to move forward with legislation to ensure that these positions are required in every school. At last year's oversight- Ms. Poglions, you are the president of the union. Yes. Two minutes over your time. I don't think I've had anybody go this much over their time. I thank you. Can I get- 30 more seconds to conclude. Yes, Madam President. Thank you, sir. At last year's oversight hearing, I made three recommendations, which included first, reduce class size. Second, adoption of a co-teaching model and collaborative teaching models. Third, a librarian in every school. I'd like to thank you for taking time to listen to me and giving me over the amount of time, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure that Luis Falquez is here, and uh, Chaco Barden, I don't see either of them. Uh, Ms. Poglines, I don't have a copy of your statement, if you could provide that. Will do, thank you. Okay. And um, let me see. Uh, Either you or Ms. Bell, um, I only have five minutes here. The, um, and I have several questions I wanna ask others, but um, testing, Ms. Bell, you testified there's too much testing. Can you help quantify that right now? Cause I can ask about that tomorrow, but other than saying there's too much testing. I'm yeah, there's, sure. there's uh, DCPS has uh, implemented testing for, I think it's K to 12, these required curricular tasks that makes students from kindergarten up to 12th grade take tests. But for kindergarten, it's just about every week. And it's, uh, it's very stressful for students and teachers. Uh, they're supposed to be online, but they don't have the equipment and they print it out and then they have to read it because it's kindergarten. And it, it's just, it's not pedagogically appropriate for students to be tested at this frequency. Uh, is that it or other tests as well? Well, I'd have to, I'd have to uh, look up the other, the RCTs are for literacy, for math, for social studies, science. So it's, 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 um, it's a strand that they have to take frequently. The other, some of the tests are necessary um, just to get a gauge of how students are progressing, but this weekly testing is excessive. Uh, my other question, which maybe is more to uh, President Pogue Lyons is uh, that, Digital one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, so you and I have talked about this. Do you have more thoughts? What I'm referring to is 
I hear, and I believe you hear, uh, complaints that schools don't have that one-to-one -one ratio. And then uh, I talk to uh, go out and go to a school and they say, oh no, we've got enough. So how do I sort this out? Well, for instance, I talked to a middle school and although the seventh, the eighth, the seventh and the eighth grade students, I now here have one-to-one, -one, there seems to be an issue in the same middle school with the sixth graders. So it's not across the board. And particularly like um, General Vice President Bell said, um, when testing, when doing the successive testing, a lot of this testing requires one-on-one -on -one technology. In fact, it was set up for one-on-one -on -one technology, but that's not the case in many schools. And then therefore teachers are spending even more time um, during the test, doing the testing because they don't have the one-on-one -on -one technology and it takes more excessive time testing than actual teaching because they don't have the one-on-one -on -one technology. But I think we have to do a true assessment and um, collect real data on where the technology is and where it isn't. And in many underserved communities, we understand that because many of the laptops weren't returned, this is what I hear, that they didn't get um, the computers or the laptops that they lost. I'll try to follow up tomorrow. Okay. I have a question for Max Broad. Um, your organization, DC Voters for Animals Education, um, are you advocating vegetarian in the schools? Great question. So uh, the GFPP has um, measures to improve the animal welfare in school food through two tracks, whether it's through more humane uh, certified meat or through more plant-based meals. Um, and so we're definitely advocating that they just pursue their attention to that the animal welfare track. Okay. And then um, I wanted to ask uh, Shannon Hodge to give a little bit more detail with regard to the weights. You, you want to see the at-risk weight increase to 0.37 and the charter facility allotment increase to 3.1 or increase? Increased by 3.1%. Uh, so for, on the at-risk weight, um, th that is our usual request to request to ask that that uh, be fully funded. Um, in an era where we are paying so much attention to equity and, and so concerned as we should be about the outcomes for our most vulnerable students, every year that we underfund the at-risk weight, we're actually increasing the differences between what they're getting and what they should be getting um, and what other students are getting. So while we're certainly happy with the 5.9% and would love to go even higher, we recognize that not funding the at-risk weight at 0.37 is further disadvantaging those students. And as to the facilities allotment, there is an automatic 3.1% increase beginning in fiscal year 24. What we're requesting is that that also be in place for fiscal year 23 to ensure that charter schools are able to secure and maintain their building safely for students. It's recurring beginning 24? Correct. I have a hunch that was so that we could get it through the financial plan. I'm going to guess that's probably right. And then, um, I'm actually out of time, so let me just see if, uh, I think that was it. Thank you, let me turn to my colleagues. Council member uh, Lewis George. Council member Lewis George, are you here? I think she's gonna lose her opportunity. There are a couple other hearings going on right now. Uh, so I want to thank each of you for your testimony. Uh, you all are excused, and I'm going to call the next uh, 20 witnesses. Thank you. Uh, Christina Benjamin, who's Managing Director of DC Head Start Association. Suzanne Wells, who's representing the Ward 6 Public Schools Parent Organization. Eric Heckel, who's a teacher. Virginia Mousy, who's a teacher. Megan Moroni, who is a senior policy associate at the Center for Science and the Public Interest. Rachel Clark, 
is Policy Director, Redstone Global Center for Prevention and Wellness. Lauren Newman, who's with City Blossoms. Christopher Bonner, who's from Truesdale. Leah Howe with DC Greens. Hayab Stefanos. Carla Reed Witt, who's with the Special Education Advocacy Coalition. Brittany Crawford, National Association for the Advancement of Returning Citizens. Africa Battle is a teacher, Michael Zeldin, an ANC commissioner. Berna Artis with DCAEYC. Christopher Stewart, who is uh, is listed as a human and social justice librarian. Fraser O'Leary, who is the elected representative to the State Board of Education from Ward 4. Nicole Howard. Aluasim Batunde, who is a CPE mentee, McKinley Technology High School senior. Jackie Carter, who's executive director of Children's Legacy Theater. Stephen Varhall, who's a teacher. Zachary Parker, who's also on the State Board of Education. Um, so let's see who we've got. Is Christina Benjamin here? Is Suzanne Wells here? Is Eric Heckel here? Mr. Heckel, you are going to go first. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Mendelson, the members of the Committee of the Whole, for having me. My name is Eric Heckel, and I'm a Ward 4 resident, DCPS parent, and English teacher and building representative at Theodore Roosevelt High School. I want to testify about the need for Roosevelt and Roosevelt Stay to have their own dedicated buildings next year. As an LSAT, we recently finalized our budget proposal to DCPS. Our projected enrollment next year is 868 students, which is significantly more than the current 820 students that we serve at Roosevelt. We focused our budget proposal around trying to meet the needs of our students through investing in people. We have proposed to add 23 new staff positions, 15 teachers, and seven SEL support positions. Our school is also adding another ILS cohort in our special education department. We've highlighted our space concerns to DCPS once we received our enrollment projections in the fall and again with our budget proposal. At the same time, Roosevelt Stay, which is housed in the same building as Roosevelt Senior High School, is adding another special education program. Last year, Roosevelt Stay's projected enrollment was 695 students. And while we know that much of STAY's programming is non-traditional, students still use the space for the duration of the traditional school day. If we combine the coming year's projections from STAY, which is 590 students, and Roosevelt, which is 868 students, we get a projected 1,458 students to use a building that was made for 1,092. That many people in one school building is untenable and a recipe for a disaster. Both schools have worked tirelessly over the past few years, years to build their programming to meet the needs of students. At Roosevelt, we have seen consistent enrollment increases each year outside of the pandemic year of school year 2021, as families have come to understand that Roosevelt is a school they want to send their children to. Continuing to expand the number of students we serve without expanding the space for those students will make for larger classes more crowded hallways, exacerbate current safety issues, and lead families to leave our school. Some of the most important safety concerns that will be exacerbated and are currently being exacerbated by having two schools in one building that was constructed to only house one school are fights between adult students and minors, inappropriate physical interactions between adults and minors. These are adult students that are in the same building as minor students. Uh, and gang recruitment by adult students of minor students in the building. Now, these problems have always existed with the two schools in the same building, but will explode with the growing enrollment and lack of space for students to go. DCPS has known that this would be an issue for years. In five and 10 year enrollment projections produced by DCPS in 2018, the Roosevelt slash Roosevelt State Building was projected to be at 155% utilization 
by school year 23-24, based on a building capacity of 1,092, and 163% utilization by school year 28-29. Both of these projections are the highest for any building used by DC public schools. DCPS cannot wait until the issues caused by space here in the building get so bad that our enrollment at Roosevelt begins to reverse themselves. We need to solve this issue now before the school year by giving both schools their own buildings. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hecker. Um, if Virginia Mousy do not see Megan Maroney, Chairman Mendelson and fellow council members, thank you for this opportunity to comment on DC Public Schools' effort to support the health and wellness of DC students through the School Meals Program. My name is Megan Maroney and I'm a Senior Policy Associate at the Center for Science and the Public Interest, a science-based consumer advocacy organization based here in DC. CSPI urges DCPS to resume its important work on the Good Food Purchasing Program, also known as GFPP, and continue to provide healthy school meals that meet strong evidence-based nutrition standards that are based on the Dietary Guidelines for Americans at no cost to all children. CSPI is a member of the DC GFPP Coalition, along with DCPS Food Nutrition Services and my colleagues who have testified before me. As noted, the Healthy Students Amendment Act of 2018 formalized the district's intention to implement the GFPP in DCPS. The pandemic, supply chain disruptions, and labor shortages have placed unprecedented challenges on schools, and DCPS has managed to provide free meals to all students in person and through open meal sites. Understandably, implementation of GFPP has stalled. Federally, the USDA has issued a host of waivers that provide flexibilities to schools, including the flexibility to waive nutrition requirements. But while the pandemic has necessitated temporary flexibilities for schools, it has also laid bare the critical role that healthy school meals play. Given the severe economic impacts of COVID-19, and it is likely that children will qualify for free or reduced price school meals in greater numbers than before the pandemic. Although overall food insecurity levels stayed roughly the same during the pandemic, food insecurity among children increased and existing food inequities widened. Given the healthier school meals have been linked to healthier body weight outcomes for children, optimizing their nutritional quality is critical. Prior to the pandemic, one out of three children and adolescents aged two to 19 years old had overweight or obesity. According to the CDC, the monthly rate of BMI increase among children and adolescents during the pandemic approximately doubled from a pre-pandemic period. Children with pre-pandemic overweight or obesity and younger school-aged children experienced the largest increases. Over the past two years, we've lost ground on important gains in improving the nutritional quality of school foods. The GFPP criteria complements federal meal standards by focusing on purchasing healthier foods and including more whole and minimally processed ingredients. GFPP also encourages selection of healthier choices through behavioral design and environmental approaches. Through its commitment to implementing this program, its ambitious local wellness policy, and its laudable efforts to keep kids fed during the pandemic, DCPS is on track to be a national leader when it comes to school nutrition. While challenges remain, we urge DCPS to, ur to resume its work on GFPP and school nutrition. We thank you for your attention to this issue and hope to be of further service as invested members of the DC community and of the DC GFPP coalition. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Maroney. I'm going to back up a little uh, and call Jamie Barden. I, uh, she was listed on the agenda. As yeah, I'm here. So why don't you speak now? I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm not sure I wasn't let in. Uh, so I really appreciate that. Um, uh, my daughter, Nina, attends Truth Elementary School, and I'm a former advisory neighborhood commissioner of 4D04. Uh, I've always loved that Truesdale was one of those old fashioned neighborhood schools with 60% of students coming in boundary. In the morning, my daughter and I walk to school and the sidewalk is filled with other families doing the same, uh, including Jenny and her two twins that live a block away. You heard from them a little bit earlier. Uh, for three years now, I've advocated for the renovation of Truesdale Elementary School in Brightwood Park in Petworth. Uh, thank you so much, council member, uh, 
uh, Janice Lewis George for uh, advocating for that. And thank you, uh, Chairman Mendelson, as well, for coming in person a few years ago and you know visiting our and, and meeting our wonderful students and reading to them and seeing the state of our playground. We really appreciate your support in funding a new playground. Uh, we have been able to keep that open for the community as we had planned. Uh, I actually organized a group of parents that make sure to keep uh, on the weekends to keep the playground clean and in the summer as well, and also to lock it up and unlock it in the morning and the evening. And that has been an amazing gathering point at Truesdale Elementary to bring people together. Um, the whole community is thankful that the construction of a new building, which is much needed as you've heard, is slated to take place in starting in 2023. Uh, I understand, you know, there's this conversation about swing space and uh, I understand that it will be further away than many of us are able to walk, of course. Um, but this location that's currently slated at Shaw Middle School is a long round trip drive away, uh, also on bike and obviously walking is out of the question. Many of our teachers and staff also live a short way from Truesdell's current location. My daughter's teacher, for example, we see her zipping by on her bicycle trying to get in just in time, uh, you know, as we walk to school. And so uh, I'm concerned about retention issues there. Um, I know that the city has a goal of decreasing car traffic, uh, having uh, a number of, you know, school buses and a number of parents in cars uh, driving into Shaw from Petworth every day and back twice is not going to uh, make that situation uh, better. Uh, so uh, personally, the year that the actual renovation is designed to start, my daughter will be in kindergarten. I'll be reluctant uh, at that age to put her on a school bus. I'm used to literally physically handing her off to her uh, teacher. I can only imagine those pre-K three, pre-K four, how they are going to feel about it. And I do worry that in emergency or some other situation where I had to go pick her up, it's gonna take me a long time to uh, get there. Uh, the vast majority of families and parents at Truesdell students do not have the resources and the flexibility that my family does. Indeed, we've heard from a number of families that they will simply select nearby schools instead of trying to make this distant school work. So I asked the council to find funding to support a swing space that is closer by and one that has the, some amount of useful outdoor space to fulfill those requirements consistent with the playground that you very kindly supported in the past. And I see I'm over time, so I'll go ahead and stop there. I'm not able to hear you. I'm sorry, I think you're muted, uh, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Barden. And I do remember the visit and the uh, playground. Uh, next is uh, Rachel Clark. Good afternoon, Chairman, members and staff. I'm Rachel Clark. I'm the policy director at the Redstone Global Center for Prevention and Wellness at the George Washington University School of Public Health. Um, and the views expressed in my testimony today are my own and do not necessarily reflect the views of GW. The Redstone Center seeks to make the district the healthiest capital in the world by ending chronic health disparities and improving the health of all residents. We believe that we cannot achieve this objective without making climate change a central part of our public health strategy. Because climate change and health disparities often have com common drivers, we prioritize double duty policy solutions that address both, both planetary and human health, such as the promotion of sustainable food systems. This is why we support efforts to make DCPS meals more sustainable and at the same time better for student health. To promote sustainable food procurement, Redstone works as part of the DC Good Food Purchasing Coalition to improve institutional food across five value categories, as you've heard from my colleagues, known as the Good Food Purchasing Program or GFPP. In 2018, the council passed legislation that directed DCPS to conduct a baseline assessment and begin working to achieve the GFPP values. DCPS Food Nutrition Services, or FNS, has been a strong partner in pursuing these improvements and in 2019 conducted the required assessment. Unfortunately, the pandemic and continuing supply chain issues have stalled implementation of the GFPP. This is understandable as FNS has had to adapt to school closures, shifting federal requirements, food shortages, and other uncertainties. 
But the pandemic has also exposed longstanding inequities and vulnerabilities in our food system, making it more important than ever to prioritize the protection of food workers, sustainable agricultural practices, and the nutritional quality of food that we serve to our students. Today, I'd like to focus in particular on the sustainability prong of the GFPP. Food systems are an important and underappreciated driver of climate change. It's estimated that food production, transportation, and disposal are responsible for over a third of global greenhouse gas emissions. We will not achieve the emissions reduction targets in the Paris Climate Agreement unless we significantly reduce emissions from this sector. While the district is obviously not a major food producer, we can still play an important role in reducing food-related emissions by changing our food consumption. This is why we have focused our efforts on reducing GHG emissions from the district's food procurement, including at DCPS, which is the largest purchaser of meals in the district government. Sustainable food procurement at DCPS will both help the district lower its GHG emissions and benefit student health. Because the majority of food-related GHG emissions come from animal agriculture, lower emissions diets contain more plant-based foods, and these types of diets prevent and mitigate chronic diseases such as obesity and heart disease. These benefits are particularly important for low-income children who are more likely to participate in school meals programs. As the district begins to transition to the next stage of pandemic recovery, we hope that DCPS will resume its focus on sustainability and the other GFPP values to achieve these critical benefits for both climate and health. We applaud FNS's heroic efforts during the pandemic to feed its students and its willingness to engage with our coalition. And we um, at Redstone and within the coalition are standing ready to help them in the next phase of implementation. Thank you for your time and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Uh, Lauren Newman. Hi, good afternoon, council, council members and Chairman Mendelson. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak on the value of, again, the Good Food Purchasing Program as an accountability tool to assist DCPS in using its purchasing power to benefit the holistic health of students, our surrounding communities, and our planet. My name is Laura Newman, and I currently work as the Youth Entrepreneurship Cooperative Program Manager at City Blossoms a garden-based nonprofit that utilizes green spaces to inspire kids, youth, and their communities. I also serve on the executive committee for the Good Food Purchasing Program Coalition, and I'm testifying today to emphasize the importance of GFPP assessments in DC public schools. I myself am a district resident, and my family has called DC home for multiple generations. As such, I grew up attending DC public schools and I am a proud alum of School Without Walls, Go Penguins. I feel lucky to have been able to witness the great strides DCPS has made in improving the quality of food being served to students in our schools. I am especially impressed by the self-operated pilot program currently underway at eight schools. Self-operated cafeterias are no small undertaking and require dedicated staff who are who are committed to designing menus and meal programs that are optimized for their unique school community. I am confident that DCPS is committed to improving the quality of meals being served to students. However, I also want to urge DCPS to continue to implement the GFPP assessments, despite the current supply chain shortages and other complications brought on by the ongoing pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused the whole world to pivot and adapt, and DCPS is no exception. They stepped up to the plate to ensure students and their families had access to nutritious food through meal sites at schools, and I commend these efforts. But the pandemic has also highlighted and intensified the longstanding inequities and vulnerabilities in our food system. It is more important than ever that we double down on our commitment to protect workers across the food system, support sustainable agricultural practices, as well as BIPOC farmers and food businesses and feed students the high quality nourishing food that they deserve. This can all be achieved if we remain committed to meeting the five value areas championed by the GFPP. I love that in my current role at City Blossoms, I get to engage with high school students across the city and encourage them to be advocates for environmental and food justice. You're gonna have the chance to hear from three of my students today and I'm so proud of them for speaking up and applying the concepts they are learning about in our food justice and advocacy workshop series focusing on the values of the Good Food Purchasing Program. Our students are concerned about the future of the planet they are inheriting. 
They care about the well being of the animals and workers who make it possible for them to eat each and every day. They want to eat food that is both delicious and nutritious, and they understand the buying power that DCPS has and the impact it can have on our local economy. So I join them today in advocating for DCPS to remain committed to providing the very best food for students' bodies, our communities, and for the health of our planet. Thank you so much for listening to our concerns. And we want to continue to work with DCPS as a coalition partner and help DCPS become a leader and success story that other cities and institutions you, can Newman. emulate. Thank you. I don't mean to cut you off, but um, the next witness is uh, Christopher Bonner. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Terry Mendelson and uh, committee members. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I'm another Truesdale parent, uh, an FTO member and LSAT member. And rather than uh, cover ground that has already been covered today, I would like to highlight uh, in my testimony that I supplied um, two maps that can further highlight for the council uh, the, the space issue with the proposed site at Garnett Patterson. Uh, if you look at the location, the only space in that block that is not currently occupied by building is already smaller than half of what the current playground at Truesdale Elementary uh, is, meaning that it would be uh, basically impossible to fit any cars, any of the roughly 50 spots that are filled at Truesdale Elementary every day, and extremely difficult to provide for the currently split playground space that separates pre-K three and pre-K four students from the uh, older children on the playground uh, to keep a safe and, and friendly environment for both groups of students. Uh, I think this is uh, incredibly uh, uh, inoperable and, and just can't uh, functionally provide the needs for, for our students and for our teachers, as has been noted by many folks before me. So instead of taking up my full time, I would just urge you to review that and see that the, the extent to which uh, this is not uh, something my, my fellow Truesdale parents are, are saying for effect, but it just is, is a physical space issue that, that can't be overcome. Uh, and I implore the council, uh, the committee, to uh, help us to find additional opportunities and work with community to find additional locations for a swing space for Truesdale. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bonner. Leah Howe. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson and council members on the Committee of the Whole. My name is Lee Howe, and I'm the Director of School Food Initiatives for DC Greens, where we work to advance health equity in the district by building a just and resilient food system. For nearly a decade, I've advocated for policies that enable all people, especially youth in our city, to have access to healthy and culturally appropriate foods. I'm here today to commend DCPS Food and Nutrition Services on their continued COVID-19 19 response, as well as their investment in the Good Food Purchasing Program. As you know, school meals are vital. In a high poverty city, the vast majority of DCPS students rely on school meals to meet their nutritional needs. As you've heard and know, the pandemic has brought about unimaginable challenges for DCPS Food Nutrition Services in getting healthy, compliant meals out in a safe manner. And nearly two years in, national supply chain disruptions remain rampant. Despite all this, DCPS continues to innovate, adapt, and serve meals in a safe and equitable manner. I want to highlight two initiatives that we've been excited to see DCPS continue to invest in during this challenging time. First, although DCPS still largely contracts our, our food service out, they've remained committed to running a self-operated pilot program in eight schools. DCPS continues to conduct extensive training with food service staff in order to design a scratch cooked meal program that better serves DCPS students. We commend the self-op team for their tireless work to build out this model and explore the financial and nutritional benefits of transitioning our meal programs back in-house. We hope to see this pilot expanded to more DCPS schools in the coming year. 
Also, despite the upheaval that COVID has caused, DCPS has continued to facilitate opportunities for students, parents, and community members to engage with their meal programming. For example, they launched a quarterly newsletter to increase transparency and regular communications. Last spring, they kicked off an annual initiative called My Train My Way to engage high school students via a social media challenge to share their visions for vision for and feedback on school meals. And lastly, they've continued to host virtual school food collaborative meetings for community members to provide direct feedback and more deeply engage with school meal programming. Looking ahead, as you've heard loud and clear from my fellow panelists, it's critical that DCPS refocus on and invest in implementing the Good Food Purchasing Program, which is a metrics-based framework that encourages institutions to direct their buying power towards five core values. Local economies, environmental sustainability, valued workforce, animal welfare, and nutrition. Although implementing the GFPP is a requirement for DC based on the 2018 Healthy Students Amendment Act, progress on implementation, including the annual assessments, have been stalled. We hope that DCPS FNS will work to improve their GFPP score in 2022, conduct an assessment of their progress at the end of the school year, and ensure that their contracts and food service management companies are in compliance with the GFPP uh, and standards and values. And we're confident in the leadership of uh, Food Nutrition Services Director Rob Jaber to make significant progress on these fronts. He's worked tirelessly to elevate and improve DC's school food over the years, and it's been a pleasure to work with him and his team. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Howe. Uh, Hayab Stefanos. Um, good morning. My name is Hiava Stefanos, and I'm a 12th grader at Benjamin Banneker Academic High School. Today, I want to talk to you about my experience with the DCPCS meal program and how we can improve it. I also wanted to share a little about my what I've been learning in a program called Mighty Greens and how what I've learned has led me to come up with these improvements. For the past 11 years of my life, I've lived in DC and for the past four years of my life, I've been going to a DC PCS school. I'm very grateful for the DC PCS meal program because it makes sure that all the students are fed, but I, like many of my peers, have a love-hate relationship with the meal program. To start off, I like to talk about all the things that I do like. I like the fact that there are options and I like the fact that it's open for everyone. I like the fact that the food given to us is healthy. Now let me tell you about what I don't like. I don't like the repetitiveness and most importantly, I don't like that it isn't appealing. I don't want students to think that healthy nutritious food isn't appealing and that is what the DC PCS meal program is currently presenting. In Mighty Greens, we have been learning about the Good Food Purchasing Program, the GFPP. The GFPP has five core values, local economies, environmental sustainability, and animal welfare work animal welfare, workers' rights, and nutrition. While learning about these five core values, two of them stood out to me, sustainability and animal welfare. I feel that those two values go hand in hand. Sustainability is about being able to get what we want without compromising the health of the environment and animal welfare focus on factory farms, dairy farms, and any farms where animals are mistreated just so that we can benefit from lower prices and mass production. The farms also hurt us. The, the meat is, that we eat is filled with antibiotics and the farms themselves cause so much pollution. The DC PCS meal program should aim to be a good food provider. And by adhering to the five core values of the good food purchasing program, DC PCS can achieve that. We should strive to give our students healthy, good tasting food while also making sure that we're not hurting the environment, that we're giving our students the freshest food possible and also protecting the animals. To end, I would like to thank all the council members for hearing for what, what I have to say and I'm grateful for you giving for you giving me your ears. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Carlo Reed Witt. Hello. Uh, I apologize for the noise. Uh, my neighbor is putting up a fence, but you can hear me. Yes. Okay. Um, hello. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today. My name is Carla Reed Witt, and I'm a DC resident, parent of children with special education needs, and a member of the Special Education Advocacy Coalition, or SEAC. SEAC is a coalition comprised of several special education organizations as well as individual members, all dedicated to advancing the rights of special education students. 
SIAC has worked diligently to collaborate with ASI over the past several years on concerns that I will speak to speak about today. It's our hope that our testimony and our fourth our testimony today, as well as our forthcoming written testimony, will be helpful to the council as it asks important questions of ASI during the performance oversight cycle. To aid in this, SIAC has submitted a list of proposed questions for ASI that we hope the council will find helpful. Um, today, we will include more. Uh, well, we will include more detailed written testimony. But today, I'd like to address a short list of concerns that we have raised with ASI. First, SIAC and many of other stakeholders from the community attempted to participate in the public rulemaking for the long-awaited Chapter 30 uh, regulations on special education. ASI declined to rulemake on the majority of concerns raised by families and advocates. Indeed, reading through the preamble of the Chapter 30 regulations, second notice to propose rulemaking, it is clear how very few comments from the public were adopted. Second, since 2019, CIAC has been very concerned with the growing use of restraint and seclusion in the district. Restraint and conclusion practices are documented to be rarely effective and have a discriminatory impact on students of colors. While we applaud Aussie's inclusion of restraint and seclusion regulations in chapter 30, SIEC argues that the use of restraint and ex seclusion extends beyond special education students and should also be reflected in the chapter 25 regulations which pertain to the discipline of all students. Third, our coalition members have contacted Aussie about the need for a citywide comp compensatory education plan for special education students as a result of the significant, significant learning loss caused by COVID-19. In addition, we believe the extended eligibility for special education students in danger of aging out of special education services is necessary and necessary immediately. Fourth, while we applaud the council's passage of the Students' Right to Home and Hospital Instruction Act of 2020, more still needs to be done to implement this uh, instructions to get the full promise of the legislation. Finally, court involves students with disabilities desperately need a panel of special education attorneys to explain how their disabilities may impact their criminal court matter. While rights exist, um, like this exists in district family court, it does not exist uh, for adult criminal court. The Special Education Attorneys for Emerging Adult Defendants Amendment Act of 2021 would achieve this purpose. On behalf of SEAC, I hope you find this testimony helpful. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Friedrich. Uh, I don't have a copy of your statement. Could you either resubmit it or submit it? Yes, I'll make sure you get it. Thank you very much. I believe Brittany Crawford is not here. Right. Uh, and I believe Africa Battle is not here. Uh, Michael Zeldin, who's an ANC commissioner. Yep, hold on please. Sorry, I had to get off mute. Chairman Mendelson, Council Member George and others, thank you for allowing me to testify on behalf of 3G, oh, 3G, and I'm the ANC rep for 3G04. Mark Twain remarked once that it's a terrible death to be talked to death. And I fear for you guys, that may be your fate with all these testimonies. So I'm going to be brief in my presentation, recognizing that the written statement speaks for itself and that you're all learned in reading written statements. The four areas that I wanted to mention are these. One, at Lafayette Elementary School, there is persistent overcrowding. We tried to deal with that last year with the Military Road School proposal. Um, I think that the solution that we achieved finally as a citywide elementary school, uh, preschool was a good solution, but it does not still address the general need for a solution, preferably in boundary for Lafayette's overcrowding. And so we ask that the commission, the not the commission, we ask that the council work with us on the commission and with DCPS to invigorate the process by which a search for extra space for Lafayette Elementary School, which is foreseeable, um, can take place and not wait till the end and 
repeat the process like we did with military road school. Second, I'd like to mention that the DCPS and WMATA situation in our neighborhood is a mess. They have eliminated the E6 bus and are rerouting the M4, which means that students in our neighborhood have a difficult time getting to school. The bus service is irregular. Um, and as I said, the E6, which was a prominent means of transportation for so many children has been eliminated. And we think that something needs to be done. Maybe it's a micro transit system that is implemented to help our students, but as it is now, it's untenable. Third is the Addressing Dyslexia and Other Reading Dis Difficulties Amendment Act of 2020, which has now been fully funded. We have a, a history of failure to diagnose dyslexia early enough um, so that it can be intervened with in the most successful way. We're hoping that this act, this um, Addressing Dyslexia Act will help, but it's going to take the council's oversight of this on an ongoing basis to make sure that the teachers and everybody who this program will benefit um, receive the training and the implementation. And finally, DCPS and DGS, there are so many broken things in our schools. The elementary school, Lafayette Elementary School um, elevator was broken for multiple months, which meant that the child in a wheelchair couldn't get to her second floor classroom. They had to do a complete workaround. Three months to repair an elevator doesn't, doesn't seem acceptable to us. Eight months to repair a broken hammock on the playground, which was a danger, doesn't seem acceptable to us. And so we asked the council to work with DCPS and DGS to make sure the timeline on these things it's, is greatly shortened. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Berna Artis. I don't see uh, Christopher Stewart. Mr. Stewart. Yes. Uh, let's see. There we go. Hello. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson, Committee of the Whole Council Members and DC Council. My hope is that you and your families and village are safe during some of the most modern day trying times in our world. After reaching out to the Ukrainian Library Association with a love and empathy note, they replied asking for continuous prayers and thoughts of compassion as young children, women and men have been killed daily. The Ukrainian Library is working to combat cyberspace disinformation. The library is holding classes in emergency medical assistance and having turned into modern day hostels and care unit for displaced individuals. The educational route is the library and literary space that has empowered one to know that they are no longer alone. Thank you in advance for seeing the importance of school libraries being a safe, equitable, and essential part of schools and communities. We are grateful for SY 2022-2023 libraries. Uh, librarians are locked rather, full-time level one with allocations unable to be changed. Thanking each student, parent, educator, community member, and legislator for seeing the vision of a world with resources for everyone. We look forward to full-time librarian positions being locked indefinitely as every DCPS, at every DCPS school. We urge charter and independent schools to provide their, their students and educators with a school librarian as well. We want our students to be competitive and collaborative in our beautiful world marketplace. We know that SAT scores and testing is not an indicator of brilliance or intelligence or even complete knowledge, but one that captures whether a participant is skilled in taking a particular type of examination. Out of all 50 states, as well as the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands, there were only seven of those places that had an average score of less than 1,000 for 2021, and the District of Columbia was one of them. Increasing DCPS's budget to include full-time SAT prep faculty at each high school would help to level the playing field. Parents who can afford outside SAT prep for their children see significant increases and in turn significant scholarships and grants for their children. We want this for every student. Let's also add peace and social justice com competent 
um, a component rather, would change the way we as a school district not only view education, but by creating peace and social justice ambassadors for each grade level at each school, we would help to empower students to seek peaceful ways to handle conflict and disagreements with resolutions that result in communal bonding and student-centered outcomes. Peace and social justice ambassadors uh, we'll go through an incredible training that could include visiting the Legacy Museum and the National Mu Memorial for Peace and Justice. Reframing what it means to be nonviolent with our words, actions, and thoughts would be an incredible opportunity for DCPS to set a global example of how to empower the next generation to lead. I thank you so much. Have a beautiful rest of the week. Absolute peace, love, and light. Christopher Stewart. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Frazier O'Leary is the elected representative on the state board. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am testifying as the Ward Ford representative on the State Board of Education, and these opinions are my own. One thing I've learned as a teacher and a coach over for over 50 years is the importance of focus. During my three years on the State Board of Education, it has become increasingly clear to me that our education system has not been focused on taking care of the students who need the most assistance. There is no logical reason for any student in our city to have to be in a classroom that is not warm in the winter or cool in the summer. <clears throat> no student should be in a classroom that has leaks in the ceiling. No student should be in a building that is not secure because the security doors malfunction. None of us would accept this in our own home. Why is it acceptable in our schools? In Ward 4, Whittier, Truesdale, Powell, LaSalle, Bacchus, and Roosevelt still have HVAC issues. Roosevelt has had to use portable space heaters since December. We need a swing space in Northeast Ward 4 that can accommodate Truesdale, Whittier, Whittier and LaSalle Bacchus when they are finally able to be remodeled instead of sending the students and staff to Garnet Patterson Middle School at 10th and New Streets Northwest, miles away from their homes. The question that should be asked tomorrow of those who are in charge is why is this normal for our system? Why is it like pulling teeth to get those responsible sorry, who are getting paid very well to do what they are getting paid for? Why do those in leadership positions that think that a parent or a teacher or a local school administrator is just being negative when they raise real logistical problems that keep the basic needs of our students from being met? Today on the 2nd of March, you have heard and will hear about problems that began eight months ago and have not been solved. No successful business would accept this type of chronic behavior. During the pandemic, we were ironically given an opportunity to take a close look at our education system and change it for the better. I hope that you, our council, will use your voices to affect change and make it better for all who care about our students, parents, and those who work tirelessly in our school buildings. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, Nicole Howard. I must be muted. I'm sorry. Um, Jackie Carter, you're up. Uh, 
Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Uh, my name is Jackie Carter, and I am here to talk about um, increasing the budget for OST programming and for the Marion Berry Summer Youth Employment Program. I want to first talk about the power of theater and what the OST funding and the Marion Berry Summer Youth Program has allowed us to do. Julie Cohen Theobald, president of the Educational Theater Foundation stated, I think there's a perception that the arts are secondary to core subjects like, excuse me, like reading and math. But what this research would suggest is that by participating in theater, students learn creativity, communication, collaboration, and critical thinking. Many at risk students who stand to benefit the most from theater education have little to no access to theater education. While there are nearly 26,000 K-12 school-based theater programs throughout the United States, according to the U.S. Department of Education. In 2021, African-American and Latino students had less than half the access as white students to theater arts. Only 24% of high schools in high poverty areas offer theater instruction. Having said that, the district should work in close a partnership with CBO and grassroots uh, theater arts organizations like Children's Legacy Theater and organizations that provide music and art to update the strategic, the strategic plan for OST. Failure to do so will raise the risk of developing plans and strategies that are inefficient and unresponsive to the needs of the community. This strategic plan should include a strategy to fully fund OST in a way that closes the gap in demand for programming, starting with allocating an additional $2 million to the OST office for fiscal year 2023 to replace funding, um, to replace federal funds. And the same is true for the Marion Barry Summer Youth Employment Program. $2 million should be invested in the Marion Barry Summer Youth Program for fiscal year 2023. The Summer Youth Employment Program is, critical, is a critical investment in public safety and the foundational part of combating gun violence at its roots and uplifting young people and their communities. Data shows that the number one way to cut violent crimes, arrest, uh, arrest, uh, arrest among young people is a job and a $2 million investment today will have a long-term positive effect, impact on the lives of youth who apply and their communities. The council must invest an additional $2 million in the Marion Berry Summer Youth Employment Program. Since the funds have been um, divested, crime in Ward 7 and Ward 8 amongst youth has gone skyrocketed. I, I'm out of time. I have a letter that I'm from a parent that I wanted to get on record, but I guess I'll just have to um, submit that. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Ms. Carter. I do have your statement and the, uh, the letter as well. So we have that for the record. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Stephen Varho, is he here? I don't see him. Zachary Parker, who's uh, elected representative on the state board. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson. Uh, and Council Member Lewis George. I testified today as State Board of Education Ward 5 representative, uh, and my testimony represent, represents uh, my views on behalf of my community and not that of the State Board. Uh, there are three areas that I hope the Council will focus during this year's budget cycle. First, increasing at-risk funding for DC students. Uh, while there was an increase in the UPSFF this year, there was only a minimal increase in funding for at-risk students coming out of the pandemic. We must do more, not less or much more of the same for DC's most vulnerable students. Funding the at-risk weight at 0.37% is prudent and needed. Second, we must increase funding for our out-of-school time funding. Our budget should demonstrate our commitment to ensuring our young people, regardless of zip code, have access to instructional or recreational opportunities and programming needed for their success. With three school years now disrupted by the pandemic and juvenile violence on the rise across the city, much more is needed to expand educational and recreational opportunities for our young people. Third, we must get serious as a city about supporting our schools. We must focus heavily or we already focus heavily on accountability, but do so little to coach and support our schools. Do we really believe that all students can learn? Do we believe schools can thrive with the right leadership, infrastructure, and support? 
If so, then we should implement citywide school supports for all of our LEAs. More specific to Ward 5, I have several concerns. We often hear the retort that we can only move at the speed of trust. However, repeatedly, our city has broken its promises to families. Parents were promised that schools would be ready on day one. They were not, and many are still not in a good condition in Ward 5. Regularly, parents report of leaking roofs, broken HVAC systems, and inadequate equipment in DCPS schools like Burroughs and Langdon and Langley. While explanations of supply chain issues suffice for a period, uh, it is increasingly frustrating to hear reports of students learning in school buildings that are quite literally falling apart. Residents have also long been promised thoughtful school planning from the district's education agencies, as they have been promised uh, safety improvements from DDOT. Just a few months ago, yet another charter school uh, was approved by the charter board and located in Ward 5's Edgewood community. This makes five charter schools on two blocks, four of which are along a dead end alley on 8th Street Northeast. There is a clear need uh, for the charter board to consider the impact of school placements on communities before approving more applications. What's more, DDOT recently placed on hold a planned school traffic plan for this area. Your attention, council members, here is needed. And most importantly, as you all know, Ward 5's Brentwood community are, and neighbors are protesting the placement of school, uh, a school bus terminal in the heart of the community. Residents were promised a list of alternative locations that were considered by ASI and have yet to receive that information. The DC government said that it conducted an environment, environment impact study. One has never been produced. Residents were told that an internal environmental study had been conducted and that only after submitting a FOIA request would residents receive information. Notably, an environmental impact screening form dated February 4th, uh, which indicates that the bus terminal site is highly contaminated was just recently shared with residents. The city's willful neglect is set to harm Brentwood residents who are already facing the consequences of a community that is over-industrialized. In conclusion, we as a city must do more to emerge from this pandemic ready to support all of our schools and students. And there's much more that DC's education agencies must do to build trust with Ward 5 residents. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Um, I do not have a copy of your statement. Did you send it to us? Uh, I believe I did, but I can resend it to you. Would you please? Yes, I will make sure you get it. All right, I appreciate that. Um, that concludes all the uh, witnesses for this grouping. Uh, I'm gonna ask a few questions and then turn to my colleague, Council Member Lewis George. I just have a couple of questions. The first is for Mr. Heckel. The, um, how do we split Roosevelt and Stay? So, uh, Currently, the, the two buildings are in, in the same building. There's a, there's a split along the first floor where Stay generally uses the first floor, um, whereas Roosevelt uses the two wings and the second and third floor. Um, so we would just be asking that DCBS find a space that Stay would be able to utilize. It's a citywide program, so it does not necessarily have, have to be housed in Ward 4. It does not have to be housed within the, the Roosevelt building, um, that they find a space where uh, Roosevelt State can have their own building so they can do their own programming. So not necessarily in Ward 4. Yes, not correct, because it is. Buildings, this is yes, it, we just need two, two buildings on the same campus, but uh, to separate stay and have it in a separate facility. Exactly, because all the issues that are becoming more and more exacerbated are due to the two buildings the, the two schools within one building and there's no actual physical separation between the two schools. So that's why we see yeah. um, adult students commingling with minor students. Um, we've had to build uh, impermanent barriers on some of the, the first floor hallways to try to keep some of the, the students separated, but that is obviously a very um, temporary solution and there is no um, there's no barrier on the special education wing which is where most of the the student to student interaction happens um, and where our most vulnerable students are located thank you the um, other uh, issue I don't know there's so much a question but if there's a reaction several uh, witnesses including Commissioner Zeldin Mr. Parker 
uh, and um, Mr. O'Leary uh, spoke to this, and that is the problems with facility maintenance. And I'm looking actually what Mr. Um, O'Leary said, uh, no logical reason to be in a classroom that's not warm in the winter or cool in the summer, a uh, classroom that leaks and that leaks, that has leaks in the ceiling. Uh, so I've uh, been visiting schools and meeting with the DGS director. And uh, I mean, DGS needs to fix this. And um, I'm, I'm hesitating because I don't want to be too mean on, at this public hearing, but DGS is just not being responsive. They're over their head. They're not coordinated. They, um, as I pointed out to them last fall, had all of last school year to get the HVAC systems fixed. But the ones that aren't fixed now are because of supply chain issues. Well, they had all of last year to get them fixed and up to date and modernized. Uh, that's poor planning. And uh, we've, we've had excruciating meetings going through work orders with schools. And uh, the um, I met with a couple of principals uh, earlier this, actually was in February. I have to remember this is now March 2nd. Um, so it was last month. And uh, the, the, they had a complaint that the DGS doesn't tell them when they're coming out. DGS doesn't tell them what they're fixing. DGS doesn't tell them they fix something. DGS leaves without telling them. They're clueless. I shouldn't say clueless. They're unaware and because they're not informed. And then they call up DGS and say, well, you didn't fix uh, such and such. You didn't fix the window or the door or the heater or the whatever. And DGS says, oh, but we did come out and we fixed it. So then a new work order. And uh, a lot of the life of these problems as well is um, they just cycle through work orders for the same, the same issue. It, it's a, I want to be polite here. It's a complete mess at DGS. And uh, I'm looking for new ways to try to turn up the heat uh, on them. Uh, so that um, uh, so that there's some change because um, those of you who testified to this point are absolutely right that um, there's no reason there's no logical reason for students to be in facilities like that. I don't know if any of you want to respond. I will add I, one. Doug, just one thing, Chairman. Uh, sure. Roosevelt is uh, a, a new building, and the HVAC system has never worked. And the bells have never worked. And the public address system has never worked. And it's a new building. I think one of the, one of the things, because I was at Cadozo and we went through all that. But one of the things is that they, after one year, the people that have built the building are not responsible for anything that happens in that building anymore. So I know that I have a 25 year warranty on my roof of my house. And we need to have warranty, the system needs to have, look at how do they keep those people who built the building that it didn't, that doesn't work, responsible for it. Correct, assuming that the warranty was done properly, that they're doing what they need to do for maintenance to maintain the warranty, um, provided that they're also paying attention to that there is a warranty. Uh, but I'm over my time here. Let me turn to my colleague, Councilmember Lewis George. <clears throat> Councilmember, are you here? Uh, it looks like she's not. Um, several of you didn't provide a copy of your testimony. If you would, please do. That would be helpful. I want to thank each of you for your testimony. Uh, and uh, I will be relying on some of this with um, the hearing tomorrow when the agency officials are before us. So you all are excused. We're going to call the next roughly 20 witnesses. Uh, Natasha Little Romero, who's with the Under 3DC Coalition, Violetta Torino who's with Similitas Learning Center, Damaris Meja, who's with Acoris, and I'm sure I mispronounced that, Acoris Child Development Home, Rosa Pilaz, 
who's with the Diane de Julius Child Development Home. I apologize for mispronouncing. Darlene Oliver, Commissioner with AMC 5C. Nadia Gold Moritz, Executive Director of Young Women's Project. Kayla Mock, who's with UFCW 400, Local 400. Brandon White, Vice President, Capital Partners for Education. Susan Bloom, Peabody Elementary School. Iris Rejas, Arreyes, Capital Partners for Education, mentee. Uh, I have Neil Saxena, but I'm pretty sure he testified earlier. Jessica Tiemann, Capital Partners for Education, as a mentor, Patrick Sweeney with Every Library, Jeffrey Grant, CEO of Monument Academy Public Charter School, Manisa Powell with City Blossoms, Jonathan Connolly, Maria Encinas, who's a multicultural Spanish-speaking providers association, Amber Golden with the Shade PTO, Duke Ellington and Pave Parent Leader, Heather Scholl, Ruth Wattenberg, who's an elected member of the State Board of Education, Fabiana Pereira, who's assistant professor at the William J. Perry Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies, Adrian Smith, who's a parent, and Josh Boots with Empower K-12. We'll start with Natasha Riddle Romero, if she's here. Good afternoon, everyone, Chairman Mendelson and members of the Committee of the Whole. Uh, my name is Natasha Riddle Romero, and I am an organizer with Under 3 DC who works primarily with Spanish speaking home based child care providers and early childhood educators. My testimony today will focus on language access at the Division of Early Learning at Aussie, and specifically the early learning or early childhood subsidy team and the licensing and compliance team. A key goal of the birth to three law is expansion of access to affordable, high quality early education and care seats. Without addressing the systemic language access barriers at Aussie, this goal will remain out of reach. These barriers can trickle down to parents, whether Spanish speaking or not, and create a void of culturally competent childcare for families across the district. I first noticed the small number of Spanish speaking providers participating in the subsidy program soon after starting my role. Among them, even fewer are home-based providers. The reasons for this are too many to cite here, but the number one reason Spanish-speaking providers have shared that they do not participate in the subsidy program is the lack of infrastructure at Aussie to deal with non-English speakers. The licensing and compliance process can be prohibitive in itself because many aspects of the process, such as forms and documents, favor English speakers. When you add the child care subsidy pro process to the mix, including documents, training, and support, which also favor English speakers, the barriers to participation become almost insurmountable. Those who have managed to navigate the process deserve awards just for their diligence and perseverance, despite the odds. Under 3DC and its partners at the Multicultural Spanish Speaking Providers Association, MSSPA, and Many Languages One Voice, MLove, have begun to work with Aussie and the Language Access Division at OHR to translate written materials that should be available to non-English speakers. Aussie is now taking steps to make these processes more accessible, and we appreciate uh, uh, OHR's facilitations of these conversations with Aussie. Um, the Language Access Act of 2004 was supposed to compel these agencies, Aussie included, um, to provide documents, written documents, and interpretation services, which means these documents and materials should have been translated then. One home-based provider who opened her childcare business in 2013 told us she wasn't able to access forms and materials in her language nine years after the act went into effect. Most stories we, we receive of providers' struggles with language access at the DEL date back at least a decade, if not more. Keep in mind that in order to keep your license as a childcare provider, you have to fill out some of these documents annually. You basically have to be lucky enough to know someone who is willing to help, be connected to the already overwhelmed advocacy community who might be able to help, or have time to wait for Aussie to connect you to the appropriate resources, which in itself is a time consuming and overwhelming process. In order for Aussie to become more effective in providing resources in at least Spanish and Amharic, they need to be able to hire more bilingual staff at the licensing and compliance level and the subsidy level. 
They also need to ensure that the contractors they work with, such as Capital Quality and the Shared Services Business Alliance, among others, are equipped with, with, with bilingual staff. Just last week, under three OHR, MSSPA, MLOVE, and the licensing and compliance team at the DEL met to discuss the changes they were making to the licensing process in, to ensure more language accessibility. They assured us that their compliance and quality monitors are trained in what to do when they encounter a provider who does not speak English. And yet that same week, we got complaints from two Spanish speaking providers in Ward 4 who were having issues with their compliance monitors who did not accommodate their language needs. That is unacceptable. Aussie knows there is a sizable community of Spanish speaking providers, mostly home-based who require language services. They know how lengthy and complicated the subsidy licensing and compliance process are, and they know how severely DC needs more licensed childcare providers. This is why Aussie must provide LEP, limited English proficient providers with the same resources that are available for English speakers in Spanish and Amharic at least. They must also work to increase accountability for the contractors and staff people that work with LEP providers to ensure that providers encounter respect and reasonable accommodation for their language needs. My partners and I are happy to share more information with your office about this pervasive issue at Aussie and other agencies that work with early childhood education. Thank you for your time and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Romero. Uh, Violetta Chirino, I believe is not here. Just I'm contacting Violeta right now. Okay, I'm told there might be several people who need to I'm, I'm here. be admitted. Uh, you'll be followed by Damaris Meja and then Rosa Pelez. I want to speak, please. Hello. Yes, please proceed. Yes, good afternoon. Um, Chairman um, Mandelson and members of the committee as of whole. My name is Violeta Chirino, and I'm the director and co-owner of Semillitas Early Learning Center in Ward 1. I'm here today to provide a um, testimony also as a member of the board of directors of the Multicultural Spanish Speaker uh, Providers Association. Um, and there is as piece of the DC Early Learning Collaborative. The leadership of the members of the association thanks the council for its leadership in passing legislation and resulted in funding increase, you know, in, to increase salaries, benefits of early educators and provided equal pay for equal credentials. Uh, further, we thank, you know, the establishing of the DC Early Educator Compensation Task Force and as for accepting the recommendations for their um, January 15, 2022 report. Um, I thank you for this opportunity to provide a testimony during this OC performance hearing. And I want to uh, express to you two concerns and, and give you um, two um, recommendations. One is, you know, we want to increase the um, the workforce in early childhood education. We know uh, there is a shortage, and the one thing that uh, we need to do, you know, is to increase the number of CDA students who obtain their credentials, you know, in order to do that, because that creates the pipeline for the early childhood educators. There is no doubt that the biggest challenge to obtain the CDA credential for students is to accomplish, you know, their 480 hours practicum that they need to do, you know, without getting compensated. This is a, I, you know, this is a, a nationwide requirement, but it's very difficult for this uh, ladies who you know have families and they cannot afford to do this you know to go work as a volunteers for three months full time i think that if oc was to put a an scholarship in place in order for these ladies to do you know this transition it will help 
you know, increase the number of early childhood uh, educators, you know, accredited to do this work uh, because they find themselves having to decide whether to put food on the table and go and do some work, um, you know, the practicum. Uh, and so they postpone it. And sometimes it takes longer than they expected. The other thing, the other concern that I want to express is for early childhood um, centers, small centers in homes, they are expressing concerns that they might not be able to survive, you know, uh, moving forward. And so one of the concerns that we want is that when opportun financial opportunities are open for uh, these, you know, early childhood businesses is to give more time for smaller uh, centers. Uh, Torino, you're over your time. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, sure, I appreciate you. your time. But basically what I was trying to do is just to make sure that it, it, OC is inclusive. Yes, we have your statement. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Damaris May uh, is, I'm told, is in the waiting room, but she's not responding. So I'm going to keep moving. Uh, Rosa Pilaz, I believe, is not here. Darlene Oliver, I believe, is not here. Nadia Gold Moritz. Yes, I'm here. Hello, Chair Mendelson. Yes. Please begin. Okay. Hello, Chair Mendelson. And uh, Council Member Lewis George, thank you so much for this opportunity to testify. I'm Nadia Goldmaritz. I'm the Executive Director of the Young Women's Project. I also have two kids in the DCPS high schools and I'm a Ward 4 resident. Um, young Women's Project builds the leadership and power of young people. Our young leaders work on three levels as advocates, and you'll see some of them today. They're the last ones to testify, but they also work as um, system builders. So we not only advocate, but we also mobilize our peers and then um, work in the field in order to implement solutions. So two areas we're doing that right now are sexual health and mental health. My testimony today focuses on mental health. We launched our mental health work three years ago um, the mental health campaign in order to increase access to providers, to health education, and also services for young people. Um, we did a lot of work last year in terms of testimony, research, and this year we are launching virtual wellness centers in 16 schools at the end of March in order to connect young people to providers and increase their access to educational materials. We'll hear more about that later on today. Um, from our vantage point in the field, what we've seen is that our system is not keeping up with the crisis in mental health of adolescents, which of course has been declared by everybody at this point. But by, by our calculations, you know, half of our young people are considered at risk. We have 40% of our young people in high schools that are sad and depressed. We have 25% who are suicidal and we need more intensive services. Um, our systems, everyone's doing their best. We have many dedicated individuals on the DCPS end, you know, counselors and teachers are going overboard to create space. Also the DBH uh, clinician pipeline is making progress, um, but we still are only meeting the need of a small fraction of young people who need services. We have several reg recommendations to address this gap. One is to create a third tier of mental wealth, mental wealth, mental health services um, that's focused on wellness, but is really skills building to um, help young people develop resilience building skills and capacities that they need in order to address mental health on their own. We also recommend some. I would say more data collection, but we have virtually no data. So data collection um, is desperately needed and so is assessment. So those are our three recommendations and um, you will hear from our young people later on in the hearing. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And I do have your statement. Um, Kayla Mock. 
Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson and members of the committee who are present here today in the council. Um, my name is Kayla Mock. I'm with the United Food and Commercial Workers Union Local 400, and I appreciate the opportunity to share my testimony on behalf of our 2,000 members in Washington, D.C., working on the front lines of the ongoing pandemic in grocery, retail, food distribution, and healthcare. Um, additionally, UFCW represents hundreds of thousands of food processing and manufacturing workers across the country for the purposes of collective bargaining. Um, and through collective bargaining, our members are able to raise uh, workplace standards of wages, benefits, safety, and retirement for all workers. Um, I'm here today to testify in support of resuming the Good Food Purchasing Program with the DC Public School System. I wanna take a moment and commend the DCPS for the heavy lift of providing healthy meals to students, um, particularly during these unprecedented times. UFCW is a member of the Good Food Purchasing Program Coalition, a coalition which aims to transform the way public institutions purchase food by creating a transparent and equitable food system based on five core values, valued workforce, local economy, its health, animal welfare, and sustainability. Um, I want to lift up the testimony of my coalition, uh, my GFPP coalition members who went before me, um, and then I will be speaking today on valued workforce. Unfortunately, too many workers in food processing and distribution do not have the opportunity to collectively bargain on their working conditions. Workers in these industries are often taken advantage of by their employers and subject to low wages, unfair treatment, and unsafe and unworkplace situations. Uh, workers, particularly in meat processing, are often in stressful, unsafe working conditions with ever-increasing line speeds and hazardous um, equipment. It is imperative that the city of DC use its purchasing power to support employers who respect workers' rights to freedom of association, to organize a union and to bargain collectively for fair wages and working conditions free from reprisal. Um, you know, contributing to health is more than just nutrition provided by food. Healthy students also means creating healthy environments for students to thrive in. Sustainable middle-class jobs create strong, thriving communities, and these are created when workers can collectively bargain over their working conditions. The millions of dollars that the District of Columbia public school system spends can not only contribute to healthy habits, but it can also encourage companies to treat their employees with value and create sustainable jobs, leading to prosperous cities and schools. The good work of the GFPP and its mission alongside the DCPS will create impactful and reasonable ways to advance these priorities and build sustainable environments and communities for students to thrive in. We're hopeful that this will continue for the health and sustainability of DC students, workers, communities, and beyond. Thank you for your time on this matter. Uh, thank you, Ms. Mock. Uh, I believe Brandon White is not here. Uh, I believe Damaris Meja from uh, Corey's Child Development Home is here, if she could testify. Ms. Meja, I apologize for mispronouncing your name. Damaris Meja or Mejia. We were not able to uh, secure interpretation for her. So unfortunately she will not be testifying. Okay, we do have her statement. Thank you. Um, Susan Bloom. Hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for letting me testify. This works out perfectly. I teach in about 10 minutes, so we're gonna fit this in. Um, <clears throat> so um, dear um, chair, council chair, I'm honored to submit this testimony to you regarding the absolute necessity of annual funding for at least one fully certified librarian in each DC public school every year. The reasons for this are many, and I know the council has been supportive, but we want to ensure that this um, is put in place for years to come. Research has shown that students with access to a fully functioning library media program run by a certified media library specialist achieve higher test results. Students learn to read better by reading more, and librarians are devoted to inspiring every student in a school to become an avid and lifelong reader, especially at a time when we are all working to make up 
for the learning loss endured during the pandemic, we need to support students with consistent library and staffing. In recent years, more schools in lower income wards of our city have been without a full-time certified librarian and this inequity must not continue. School librarians serve every student in the school and work hard to build rapport with students and learn their interests and passions and support both their recreational reading and their academic reading needs. Building those relationships takes time and effort and high turnover of the librarian position in a school due to the lack of consistent funding and support for that position creates havoc for the students and the staff. I have heard council member Allen himself lament the fact that his own student school librarian left for another school when she heard that her position would not be funded for the next academic year. She knew both of his students well, she knew their literature passions and they were devastated by the staff change. To recruit and retain the best and most talented librarians to DC public schools, we need a funding structure that guarantees a certified librarian in every school every year. Without this guarantee, highly qualified and talented librarians will choose school districts that value their critical role in schools and that provide ongoing funding for their positions. Given the ever-changing world of digital and print information available to students and staff, fully certified librarians provide critical guidance to both educators and learners in navigating the best resources, such as databases, educational apps, and reliable websites. I would like to wrap up by sharing my own personal DCPS librarian story to show how <clears throat> many of us librarians serve our entire school communities in ways that go beyond the traditional scope of library work. In my case, I chair both our literacy committee and our school wellness committee. I am a co-facilitator of our staff and caregiver kindred race and equity discussion group, a member of my school's equity team that is preparing to infuse <clears throat> an anti-bias curriculum into our educational program starting next year. I secured a $20,000 grant that brought the well-known Garden to Table Food Prints program to our school over 10 years ago and have led several efforts to improve our outdoor play spaces and ensure a robust recycling and composting program here at Peabody Elementary School. I have librarian colleagues in DCBS who bring barbers to the library to offer free haircut services to students with limited resources and then lure them to um, the books and reading opportunities. And librarians who create spaces in their libraries for students to meditate, connect, or unwind from the stresses of school and life. The list of what librarians offer to their school communities is endless. These are just a few examples. So in closing, I implore all of the council members to support legislation that mandates a certified school librarian in every DCPS school every year. We owe this to our students in every ward of the city. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Bloom. Uh, Brandon White. Yes, thank you, Chairman Mendelson. Good afternoon to you and to the other members of the council. My name is Brandon White. I'm the Vice President of Capital Partners for Education. Since 1993, Capital Partners for Education has provided one-to-one -one mentoring and college and career success programming to low-income students in the Washington, D.C. area. We currently support nearly 400 students in 10 DC high schools and are actively recruiting 100 additional students for our program today. Our mission is to support students in the academic middle through high school and college so that they can graduate with these skills and experiences needed to thrive in sustainable careers. Today, I am proud to be joined by Iris Reyes, a CP mentee and now a student at George Washington University. And I'm also happy to be joined by Iris's mentor, Jessica Tiemann, who you'll hear from momentarily. Students in schools in the district are actively working to recover from the disrupted learning and social disconnection resulting from the pandemic. Far fewer students in the district are on track to attend college than this time last year. Fortunately, we have the tools and strategies to build back our students' futures. Evidence-based research proven mentoring and a system of academic and administrative supports like those that we offer at Capital Partners for Education are uniquely positioned to aid our students today and over the long term. Mentoring provides the stability and guidance for youth as they manage their adolescence and now the unparalleled challenges resulting from COVID-19. Students, especially those who are on the cusp of college eligibility, need the social emotional scaffolding that mentors provide to support their journey back to college readiness and to future success. Since the COVID-19 pandemic began, college enrollments have fallen and the shrinking number of federal financial aid applications makes clear that it's those most liable to benefit from higher education that are now missing out. 
Support from a mentor provides students with the structured support they need to not miss key milestones and with the social emotional support that they need to persevere in light of whatever obstacles come their way. The record on mentoring is clear, it works. Low income first generation students are 55% more likely to enroll in college and 130% more likely to hold leadership positions if they have a mentor. CPE has a proven track record of success. Fully 58% of our students had graduated from college compared to 21% of their similarly situated peers. The majority of CPE students resides in wards five, seven, and eight, the neighborhoods with some of the highest poverty levels, lowest college attainment rates in DC, and the highest COVID-19 transmission rates. These are the schools and communities that need our support now more than ever. Thanks to leadership from the mayor and from you, Mr. Chairman, the district created the College Rising Grant to support to and through college mentoring for students in DC public and public charter schools. CP is proud to be a College Rising grantee with the hope to serve 175 students. We applaud the work of Dr. Antoinette Mitchell and her team at Aussie's Division of Post-Secondary and Career Education as they administer the College Rising Grant and work to improve college and career outcomes for the district's young people. At the same time, in order to fully recover from the educational and social emotional impact of the pandemic, even more students would benefit from the personal connection, customized support, and one-on-one -on -one attention that mentoring can provide. So we urge the council to continue to make mentoring a priority in the recovery from COVID-19 and beyond by increasing funding for it in the upcoming fiscal year budget. Thank you for your leadership and the service of our students and of our schools. Thank you, Mr. White. I believe Iris Reyes is not here. Jessica Tiemann. Hi, this is Jessica. I, Iris is in the, in the chat, but hasn't been made a presenter yet, but I can provide my statement first. Please do. Uh, my name is Jessica, and I proudly serve as a mentor with Capital Partners for Education. I've been involved with CPE since 2018, and I am a Ward 6 resident. I moved to D.C. in 2015 and began, began working for the federal government. I am a first-generation college student, and as an undergraduate student, I serve as a peer mentor and I enjoyed sharing my lessons learned with first year college students. It has been an honor to share my experiences with my CPE mentee, Iris. We were perfectly matched. Uh, we're, we're both introverts, so we really understand each other. Iris is also very emotionally mature and I've witnessed them develop more confidence in both their academics and in themselves. It's been, I've been very grateful to know someone 12 years younger than me and I've had the opportunity to hear a different perspective on things such as our political climate in our country. And it gives me a lot more hope than my own peer group does. Iris is very active in CPE. We attended college fairs and college tours. I discussed their financial packages and the student loan process with them. And as a first year, as a first generation college student, I also knew how important it is to have someone provide that insight. I've also seen the toll that the pandemic has had on Iris and their academic achievement. Iris has had a hard time adjusting to virtual learning and their grades did decline um, in, their, in their first year college experience. But this demonstrated how important it was for them to have someone like me keep them focused. Iris is now in, in their second semester as a first year college student at George Washington University, majoring in public health and plans to work for a community health services organization. CPE has helped my mentee with out-of-pocket expenses while in college, and that has made a very significant difference in their life. CPE is also a very invaluable resource for me. Uh, we have a very dedicated case manager at CPE who I'm able to consult with about my mentor-mentee relationship. And when Iris faces challenges that I don't know how to solve, CPE shares resources with me so that I'm able to better support them. Mentorship programs provide students with the support they need, even when they don't know they need it. And I strongly urge the DC Council to allocate additional resources to promote mentoring for high school students and college students in the academic medal, because it is incredibly invaluable to our DC community. Iris was absolutely years ahead of anybody who wouldn't have had this experience, and they were introduced to new opportunities that they would not have known existed. Iris has shared that they would love to become a mentor after graduating from college and an investment in mentoring programs will positively impact future generations by creating new networks of mentors for years to come. I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today and to share my story. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tien. Uh, let me see if Iris is, yes, she is here. If you would uh, testify. Good afternoon. Oh. 
Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson and members of the committee. My name is Iris Reyes. I am a student at the College Progress Capital Partners for Education. I am a Ward 5 resident and went to McKinley Technology High School. Currently, I am in my freshman year of college at George Washington University, majoring in public health, and I ultimately want to research adolescent mental health. If I didn't have a mentor, I would not be where I'm at today. I would not be in college without her support. She helped me with the college application process, encouraged me, and gave me the confidence to apply to college I wouldn't have considered. CP also helped me prepare for college through campus tours, financial aid workshops, and career exploration events. The college tours showed me what college life would be like. COVID-19 began my junior year of high school, requiring me to learn virtually for the rest of my college, high school, career. Having my mentor throughout this time is essential to maintaining my academic success. It would have been difficult for me to stay motivated with her encouragement and consistent communication. I am a hands-on person and I struggle with having to sit for long hours or few breaks. I was always open and honest with my mentor during this time. We had already established this as a part of our relationship. Just because not only my mentor, I see her as a close friend who I can trust. Even my family trusts her. CP helped me by providing virtual opportunities for community building. The transition to college has been an adjustment, but Jessica made sure I was prepared. CP also provided financial support for my out-of-pocket expenses through the emergency fund request program. Before joining CP, I was unmotivated. I procrastinated on my schoolwork and projects. Thanks to CP and my mentor, I became more focused and an engaged student. I strongly recommend that the DC Council allocates funding to support mentoring for low-income students in the academic middle. A mentor can offer additional support with the college process. The DC graduation rate has increased since I was in high school, but it is still below the national rate of 86%. If we want to see progress, having a mentorship programs allows students to have an additional resource and a friend who can help them. A mentor will also help them, by, help them apply to college and find work experiences their high school community may not have access to. I sincerely thank the DC Council for the opportunity to testify today and share my story. Thank you, Ms. Reyes. Patrick Sweeney. Thank you, Chairman Mendelson and honorable members of council. Um, thank you for inviting testimony to the committee. Um, the Every Library Institute that I'm representing today is a national public policy organization focused on libraries. Our network includes school librarians and library supporters, uh, particularly those in the District of Columbia. I um, mean, we're focused on securing funding to support the work of school librarians. We're so grateful that the council has provided funding this academic year to hire and retain a school librarian in every school. And we appreciate the leadership of council member Allen and council member Lewis George in particular. Uh, today, we'd like to offer our perspective on three key issues affecting school librarians uh, and their ability to support positive student outcomes across DCPS. Um, one issue, of course, is the instability that comes from uncertain budgets. While we appreciate the council for utilizing annual discretionary budgets to hire school librarians, it's very difficult to attract interested and qualified candidates for positions without stable funding. Um, a permanent solution through the Students' Right to Read Amendment would stabilize funding, lead to faster hiring, um, and better outcomes for students. The, the second issue is to ask for your oversight concerning the hiring process. Uh, we're in frequent contact with the school librarian stakeholders and other librarians around the District of Columbia. A number of shared stories with us about positions that are open and advertised, but no interviews are being conducted by the hiring manager. And it's our understanding that central, the central office is doing a good job of filling the candidate pool. Um, but a real, one real concern we have about the pace of hiring is that each school needs a professional librarian to maintain the currency and relevance of the collection. So for this program to succeed and for the hope of council to be fulfilled, it's critically important to hire in a timely way. Finally, every school librarian needs a sufficient materials budget to support an effective program. We know that DCPS school libraries collection development standards call for a ratio of 20 items for every student and that the average age of the collection should be about 10 years. Um, we've seen an ongoing need to replace materials sent home during the depths of COVID from around the country from school librarians. And for students to succeed, proper collection development budgets are necessary um, if funding is allocated, not spent, even for stalled hider, it would be a wasted opportunity to maintain the relevance and recency of school library uh, collections. Um, also attached to our testimony is a, is a research paper um, entitled, Could School Librarians Be the Secret to Increasing Liter Literacy Scores? In which we found that access to librarians and gain led to gains in literacy-based component of standardized tests. Um, in a survey of other 
uh, DCPS librarians, a majority said the unique support they provide to students through book clubs, author visits, reading challenges, and access to books have all contributed to the literacy gains their schools have seen. Um, again, this report is, is submitted along with this testimony. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. We do have that attachment. Thank you for that. Jeffrey Grant. Good afternoon, Chairman Middleson and other members of the council. I am Dr. Jeffrey Grant, the CEO, head of school at Monument Academy Public Charter School. I am here to share how we have been addressing the additional academic, social, emotional, and mental health challenges that have been thrust upon us by this once in a lifetime health crisis. I stress additional due to the fact that Monument's community of learners and their families have been navigating a discriminatory pandemic that was present before the coronavirus hit two years ago. It is a fact that our nation and city have not historically distributed resources equitably. Fortunately, the more compassionate and humane souls have prevailed as time has passed. Being the only residential public middle school in Washington, DC, our efforts have been centered on healing the many folks who have been negatively impacted by societal ills. The current pandemic magnified the need for schools like Monument, which has the capacity to house and educate 135 preteens and new teens, while simultaneously implementing wraparound services to address the, the traumas these babies endure. Through no fault of their own, many of our Monument scholars have faced issues from which many adults in this hearing could not recover. The sad part is that there are too many other scholars in our urban schools who require the healing space we provide but are unable to access because of financial constraints. We must continue to invest in saving lives by maintaining these academic and mental healing zones, which are also called schools. Monument recognized the need for additional time with our scholars and has implemented a longer academic calendar that includes 190 mandatory academic days divided into three trimesters. In addition, there are 10 additional academic days that are optional and 15 additional days that are also optional. Greater than 50% of our scholars participated in the first round of optional engagement camp days that were offered in November of 2021. This additional time on task for our scholars allows our parents and guardians to work more hours, attend school or job training, and complete tasks that will improve their lots in life. Monument Academy Public Charter School needs the governing bodies to recognize the need for sufficient funding that will prevent my scholars and their families from sleeping in shelters or their vehicles should they be fortunate enough to own one. Be mindful of parents' concerns if they request a short break in boarding as we address close contacts and quarantining. Please do not hold back funding as we all continue to learn to manage our fears and concerns. Also, please be compassionate and understanding that we are still in the middle of a health crisis that is resulting in the loss of lives for an inordinate uh, number of black and brown people. All is not equal with access to health care, academic resources, healthy foods, and affordable safe housing. Monument Academy needs to be fully funded to ensure the nation's capital never again contributes to the discriminatory practices that are rampant in other communities. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Grant. Uh, I'm a little confused. Um, we didn't, the council didn't cut the budget this year, didn't? So here's what we ran into, uh, Chairman. I'm so glad you asked that question. Thank you for catching that. We opened, we're a residential school. We uh, had a targeted enrollment of 115. On count day, we had 111. Now, mind you, in the middle of a pandemic, we still had some kids who had to quarantine because of family contact. We had some illnesses. We had some mental trauma. So on count day, when, when they came to visit October 25th, uh, they counted 84 students. I then had to go back and get them to see that just because they weren't there that night does not mean, and they came in the evening to see if they were boarding, um, does not mean that they have not uh, resided there and, and lived in the building and taken advantage of the beds. Um, so after conversations with Dr. Christina Grant and others in her uh, in, under her department, uh, we were able to add an additional 14. But that 14 that we did not get credit, 13 to 14, that accounted for close to $600,000. Yeah. 
Now, mind you, the kids come came in. We were dealing with a pandemic and kids would have to go quarantine, close contact. We had to keep everybody safe. So again, we could not just bring everybody in. If you had a close contact, we had to send home. Again, this is a residential. We had kids in uh, shelters. So again, that hit us. That hit, our, that hit our pockets. But the kids are back in. As the pandemic and, and healthcare and the situation have improved, the kids are back in in the beds. But the money was not given to us. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, and I'm sorry about that. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to continue. Manissa Powell, City Blossoms. I don't know that she's here. I'm know. here. Please, um, hello, um, I am Manissa Powell. Um, I'm 17 years old and currently reside in Ward 4. I'm in the 12th grade and attend Benjamin Banneker Academic High School, and I've worked with City Blossoms since 2018 and have been a Mighty Greens member since 2020. In Mighty Greens, I learned about food justice and what I can do to improve DC's local food system. And I'm here to testify to help improve the school environment for my peers. Recognizing the root of the problem can help stop the solutions. DCPS's meal program helps to provide free and reduced price meals to students from low income families. It ensures that all students have an option to eat for breakfast, lunch, and even supper. Eating breakfast is an important part of the day, and I don't have time to make breakfast at home, so I end up going straight to school. Breakfast at my school looks like extremely cold muffins, cereal, cold 2%, and fruit. Sometimes there are other options like sausage, French toast sticks, and eggs, but to me, the safest option are the muffins and an orange. The rest of the breakfast options don't look that appetizing to me. Um, if there is a way to access the information for where our food comes from, I feel more safe trying other options. Uh, for lunch, most of the time I bring my own food from home to eat. And there was one occasion when I left uh, my lunch at home and I had to eat school lunch and it was just a burger and fries. And the other option was a vegan one, which was pretty limited because it was just a salad. And I ended up just eating the fries because I typically don't eat beef. In Mighty Greens, we learned about the Good Food Purchasing Program. The Good Food Purchasing Program helps public institutions purchase food based on the four core values, local economy, sustainability, fair labor, animal welfare, and nutrition. And of those five values, nutrition and sustainability, sustainability resonate with me the most. Uh, students are in school for most of the day, so the amount of nutrients they receive is really important in order to be awake and attentive during the school day. Sustainability is an important key factor in creating a beneficial food system for every party involved. Assuring that farmers, animals, and us are being provided with the safest and best care is of great importance. Resuming the assessment of the Good Food Purchasing Program will help improve the quality of food in our schools, and it would also help DCPS um, Mill Program to be a good food provider. Uh, the DCPS Mill Program should strive to be to have the best quality of food in order to have the best students. Thank you for allowing me to testify. I hope you take this into consideration. Uh, thank you, Ms. Powell. It would help to have a copy of your statement if you'd provide that. Uh, Jonathan Connolly. Yes, hi. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson and Councilwoman George and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to share my concerns regarding the upcoming modernization project for the Truesdale Education Campus. I'm not gonna say anything that you haven't already heard today, but I do wanna add my voice to the chorus of those with concerns about this initiative. I'm a 15 year resident of Washington, DC, who recently moved with my wife and daughter to Brightwood Park. We love our neighborhood, we love our neighbors, and we love the community that has welcomed us with open arms. Each morning, we walk with our daughter to her daycare nearby. And on that walk, we walk directly by Truesdale Education Campus. We speak fondly of the coming years where we can walk our daughter to school every morning while interacting with our neighbors and further strengthening our bonds within this community. We were eager to hear of the scheduled modernization project for the Truesdale Education Campus, but that excitement was quickly tempered upon learning that the proposed swing space is approximately three miles away in a far busier and more densely populated area of the district. I understand that this is a temporary measure, but this plan is going to make life a lot more difficult for many families in our community. There are concerning logistical and safety issues raised by the proposed plans. Commute times to and from the proposed space would increase significantly. There's the great unknown of pickup, drop off, and the parking situation at an already bizarre and notoriously difficult intersection. 
The proposed swing space is located far away from large portions of Ward 4, but also from the downtown office area. So if there's ever an emergency, the pickup scenario would be far more difficult to handle than it would be with a Ward 4 based emergency swing space. Of greater concern to me is the idea of putting my three year old on a school bus. Children at that age need to be secured in a proper, properly fitted car seat when riding in any form of automobile. I have serious doubts about how realistic it is to secure every child properly on a bus in a, in a safety seat twice a day. In my limited time as a parent, I've learned that children thrive on routines. Being able to see the same people day in and day out and stick to a schedule day in and day out is vital to a child's sense of community and belonging. The proposed swing space plan smashes that routine in stunning fashion. I am hopeful that the relevant parties will advocate for a Ward 4 based location for the Truesdale swing space with all these considerations in mind. Thank you for your time and your support in this matter. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Mar Maria Encinas. Hi. Good afternoon, um, Chairman Mendelssohn and members of the committee. My name is uh, Maria Cristina Encinas, and I'm the board president of the Multicultural Spanish Speaking Providers Association. I've been here before, and I'm here to provide my testimony as a member of the DC Early Childhood Advocacy Association Coalition under the auspices of the DC Early Learning Collaborative. I want to share very exciting data for our organization, which is a grassroots organization that now has over 400 immigrant women of color as members, 61 of whom are residents of the District of Columbia, 60 uh, uh, working in 60 licensed centers, uh, taking care of children um, zero to three um, in public, private, and home-based programs. 86 of, uh, percent are classroom teachers working with children under three and 40, um, they're, 40 years and younger, most of them, average age, and 72% um, had been working in early childhood education for more than three years. And the most exciting data is that 125 of them have been able to start the um, associate degree um, in Spanish um, and UDC since 19, in 2019. So we're very excited about that. We're very grateful that um, Sara Mead, as, uh, under her leadership, we have been able to have quarterly meetings that are being translated with her. And also we have um, our bi-weekly meeting translator for constituency who work in licensed daycare centers. Um, thank you very much for establishing also the task four, which I'm a part of it um, and very um, gratefully um, um, committed to that work. And um, hopefully our constituency can be prepared to then be recognized for the great effort they put into early childhood education. Um, I do not wanna repeat what um, uh, Natasha said about language access for our uh, members, but I do want to make sure that with these numbers and the large numbers of women of color who are English limited profession are working in, the, in this area, they, uh, we need to have more bilingual and not just Spanish, but also I'm um, um, hired by Aussie people who can really work and understand the culture and um, so they can make them more welcoming and really, really work towards the high quality since we have so many of us working, uh, taking care of children in the District of Columbia. Another issue that I want to raise um, is the um, um, testing for this, uh, um, the standardized testing being a way for this year since so many new teachers are now in the process and also for providing more funding for centers who need um, to obtain that high quality under the uh, quality um, uh, assignment. So thank you very much for your time. I don't want to be timely, but you know, we really need to improve the quality of the standards and provide our diverse population um, the, um, meet, meeting the needs of um, and recognizing the work that they do for the city. Thank you very much. And I'll be here for any questions that you might have. 
Thank you, Ms. Encinas. Um, Amber Golden. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I am PTO president at Duke Ellington School of the Arts, LSAT member, a PAVE parent leader, Ward 4 native, and a proud DCPS graduate. I have a recent 2021 graduate from the Visual Arts Department and a current sophomore in instrumental music at Ellington School of the Arts. I'd like to first thank the council for the Budget Support Act directing DCPS to negotiate with Duke Ellington School of the Arts and to develop an updated budget and governance agreement with the objective of sustainability for the school to be implemented this funding cycle. We are also thankful for the one-time financial grant that allowed many of our teachers to receive an appropriate increase in pay during the period of negotiations. I'm here to express my concern about the delayed progress and inconsistent messaging from DCPS. We were outraged to hear from an NBC4 news report that Chancellor Fairby expressed, quote, plans to assume full operation of Duke Ellington School of the Arts and work with the school to create a plan for a smooth transition, end quote. This is an ongoing negotiation. DCPS has yet to respond to the critical questions presented by the DSAT board. Therefore, no agreements have, have been or can be made. Specifically, DCPS has not provided concrete information on their commitment to maintaining the integrity of our arts program, a clear pathway forward for our core and arts academic teachers and teaching artists to return to being uh, full DCPS employees, and the continuing role of DCEP in the guidance and core, the guiding, core, guiding the core mission of the school, selecting the school principal, and facilitating high quality partnerships which are critical to our pre-professional programs. As PTO president, I have a de facto seat on the DSAP board. I feel that it is also important to note that DCPS, per the existing operations agreements, has, had it, has a permanent seat on the DSAP board for more than 20 years now. In the five years that I've been a part of the Ellington family and the two years specifically that I've served on the board, no representative from DCPS has ever attended to support or even understand the unique operations of our school. This is particularly important to note because one, DCPS has only indicated an interest in conducting, quote, a review of DISA arts courses to benchmark content, pacing, student expectations, and additional planning considerations. This review will inform the plan for DISA art courses in the future. And two, our current programming successfully graduates 98 to 99% of students annually, while the citywide graduation rate is 65%. As you know, we serve students from all eight wards of the city and have no academic prerequisites for admission to the school. On Monday, I reached out to Chancellor Fairby expressing our frustration as parents and requesting his attendance at tonight's PTO meeting or a meeting set at his convenience to explain his plans and intentions to Ellington parents and guardians. I have yet to receive a response. Therefore, I'm requesting additional support from the council to move the negotiations forward and suggesting that a third party, such as one or more representatives from our council member Brooke Pinto's office, uh, attend the next set of meetings as an impartial, as impartial observers to get a better understanding of the negotiation process and the lack of tra transparency and good faith under which DCPS seems to be operating. As a paved ward for parent leader, I understand firsthand the importance of out of school time programming and in school mental health support. I stand with my fellow paved parent leaders a request to strengthen support, needs assessment, quality outcome and impact data, and accountability in these areas for all students. Uh, DCPS partners with QX to rethink DCPS high schools and hopefully all schools. I can't help but suggest how Ellington could serve as a model for restructuring our school day, addressing out of school time needs with the help of community partners and providing high quality culturally relevant curriculum to enhance the educational trajectory of the city students. Thank you, and I am happy to address any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Golden. Uh, and I don't have a copy of your statement. Can you provide that, please? Yes, I've, I've emailed it. I just uh, emailed it recently, so you should have it in the email queue. Okay, thank you. Heather Stoll. Heather Scholl. Hi, uh, there we go. Please proceed. Thank you. Um, I am Heather Scholl. I'm PTO president at Eastern. My kids have gone all through Eastern's feeder pattern from Maureen to Elliot Hine. And of course now at Eastern, uh, one graduated in 2020 and the other one's graduating this year. So, um, 
I have been testifying for a long time. Um, Chairman Mend Mendelssohn, you and I have had several conversations. Um, and I think most of my testimonies all come down to the same thing, which is do the right thing. And I, I, I'm not saying that the, the council doesn't do the right thing at all. I, I think in this case, I wonder if the council knows the depth and breadth of the trauma and the, the, um, the, the challenges mentally of our kids in schools these days. Um, I think across the, across the districts, um, whether it's Anacostia, High, um, Eastern, WIS, um, kids are cutting, they're having eating disorders and everything that was before the pandemic is just intensified, magnified um, and exacerbated. Um, the difference is that access to care and not everyone has that same access. Um, so I've been at Eastern now for going on, this is my sixth year there. Mr. Brown, the um, principal has only ever asked me for one thing and that was sympathy cards and stamps so he can send um, cards to his staff who had lost somebody to COVID. Um, and I think that we have to face this trauma and the, the depth of it and how it manifests in other ways. Um, kids may not have a stable um, housing environment. They may not know where food is coming from. And now on top of all that, they have to deal with trauma. So I implore you to please right size mental health supports in schools give kids access, and not only kids, but also staff, access to mental health supports when they need it. Um, I think there are supports in place, but there are just an overwhelming number of people who need it, that they're not getting it in time. And um, if you check my testimony, you'll see um, a story about a restaurant owner who um, had multiple restaurants he ended up or, um, hiring a therapist for all of his employees and it's made a, a great big difference. So I hope that you um, can see a path forward to do that in schools. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Scholl. Uh, Ruth Wattenberg. Um, thank you, whoops, wait a minute. you for a split second there okay i know last time i never got it on so i'm trying hard okay thank you council members my name is ruth wattenberg i am and speak as ward three's member of the state board of education in january after over two years of research and public engagement the state board of education unanimously asked aussie to replace the much criticized five-star school rating system with an interactive family friendly friendly dashboard that would provide families, school communities, advocates, and policymakers the data they need to review schools, improve them, and target support to them. I'm gonna to focus today on that proposal before quickly noting urgent issues raised here by others. But first, why am I even raising our proposal today? The reason, because under our governance system, it is up to Aussie to determine whether and how to move these recommendations forward. Tonight at our regular meeting, Aussie will respond to our proposal their initial response makes me hopeful. When you speak with them tomorrow, I hope you will encourage their support for this proposal and determine what special resources they may need to move forward. Now, why do we propose to replace the star rating? Three big reasons. One, our research shows that the ratings are systemically biased, awarding higher star ratings despite similar growth to schools with fewer at-risk students and lower ratings to schools with many students at risk. It is a textbook case of systemic bias. Two, interviews and surveys of principals and teachers make absolutely clear that the ratings heavy focus on test scores leads schools, especially those with low ratings, to focus on reading and math and neglect science, social studies, the arts, and SEL. And three, the dashboard will create greater guidance for school improvement and for targeting technical and resource support. So what is our 
proposed better replacement. Instead of a misleading star school rating, we propose something that will be much more useful and much less biased, an interactive dashboard with information on school programs and school performance ratings on at least these six priority measures of quality, specifically school climate, including information on whether schools feel academically challenged, nurtured, and safe, whether parents feel welcome, and whether teachers feel they can get the support they need. Two and three, academic growth and equitable growth. That is how the school students and its most at-risk students have improved in reading and math. Four, whether the school offers a well-rounded education vital to providing students the background knowledge they need to comprehend. Five, teacher retention experience and diversity, which connect to achievement. Six, a school's academic proficiency rate. Most recommendations should be low cost, but some will need funding. When you talk with Aussie tomorrow, please ask what they need uh, to move this forward. Finally, on a few other urgent issues, the new DCPS budget model, it will lead to scathing staff cuts, still requires supplanting AR funds, at-risk funds, and retains massive lack of transparency. The council must step in. Two, the continued overcrowding in the Wilson feeder system it's a reality that is quickly spreading across other wards and feeder systems. As you've heard today, you on the council must insist on a real MFP. It is a spreading crisis. Meanwhile, please allow DCPS to lease empty space for needed schools as charters can and prohibit the city from leasing out needed buildings and parks. Three, teacher turnover, current and expected. It is unsustainable, as is the lack of subs and time lags in hiring. One approach, please look at the very creative proposal from EmpowerEd to provide students with special learning opportunities while giving teachers time to plan, collaborate, and rejuvenate. Four, um, make sure that education agencies are ready to implement the dyslexia bill next fall. And finally, on COVID, there are still schools without HVAC and pullout rooms. We still don't have adequate capacity and will to establish and make use of outdoor spaces and partners. This will be an issue if COVID returns and it will complicate things as we move into, at some point, max mask optional policies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Wattenberg. Uh, Fabiana Pereira, who I think is not here. Adrian Smith, who I also think is not here. Josh Boots. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for the opportunity to testify today. Um, my name is Josh Boots, Executive Director of Empower Gay 12, a local nonprofit that supports schools with data. The pandemic generated significant academic and social emotional upheaval for the district's most vulnerable students with declines in well being and academic progress. Our study of unfinished learning from the 2021 school year found that students in DC schools fell academically behind their same age peers from before the pandemic. Students designated as at risk were disproportionately impacted, declining by an average of 14 percentile points in achievement compared to a six point decline for students not designated as at risk. The DC Student Wellbeing Survey that we administer in partnership with public charter schools showed the differential impact was also extended to students' social emotional well-being. Students from low-income families were more likely to experience the loss of an adult that they cared about and had overall lower well-being index scores. One positive from our research was that students who returned for in-person learning during the 2021 school year experienced less academic slide than their fully remote peers on average. The hard work and challenges that leaders, teachers, building operations staff overcame to open schools had an, a positive impact on students. As we transition from COVID response to recovery, the education sector must focus on identifying bold solutions that dramatically accelerate academic progress and support the social emotional well-being of our most vulnerable students. Students, parents, and teachers, especially those living and serving in high at-risk neighborhoods, must be involved in the design process from the start, identifying root causes and crafting novel solutions that can catalyze academic and social emotional growth. I urge the council to invest in an inspirational initiative that begins this fall by asking students, parents and teachers for their innovative ideas for the next generation of school year and support those stakeholders through the rigorous design and feedback process on their ideas. Then for fiscal year 24, we must commit to equitably investing in pilots of their boldest ideas along with a rigorous ongoing evaluation protocol that supports the improvement of them. This public education innovation challenge will encourage creativity, increase engagement in our schools, and ensure a stronger, more collaborative start for new ideas. We can fund this initiative by transferring the tens of thousands of dollars in education agencies' research budgets that use public tax dollars and were misspent on unscientific polling and surveying. 
Thank you for your time and the opportunity to share this testimony today. Thank you, Mr. Um, I have a few questions for you. I want to thank you, each of you for your testimony. Um, I think, uh, Ms. Golden, I was surprised by your testimony, and I don't mean by that a criticism. I thought things were worked out between DCPS and uh, Arlington School. Uh, your testimony was that you were surprised when DCPS announced everything had been worked out. Absolutely surprised. Um, now, I only have uh, like four minutes, so I don't want to use up all that time, but um, can you say a little bit more? Like, I think you, you spoke to this in your statement. Uh, there still hasn't been a meeting you've reached out? There have been meetings. Um, they, there some have been postponed and canceled due to, to um, you know, some of the COVID crisis and returning to schools and those kind of things, which are understandable. But there's another series of meetings that's supposed to happen that haven't even been scheduled yet. We haven't reached an agreement and the questions, and I just highlighted the basics of them, have yet to even be addressed in a meaningful way. So there's a lot more to discuss. And included, I heard you testify that um, you don't feel there's a strong commitment to maintaining the arts program. No, because on one line, they'll say, yes, we're committed to keeping the arts program at the current level or better. And then it's a, then later on at the end, it says, well, we're going to review the curriculum to decide if these, you know, going forward. And that's the quote that I included um, in the testimony to decide if these courses are needed. And I just don't feel that while I, pre I you know, I'm a DCPS graduate, but I feel that the board and the arts professionals are in a better position to decide what goes into a pre-professional program um, and not DCPS. We have the, there is no, we just had a review uh, by an independent board. There's no school in the country that compares to the offerings that we have and that impact the level of diversity in the fields from museum studies, from curation to directing, to script writing, let alone the traditional things that people know with the acting, with the you know, dance with visual arts. Those are the things we're used to, but the people behind the, the scene, we are filtering and we are the pipeline for the nation. There's no other school in the country that does what we do. And there's no commitment, no commitment whatsoever that I have seen that that is going to be guaranteed to be protected. Uh, I will follow up uh, tomorrow at the hearing. I, um... There are only so many questions I'll have time to ask, uh, but I will try to ask at least one question on Ellington. And you should work with um, Ms. Lakeisha Jordan on my staff. Indeed, we will continue to do that. Thank you so much. Um, Ms. Uh, Wattenberg, um, so you testified, there you are, uh, you testified um, a shock at the uh, school budgeting. I'm, you may have heard me with, the, I think, the first group of witnesses where a number of them testified about the need for transparency and all kinds of other things. And um, I'm resisting the urge to be a, a little obnoxious here, and I don't mean toward you, but just on this issue generally. I do have this bill pending, and I have this bill pending, the Bill 24-570, Schools First in Budgeting Amendment Act because I believe that unless we pres prescribe how schools themselves are gonna get funded, we will continue for another couple of decades. Um, what we've seen for the last couple of decades, which is as long as DCPS has, uh, leaves it to themselves, not that it sounds unreasonable that they would figure out what schools get funded. It will always be a mystery what their formula is, there will always be schools that get shortchanged. And uh, so while I don't have um, Bill 24-570 in shape um, to pass right away, uh, I'm open to suggestions on how to improve that calculation. Um, and um, I somehow I feel there's a question and all that. Yes, you had said we need to step in. So what does that mean? Well, than... I am I am a thousand percent in favor of you all stepping in in this way and in 
coming up with a budget model, a formula that makes sense. I do think budget formulas, budget models are incredibly complicated. In the best situations, you have a school board, I'm sorry, but that's the case, but you have some group of people where you can really test out a lot of ideas and build a consensus and talk about the different trade-offs and figure out how to make it work. So what I, I totally am for you doing this, I think it requires a level of discussion that goes beyond um, certainly what you've had, and I know you realize that, um, but I think figuring out how to have that discussion where you can pull people in and figure out how to get agreements across some of these trade-offs so it's sustainable and people understand why it's happening is really, really important, but I am all for you doing it and I would, um, I'm happy to be part of it and offer ideas and so on. Sure, let me just say uh, two things. One, Mary Levy testified earlier she said uh, 61 of 116 schools are currently budgeted for less than for less next year than what they actually have this year. This is after the mayor announced a 5.9% increase in the UPSFF. That's a substantial increase. And after the mayor and the chancellor said that every that no school would get less than it was getting this year. 61 of 116 schools are currently budgeted for less next year than what they actually have this year. When, and I'm reading her testimony, when this year's budgets are updated to next year's prices, 76 of 116 schools have budgets insufficient to maintain existing staff and other resources. Now, I know there was some disagreement about this at the public hearing on the um, schools first in budgeting, but the primary focus of that legislation is stability. So we don't have schools that are losing money and I think we have the opportunity to see if we can't maybe make a little bit more redistribution so that schools that have a greater need get additional money and then we build from there. Um, but the schools are always going to get, are always going to get squeezed as long as they don't come first in the budgeting process. And I'm talking about DCPS, I'm not talking about any other LEA, DCPS is the largest LEA. Um, so I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add on. I, I agree in principle with both of the ideas in those two bills. One, the predictability, and two, that the schools come first. I, so I, I'm with you. I also think um, to be transparent and to uh, understand what the needs are of schools, you need to go beyond that. Yes, we want them to be predictable. Yes, we want schools fit. Um, schools first, we also need to understand the basis on which decisions are being made about where funds are going. And because uh, that's part of transparency and we don't have Yes, that. but forgive me for laughing, but I don't think we'll ever get that kind of transparency from, from Central. I totally agree with you. I, I one thousand again, I 1000% agree. We will not get it from Central. So I am for the council stepping in and doing this. I think you need to be more ambitious, not less. Um, I think I'm over my time here. Let me, uh, I don't believe there's any other council member present. Um, I'm tempted to ask one other question. Uh, Josh Boots, you urge the council to invest in an inspirational initiative that begins this fall by asking students, parents, and teachers for their innovative ideas. But isn't that sort of what this hearing and some of our other hearings are about is asking folks to come forward? So what would you have us doing differently? This would be more authentic engagement and in the community. So I'd be I'd be seeking, I think we're seeking funding to just have authentic engagement with our students in the same ways that we've done in the past, like having them actually flesh out their ideas, giving them that support to like take their idea into action to improve the schools for their students, like for their peers, right? Um, for parents to authentically engage, not just to have bold ideas, but to actually be able to work them out and to have them go into action to be piloted. Uh, I think that the funding model for high impact tutoring is actually relevant here, um, that that provides like competitive funding for bold ideas um, that has evaluation and support along the way. So it wouldn't be just coming to a meeting and in three minutes expressing an idea, it'd be going to multiple meetings to really flesh out your idea, to work with experts in the field to actually make an idea that can drive impact and change. 
Uh, thank you for that. Uh, and we'll be thinking about this some more. I want to thank all of you for your testimony. And you all are now going to be excused. And I'm going to call the next uh, group of witnesses. Sally Detalia, who's co-chair of Directors Exchange. Sarah Toskanowski, future Tuesday parent. Lori Kaplan, who's board chair of LAYC Career Academy. Aja Moore Clovis, who is just listed as a public witness. Michelle Engelman, who is a volunteer with Jews United for Justice. Kelsey Woodford, who is um, with Disability Rights DC at University Legal Services. Faithful Reed, Dylan Craig, who's DCPS Roosevelt Stay Opportunity Academy. Lewis Wallace, Global Kids, DC Youth Leader. Doreen Blue, Jacob Hodges, Dessa LMC student. I think Dessa is Duke Ellington. Lester or Lester, Johnson, Chief Executive Officer, Academy of Hope, Adult Public Charter School, Naima Hayes, Kelsey Desmond, who is Youth Programs Coordinator at Casey Trees, Yazid Jackson, who's Restorative Justice Senior Program Manager of School Talk, Tara Brown, PAVE Citywide Board Member, Deshaun Jones, PAVE Ward 8, PLE Board Member, Anna Rodriguez, PAVE Ward 5, PLE Board Member, Maris, Maria Vanessa Mag, Magana, Magana Martinez, PAVE Citywide Board Member, Titiana Callaham, PAVE Ward 7, PLE Board Member, Natalia Walker, PAVE Ward 8, PLE Board Member, Linda Jones, PAVE Ward 8, PLE Board Member. I'll leave it there. Um, first up was Sally Detalia. Thank you, Chairman Mendelson and members of the Committee of the Whole. My name is Sally Detalia, and I'm a resident of Ward 2. I'm the co-chair of the Directors Exchange and a co-chair of the Program Funding and Compensation Committee for Under 3 DC. I've been an educator and center director in DC for almost 30 years. I'm here today to provide testimony also as a member of the DC Early Childhood Advocacy Association's Coalition under the auspices of the DC Early Learning Collaborative. The leadership and members of our association thank the council for its leadership in passing legislation that resulted in funding to increase salaries and benefits for early educators, providing equal pay for equal credentials. Further, we thank you for establishing the, educate, the Early Educator Equitable Compensation Task Force and for accepting the recommendations of the January 15, 2022 report. I am proud to serve as a member of the task force. I believe that the impact of the Early Educator Equitable Compensation Program will make a significant impact on the landscape of early education in the district, and I believe that it will serve as a model for the rest of the nation. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony during this OSSEE performance hearing. My association has been pleased with the level of attention OSSEE has shown in terms of timely response to meeting requests and questions and concerns. However, more often than not, we feel as though our questions are not answered and we are offered a standard bureaucratic response rather than forthright answers to our immediate concerns. I will share a few requests that have been made because they are concerns to us and we would like to see ASI fulfill in order to support and improve the quality of our programs. ASI through Capital Quality utilizes the following tools, class, iters, and fickers to measure program quality and programs that are participating in Capital Quality. These programs all must have a subsidy contract with OSSEE. These tools which collect data are used to, to determine the subsidy funding of programs in capital quality, but that's not what these tools were designed for. In the case of capital quality, lower ratings from the tools results in lower subsidy payments. In addition, OSSEE is continuing with these assessments despite being in the midst of a health emergency which has altered program operations drastically. And as such, many programs are experiencing significant anxiety around this on top of what they have experienced these past two years. On the federal level, OHS is not requiring such assessments for Head Start programs because of the health emergency. 
While we recognize that ASI is contractually obligated to go forth with the class iters and vicars observations, we urge ASI to do the following. Conduct a data summit with the association leaders prior to the release of the data. As the tools are currently used, the data collected has a direct impact on program funding. As a part of the summit, we urge ASI to consider association recommendations on how best to utilize the data. Develop a communication plan prior to the release of the data that is clear and offers concrete technical assistance to programs and that supports the programs. Create a quality improvement fund that awards programs funds to improve their quality and therefore increase their ratings under the tools currently used. As the, as the system is currently designed, poor performing programs receive less funds. This is a counterintuitive plan that ASI review and evaluate the current organization responsible for the management of capital, the capital quality program, including its current cadre of quality facilitators. Finally, we urge that ASI develop a communication plan and campaign regarding the credential and degree, degree requirements for educators that pertain both to regulations and the Early Educator Equitable Compensation Program. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify today. I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Detalio. Is Sarah Tustanowski here? I don't think I see her. Lori Kaplan. Hi, Chairman Mendelson. It's Nicole Hanrahan. I'm going to take Lori's place today. Okay. Thanks. Um, good day, Chairman Mendelson and members of the council and staff. My name is Nicole Hanrahan, and I'm testifying in place of Lori Kaplan. I'm the co-founder and executive director of the LAYC Acad Career Academy Public Charter School, a Ward 6 resident and a DCPS parent. Thanks for the opportunity to join you today. The LAYC Career Academy was designed to support 16 to 24 year old youth as a bridge between high school and careers in the District of Columbia. Career Academy provides older youth with literacy skills, college credit classes, a state high school diploma and career preparation in the healthcare and information technology fields. We're named one of the best nonprofits in the region and over 95% of graduates are working or in school within six months of completion. Almost all of our students qualify for free lunch and one in three is homeless. I'm here today because I'm concerned about the ability of our school and other adult schools to be able to adequately serve students next year. Over the last two years, we've spent more on tech, HVAC, utilities, mental health services, academic interventions, and student emergency supplies like food. Sadly, when we look ahead to the next school year, we expect to need to continue these enhancements. We're concerned about our ability to give our students what they need because we're expected to offer all the same supports as K through 12 schools with a fraction of the funding. We've identified three key funding disparities experienced by adult and opportunity youth schools. First, the amount of ESSER relief money we received is dramatically lower than that afforded to K through 12 schools that like Career Academy serve a large number of economically disadvantaged students. While Title I eligible schools received millions of dollars through ESSER III, LAYC Career Academy received a total of $50,000. Even all of our students have low incomes. Second, although Career Academy serves an overwhelming number of students who qualify for UPSFF add-on weights like at risk, we're not eligible for them solely because of the age of our students. And finally, the adult and alternative rates are the only base rates on the UPSFF that are still below the recommended amount from the 2013 adequacy study. Not only do our schools not receive the funding needed to support students during a pandemic, they're the only schools not afforded the basic amount that is needed to sustain effective operations. Adult and opportunity youth schools are a key part of COVID recovery. We're training students for in-demand jobs, but we need adequate resources to make this happen. We hope that you will support us in this effort. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, thank you, Ms. Henry. Ajamur Clovis. Hello. Hello. Hi, uh, my name is Ajamur Clovis, and I'm a proud parent of a junior in the Technical Design and Production Department at Duke Ellington School of the Arts. I am also an alumni of the Class of 2002 Theater Department. I'm here today because I'm concerned about the future sustainability of Duke Ellington School of the Arts, given some of the recent comments and lack of communication from DCPS and the school counselor. 
with Duke Ellington. The community of Duke Ellington is asking that DCPS join negotiations in good faith and transparency. As a parent, it's very troublesome that the same budget issues are still happening. I graduated from Duke Ellington in 2002. Imagine my surprise that the ramblings of budget problems I heard as a student, not really knowing the scope, are now loud roars that my daughter is now facing 20 years later. 20 years later, Ellington is still facing a budget crisis, which seems like DCPS's refusal to support the arts, refusal to acknowledge our dual curriculum, and refusal to acknowledge our extended day. DCPS has continuously failed to address the issues that are critical for Ellington to succeed. Our students are often called upon to perform across the city for presidential and mayoral occasions and local events. Most recently, Ellington Show Band performed at the opening of the Frederick Douglass Bridge hosted by our mayor, and one of our vocal students performed at the season opener of the National Stadium. It appears as though the city is constantly pulling from a bank that they're not willing to invest in. During the pandemic, when the world was on pause, artists kept the minds moving. Artists gave us hope in a time that seemed hopeless. Artists across all fields kept us moving when the world stopped. It's amazing to me that DCPS doesn't see the value that Duke Ellington School of the Arts unique programming adds. Duke Ellington prepared me for my life as an actor and the skills that I gained, I was able to use in other areas of my professional career. I've worked on movie and television sets, Broadway and off-Broadway as a manicurist. And all of those skills I needed to work on those various sets, I learned at Duke Ellington. My daughter, Giselle Clovis, has already started her career as a professional assistant costume designer. She recently worked on the movie Unsaid and various stages plays throughout the DMV, not as a volunteer, but as a paid professional. The skills that she used, she gained directly from her training at Duke Ellington School of the Arts from the working artists that are employed at Duke Ellington as arts teachers. We need a long-term commitment to our quality programming at Duke Ellington School of the Arts. We are getting none of that and no negotiations are happening with DCPS in good faith. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clovis. Michelle Engelman. Thank you, Chairman Mandelson, for your time today. My name is Michelle Engelman, and I live in Ward 2. I am a member of Jews United for Justice, a community of Jews and allies committed to advancing social, racial, and economic justice. I would like to thank you for voting to authorize supplemental payments to give our hardworking, underpaid early childhood educators a significant boost to their salaries this year in accordance with the recommendations of the task force. This pay supplement will help make it possible for our valued teachers to be able to thrive. Increased pay for early educators will help to stabilize the field which was in danger of collapsing as educators have been leaving in pursuit of higher paying jobs. Retaining and attracting a well-trained, highly experienced workforce is one of the pillars of the birth to three law and the increase in income is essential to keeping and improving our early education system. This is an important first step in paying educators fairly for their work. The funds to pay these stipends resulted from Council's passage of a marginal tax increase on DC's highest earners. As one of the higher income earners who are about to pay these higher taxes, I am grateful to see this revenue being used to pay well-deserved higher salaries to our educators. I remain happy to pay my fair share in taxes as we begin to implement long-term equity in salaries. This investment will get us on the path of paying teachers who are mostly black and brown women for the value and quality of their work on par with teachers in the public school system. The permanent salary increase that begins next fiscal year will help improve the quality of early education as higher paid teachers choose to remain in the field. 
I am concerned about the district's commitment to increased language access for the early childhood educators who educate our city's youngest learners. Many of these educators, some of whom are also business owners, face significant language barriers in navigating city programs that don't supply resources in their primary languages, especially Spanish and Amharic. Many resources aren't translated into other languages in an adequate or timely manner. I urge you to require the translation of important documents completely and within the programmatic time constraints so that everyone will have fair and equitable access to these programs. This is especially needed so that all teachers will be able to be accurately informed about the increased compensation they are entitled to this fiscal year. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ms. Engelman, and it's good to see you again. Um, the next witness is Kelsey Woodford. Hello, my name is Kelsey Woodford, a staff attorney with Disability Rights DC, the designated protection and advocacy program for district residents with disabilities. I testify regarding two issues today, the need for a renewed commitment to inclusive education and a call for accountability in Aussie's restraint and seclusion regulations. As the district works to rebuild its education system in the wake of COVID-19, there must be a commitment to inclusive education. Nationally, students with disabilities, particularly Black, Indigenous, and students of color, are disproportionately segregated from their peers in school. But in the district, segregation outpaces even the dismal national averages. The district has the highest percentage of students with disabilities who are educated entirely in separate schools from their peers without disabilities, and this percentage is three times the national rate. Only about 57% of school-aged students served under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act le learn inside the general education classroom for 80% or more of the school day, which is a lower rate than all but five states. Students with disabilities have a civil right to be meaningfully included in general education settings, but we also know that inclusion improves educational outcomes for all students. When students are educated alongside their peers, all children enjoy improved classroom environments, heightened academic achievement, and increased social and study skills. Controlling for family income, school quality, English proficiency, students with disabilities perform significantly better in math and reading. These students have fewer school absences, fewer behavioral referrals, and more post-secondary and employment options. COVID-19 has radically disrupted the educational landscape, but as we build back from the disruption, we have an opportunity to improve the system. To do this, the district must prioritize training teachers and professionals to educate diverse groups of students while promoting a classroom culture of acceptance and respect for all. Schools must view special education as a service that can be provided in any setting, so long as the proper supports are in place. For students with disabilities, this means providing special education services in the regular education classroom with the supports and services they need to achieve the goals in their individualized education program or IEP. This can include supports for education, appropriate behavior, and meaningful peer interaction, as well as academic supports and accommodations. Many general education teachers feel unprepared or unable to teach students with disabilities, but the answer is not merely to insert more aids into the general education classroom. Instead, a successful inclusion program should include support for all teachers, as, such as professional development and built-in time and resources for planning lessons. This also means modifying the curriculum to teach students who learn at different levels and in different ways. True inclusive education requires a cultural shift that celebrates and nurtures differences, viewing success through the lens of diversity, not standardization. Turning briefly to Aussie's restraint and seclusion regulations, DRDC has grave concerns regarding the regulations lack of reporting and accountability measures. The regulations as they stand create few mechanisms for Aussie to exercise meaningful oversight of restraint and seclusion, and these practices are laden with risk to students' physical, mental, and emotional health. They also disproportionately impact children with disabilities and children of color, particularly Black boys. Aussie's careful tracking and enforcement of reporting is critical to these students, and we encourage the Council to question them about that tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Woodford. Uh, Faithful Reed. Hello, um, my name is Faithful Reed, and I am, and I'm 16th, Mars Provine in the 10th grade. I have been a protege with Mentors Inc. for about a year now, and I am here to testify about the importance of mentoring. Um, before being matched with a mentor, I had no knowledge on the importance of mentoring. I had no knowledge on the, in, 
or how impactful it can be to have a mentor. I never really knew the job of a mentor. Um, when I was matched with my mentor, um, it has brought a lot of insight in the importance of mentoring. Being matched with a being matched with a mentor on my uh, has brought a lot of insight and has shot a lot of light on my future, especially as being someone with a disability. It has shined light on parts of my future that I didn't even um, thought of. Um, it has motivated me mentally in many ways, and it is highly encouraging to have a mentor. Truthfully, it in the beginning can be very nerve wracking and you may have many doubts, but as you go on and get in a relationship with your mentor, open up, be yourself, be comfortable, be, be comfortable with the mentor and be honest, it will just get easier. Personally, the first couple of months with my mentor was a piece of cake. I didn't really have trouble with getting comfortable with her. I quickly gained a relationship with her. Um, I was just myself. I stayed true to myself and um, I was honest through the entire pro process. However, I was shy, but that still didn't hinder me from, um, didn't hinder, hinder me from showing my true self. My mentor has been very understanding, encouraging, and motivating. Um, as tough as the last two years has been, having a mentor, someone who can motivate you and can encourage you can be very impactful. With that being said, I do think that having a mentor for students and DCPS and even like even adults, I feel like can be very impactful. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reed. Uh, Dylan Craig, <clears throat> and I believe Dylan Craig is not here. Lewis Wallace, and I believe Lewis Wallace is not here. Doreen Blue, and I think Doreen Blue is not here. Jacob Hodges, I do not see him. Lester Johnson, you are up. And I don't think it's Lester. How do you pronounce your name? It's Lecester. Lecester, just the way it's spelled. Yeah, that's right. Hey, thank you, Chairman uh, Mendelson, for the opportunity to testify today. Um, my name is Lecester Johnson. I'm the CEO of Academy of Hope Adult Public Charter School. For over 35 years, Academy of Hope has provided district adults education high school credentialing through the GED National External Diploma Program, workforce training in healthcare and IT and supportive services. I'm here today to highlight the role adult charters play in preparing DC residents to be part of the city's economic recovery and to identify critical needs of the sector to continue supporting DC residents through education, job reskilling and upskilling uh, that lead to careers with self and family sustaining wages. Like all schools, Academy of Hope faced a number of challenges this year as we navigated changing health guidance, stabilized distance learning models, and expanded career pathways programs to meet the growing demand for training by adults who were impacted by COVID-19. This year, Academy of Hope's audited enrollment exceeded the approved enrollment of 415 by 30% and exceeded last year's audited enrollment by over 50%. And this is typical, um, a typical uh, path that we've seen uh, in downturn economies, adult ed programs see skyrocketing enrollment. Overall, the adult charter sector saw an 8% increase in enrollment. Yet relief funding for adult charters was a fraction of the K-12 LEA, what K-12 LEAs receive. And it was allocated based on pandemic level enrollment numbers resulting in inadequate funding to meet ongoing requirements for a safe school environment and technology access for all enrolled learners who needed it. Academy of Hope has re received 750,000 in COVID relief funding. To date, COVID related expenses have exceeded 1.3 million and continue to grow. We asked the council to consider additional resources for adult charters, including adult school funding, to 100% of the UPSFF, the level recommended in the 2013 adequacy study. 
Adult serving schools receive only 89% of the UP SFF. Academy of Hope also saw significant increases in the number of deaf learners. We project interpreter services alone will exceed 300,000 with no additional funding from the city. Uh, we are also estimate about 40% of our learners are individuals with learning dis, uh, differences. We also asked the council to support the 5.9% increase in the UPSF and 3.1% in facilities supports. AOH is dedicated to helping our city's most impacted residents, the majority of whom are African-American. Um, by investing in adult ed, you are also investing in kids and their parents. Uh, we look forward to partnering with the council to best serve DC residents in these critical months ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. And good afternoon. I am now chairing this hearing. How are you doing? Hi. Um, Naima Hayes is next. I don't see her. Okay. Uh, Kelsey Desmond. Good afternoon, council member Christina Henderson, council members, other council members and staff. My name is Kelsey Desmond and I'm the youth programs coordinator at Casey Trees and Award 6 resident. Casey Trees is a nonprofit dedicating to restore restoring, enhancing, and protecting the tree canopy of our nation's capital. We plant trees, advocate for tree protection, and teach students of all ages on the value of our district's trees and green spaces. The Office of the State Superintendent for Education's vision is to close the achievement gap and ensure students of all ages and backgrounds are prepared for success, both in school and in life. In this unprecedented time, Aussie has transitioned to support schools in reopening safely. From virtual learning options to continued emphasis on support for social emotional learning. The continued hardships due to COVID have forced everyone to adjust and securing emergency relief funds to assist schools is noted. With that, we want to highlight the necessity of hands-on learning and educational programming and how outdoor learning opportunities have become more prevalent. We recognize that the reopen strong goals of getting students back to in-person learning focused on health and safety first, and that the funds used towards outdoor infrastructure were made available to schools. However, we highlight the disconnect and continued burden put on teachers to fill the programmatic gap of utilizing this infrastructure with limited support. For example, cutting the Environmental Literacy Achievement Grant, or ELAG, this year was a disappointment. ELAG allowed partners to support teachers and provide curriculum-aligned programming. This program placed a strong focus on students working together and interacting in an outdoor classroom setting. We note that the certain uncertainty of virtual versus in-person infrastructure played a role in classroom planning, and we do applaud efforts to provide online resources for teachers. Yet the loss of this funding complicated partner organizations ability to facilitate high quality outdoor learning. It is reported that outdoor learning can make students 50% more attentive to the lessons being given and 33% more likely to participate in future learning experiences. Together, these benefits help students become more self-directed in their learning, foster creative and critical thinking and increase students' confidence. It can also help them develop leadership skills and build peer-to-peer -peer bonds decrease stress and anxiety, mitigate symptoms of depression, and promote outdoor activities. With that, we ask that funding be reinstated to support partners in providing impactful outdoor and environmental programming in collaboration with teachers. We would also like to re-emphasize the goal in the Sustainable DC Plan to teach 100% of children in the district about environmental and sustainable concepts by 2032. Aussie updated the Environmental Literacy Plan in 2020, and we look forward to Aussie sharing data and reports on how many changes have impacted environmental literacy in the district. Casey Trees will continue supporting city goals and engaging youth to be stewards of their community. When we invest in our students, we invest in our future. Aussie's mission is to work purposely in partnership with other education systems to sustain, accelerate, and deepen progress for DC students and Casey Tree values this partnership. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ms. Desmond. Uh, Yazid Jackson. Good afternoon, uh, Council Member Henderson and the members of the Committee of Whole. Thank you for including me to share this testimony. My name is Yazid Jackson. I'm the Senior Restorative Justice Program Manager at School Talk, a nonprofit based in DC whose mission is to tackle complex problems that impact youth and the schools and systems that support them. School Talk's restorative justice mission promotes the integration of restorative justice into DC school communities through professional development and whole school technical assistance. 
OSSI has provided approximately $900,000 annually to support restorative justice in DC schools through individual capacity building and whole school change. We are currently working with uh, nearly 50 DCPS and public charter schools across all wards in the district. This year, we've had the opportunity to see and hear from school staff and leadership about the increasing concerns about personal safety, as well as challenging behavior in classrooms and the community. The trauma from the last few years have impacted the mental health of both students and staff. It has also affected students' ability to learn. It has led to significant student and staff absenteeism. It has taken significant effort for school staff to establish relationships with students. But with the clear vision and concrete strategies, we see school staff rising to the challenge. We're sort of DC teachers responsive and proactive approaches, which allows them to confront the challenging behavior with equity and commit to ongoing community building with students and families. We are also seeing the positive impact of these restorative practices and how school students interact with students and each other. Uh, one middle school we've worked with found that this year's incoming class were more like elementary students. They were two years behind in their social development and not the type of middle schoolers they were used to in the past. Over the last two years, the school community also saw the departure of a number of key staff members. Restorative DC worked with school leaders to set goals and use the school's advisory structure to model and co-facilitate restorative processes that supported students with the most intensive needs, but they expanded the supporting to supporting teachers um, in a broader classroom setting. Anecdotally, we have also seen a number of classrooms where teachers regularly implement restorative practices. Students are scoring at, at higher levels on their ANET assessments than in similar classrooms in schools. These teachers were initially skeptical of restorative justice, but have found that restorative practice also allowed them to develop deep relationships with students that keeps, that keeps the students in the classroom and in school, impacting their overall academic needs and uh, mindset of their behavior. Looking ahead to school year 2022-23, we anticipate schools will need targeted support to implement strategies to retain and re-energize staff who may be feeling overwhelmed and burnt out, rebuild staff to student connections, that were disrupted during the pandemic, particularly those with most disconnected from school. And uh, lastly, employ trauma-sensitive strategies to address mental health. Other supports are written out in my testimony. Uh, requests for uh, technical assistance are increasing. We want to support all public and public charter schools in the district that need our help, but we anticipate the demand may exceed our capacity based on funding levels. We ask the city leaders to continue to, to support restorative justice and other critical initiatives such as mental health supports and addressing the complex challenges regarding school security and safe passage. We'll be happy to meet with you at any time to discuss this program in greater detail, and thank you for the opportunity to have us on today. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Um, Tara Brown, I think might be the last person on this panel. Hi, Ms. Brown, how are you? Hi, Councilmember Henderson, how are you? Good. Um, hello to the rest of the Committee of the Whole and all of the agencies supporting education here today. My name is Tara Brown. I'm a Ward 8 resident and a PAVE parent. My child suffers from severe clinical depression and extreme social anxiety. Their mental health issues are treated with therapy and medication. Their ability to learn was significantly impaired by their condition. Once they received their diagnosis, it was even more important to understand the impact of their mental health on their learning process. We did a needs assessment and then tailored their education to fit their mental health needs. Now they are managing both their mental health and their education better. We have over 94,000 more students that need the same assessments and customized plans for aligning their mental health needs with their education. Today, I'm talking about trauma and learning. There is plenty of research compiled about what trauma does to the brain, especially developing brains and how that stress and trauma can impede the learning process. Considering that this pandemic is a collective traumatic experience, it is, a log it is logical to assume that virtually every school-aged child in DC has gone through trauma. And you also factor in violence, abuse, poverty, and the mental instability of some caregivers. This assumption has even more credibility. Considering how adults have struggled with COVID, how does a child process it while simultaneously getting an education that is foundational to their lifelong success and developing into fully functioning adults? Research shows that our children are not doing well. According to the CDC, the average proportion of children have pop ups. Uh, the average proportion of children's mental health related emergencies visits was 44% higher in 2020 than in 2019. This is even more sobering when you consider that 
it does not account for the number of mental health emergencies that never made it to the hospital or ended in suicides. I am here to address all of you empowered to service all of the educational needs of over 94,000 children in both public and charter schools. It is important that I talk about these children as a whole group and even more important for you to start thinking of them this way. Uh, operating from that premise, each agency and organization can overcome the first obstacles to our efforts to establish comprehensive school-based mental health supports, your lack of cooperation with one another. Once you all decide to pool your resources and work in collaboration with each other, we can take the first step towards solving the problems, and that is understanding it. Our paved parent priorities around school-based mental health include assessing the mental health needs of each school, generating a gap analysis to determine what is needed compared to what each school has, uh, using this gap analysis to create a comprehensive and transparent plan for the future, inclusive of families, and investing $300,000 to fund a cost study to determine the true cost of expanding the school-based mental health program now and into the future. On behalf of the paid parents who were surveyed and collaborated to come up with our parent priorities around school-based mental health, I urge you to listen to our recommendations. Figure out what you are doing, figure out what needs to be done, then work together to make it happen. It is not enough just to spend money. You can throw a lot of money at a problem, but, if it, but it, it is wasted if you haven't actually solved it. DC invests billions in education. It is a colossal waste of money if we don't also invest in enough school-based mental health supports that will ensure our children are equipped to benefit from that investment and can actually learn. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so Deshaun Jones is not here. Um, Anna Rodriguez. Hello, hi. Good, uh, good afternoon, um, Chairman um, Christina Anderson. How are you doing today? I'm good. Um, my, my name again is Ana Rodriguez. I'm a divorced mother of two daughters, one of which attends Howard um, Middle School. We reside in Ward Five and also serve with with the Parents Amplifying Voices of Education on the Ward Five Parent Leaders. I'm also an advocacy captain and our shared priorities of paid parents is a school-based mental health support as mental health supports are essential to growth in the DC children is even more important now due to the effects of COVID-19. Let me get to my testimony. <laughs> I am testifying today because I want to make sure that every single student at every school has equal, equal, equality when it comes to both academics and access to school-based mental health supports. I don't want our options to be limited based on the zip code of where they live or go to school. Before the pandemic, my daughter Liana attended Inspire Teaching School. She could have attended ITS until eighth grade, but the school was unable to meet our needs in terms of school-based mental health, particularly our need for a positive and culturally responsive school culture and climate. I was constantly being called into the school for incidents involving Liana. This is why we decided to transfer Liana to Langley Elementary, which really worked well for her. At the time, being around more black kids and teachers who looked like her in a school environment that met her needs, the incidents ended. But at this point, when school moved to virtual, at the beginning of the pandemic, we could no longer access all the best parts of being at Langley. So when she entered the sixth grade, we applied to and were accepted by Howard University Middle School. I believe that parents shouldn't have to make a choice between academics versus mental health support in a school. When I first applied to the lottery, I put academics first. And then when I looked at the schools, they were so many we were interested in that were great academically, but their tier of available supports didn't match what we were looking for. In the end, we had to give up on some academic opportunities in order to prioritize my daughter's psychological and emotional needs. Now that she's at Howard University Middle School as an individual school, Howard is doing its best. But honestly, there is nothing that Howard Middle had for me to support her without making me do an assessment. Not all kids have 0504s or IEPs, but they still need support. The dean of students seems to be the only person around. This school year, my daughter witnessed her friend being hit by a car, which was traumatic and experience. And I was surprised to see that the kids weren't offered support or given the opportunity to speak to a clinician about it. I share all of this to show exactly why we need the 
district to access the mental health needs of DC school communities, which can, which can start a comprehensive match on what mental health needs support currently exists in each school and we are there all gaps. My testimony also shows we need the district to invest in a stronger accountability system between agencies to make sure that kids are getting the right implementations for the supports that already exist. As parents, we are unaware of the issues or gaps to, in our school mental health systems until we need to access them. Last year, fully funding the school-based mental health expansion was an amazing step, the right direction. And this year, I hope you continue to prioritize the mental health needs of our school. Thank you for allowing me to testify and share what I see for our children. I hope children will be able to receive school-based mental health regardless of a diagnosis or a 504 plan. My name again, Ana Rodriguez. I'm with PAVE and I'm an advocacy captain. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Um, wait on, someone will tell me timer. Um, I see Lyndon Jones. I don't see anyone else in between the two of them. If I'm wrong, can somebody let me know? Um, but in the meantime, okay. I, oh, it looks like I'm wrong. Okay. Uh, Maria Martinez. I think you are next. Hi, good afternoon, um, Chairman Mendelson, Christina Henderson, and members of the Committee of the Whole. My name is Maria Vanessa Magana Martinez. My son is Alexis and attends Harriet Tubman Elementary School in Ward 1. I also serve with Parents Amplifying Voices in Education, PAVE, as a citywide PL board member. Thank you for all you have been known for families this year. And especially thank you for the $3 million in the DCPS uh, fiscal year 22 budget for learning and social emotional learning recovery plans. Uh, last school year, my son Alexis was enrolled at Cleveland Elementary. Alexis has an IP and having a, had been attending Cleveland since pre-K. When Alexis entered into the second grade, he has assigned a new uh, special education support team. And that was the beginning of the end for family at Cleveland. Although he had been at the school for almost five years, when his support team changed, he, it felt like he no longer belonged um, in the Cleveland community. In fact, it felt like the more I advocate for my son and tried to be in direct communication with his special education team, the more the school nurse would focus on his condition to support Alexis sending home for minion and, irre and irrelevant reasons. Waiting six hours in the ER and being sent for just, in, for just a few minutes only to be told that he obviously coughing because he's recently had his tonsils removed was so frustrating. The final straw for us and the conversation that made me decide to switch schools was when, was when Alexis' teacher made the recommendation that he should be moved to a smaller class because his knowledge was like the kindergarten. At that point, I had been doing virtual learning with Alexis and I knew he, had, he was capable of literacy and math skills beyond that his teacher said. However, I do trust in the teacher's expertise. So I asked if Alexis wasn't ready to move past the first grade, then why did you retain him? Although I, did, I didn't want my son to have to repeat that grade, if it was necessary for him to receive the best education, then our family could support him through it. But when the reason was given that he has an IP, I feel the response was insuf insufficient. Alexis deserves the same quality education as a very other student in the district. It's not right to just com continue to promote him if he wasn't not actually meeting the standards. It is important to know that Alexis was the only child with diagnosis with Down syndrome at the Cleveland and now at Tubman, which makes me so proud that he has been able to, clump, to accomplish so much speaks to this capacity for learning and develop. Sharing our story and advocating for Alexis is part of why I'm to, here today. And I also here to advocate for students and families across this, the district to get the support they need for DCPS and the DMI. Right now, so many students are struggling like Alexis after transitioning from virtual back to in-person learning. Many have experienced learning loss in addition to the academic support they need, the mental health support, the help 
for them to understand it is not their fault. Um, we need the council to prioritize assessing the mental health needs of these schools communities. A key part to this providing 300 million to found cost study determinate trust cost expanding the school-based mental health program now in the future. Um, my, my testimony goes longer, but I just would like to um, thank you for allowing me to testify and share what I want to see for kids in the district. I hope you will make the need investment for mental health needs assessment, uh, the 3,000 million cost analysis to increase the training for school and staff. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Ivana Zialia. I'm just gonna say all of these just in case. Tatiana Callahan, Callahan. Okay. Uh, Natalia Walker. All right. Uh, Linda Jones. Hi, Ms. Jones. You're on mute. Still on mute. Oh. Nope, it still says you're you're on mute. Okay, um, I think, I don't know if you have somebody who can help assist you because um, I, I can't control your microphone on our end, so. Nope, we still can't hear you. Okay, so um, while Ms. Jones works on that, I um, actually was here for everyone's testimony. So I'll ask just a, a quick round of questions if possible. Um, I'll start uh, with Ms. Uh, D'Italia. Um, First, I wanted to say thank you so much for your service on the um, Early Educator Task Force, Compensation Task Force. Um, every time we get the meeting notification updates, I'm like, oh, they're at it again. And we truly, truly appreciate um, the work that you all are doing there and you know, want to work. Um, gosh, we want to be able to, we gotta get that money out the door ASAP. And so um, working on that, but so the secondary point about what you talked about as it pertains to Aussie, excuse me, needing to be clear um, mm -hmm. in their communications with you all, we could definitely follow up on that. Um, communication has been, I would say, one of those challenging points for that agency for quite some time. So I just wanted to say thank you for your testimony um, there. Um, is Ms. Clovis still here? I am. Hi. Oh, how okay. Hi. How are you, um, Ms. Clovis? I um, I want to say thank you so much for testifying. Um, you know, it, it's funny when you sort of think about the issues around Duke Ellington. I always like to say, you know, these are the same issues that we were dealing with when I worked at DCPS many moons ago. But for you to say these are the same issues from when you were a student twenty years ago, yes. um, I, I think that is 
unacceptable in nature. And to your point, like coming to the, the table in terms of the conversation. Um, and so um, to all of the folks from Duke Ellington, the families and, and, and participants, I appreciate the advocacy because I think that for a very long time, not a lot of people knew right. that the teachers of Duke Ellington were on a completely different, I wouldn't even call it salary scale, but a completely different funding mechanism than um, everyone else as part of DCTF. Yes, we have, we've asked numerous times and it was our academic teachers who decided, you know, we will take a, a pay cut, if you will, so that our arts teachers can get paid so that everyone can get a salary. Um, we've asked DCPS to come to the table many times and we are constantly given the runaround. Um, we are, con meetings are constantly pushed back or don't happen at all. Uh, it's a serious issue 20 years later. So I was a student at Ellington. I graduated, I attended all four years and these issues have gotten worse. Nothing is being addressed. And every time we get a new school uh, chancellor or someone new is in a position of power, anything that we had worked towards, gets it gets wiped off the board and we're back at ground zero. Yeah, okay. I'll definitely ask in terms of follow-up questions on that to DCPS tomorrow. Um, and, and thank you for being here. Um, for having me. Ms. Woodford, thank you so much for your testimony on behalf of um, uh, the Disability Rights DC group. Um, you know, there was a hearing, I don't know, days and weeks are running together. We did, there was a hearing on special education that had a specific conversation around some of these issues. And I think what you're bringing up um, still underpin some of those. And so I feel it, it deserves in terms of the conversation coming back up again around um, restraints, special education services, accommodations that are being provided. Um, and it's something that I have been worried about, particularly as I feel like in the COVID era, um, if you will, um, there's like a lot of um, not excusing the situation, but a lot of folks like, I just got to focus on the basics. I can't do the extra. Mm -hmm. Well, for a student who has um, a disability, the extra is the basics, right? And so like, we can't, you know, um, we have a legal obligation to serve all of these young people and serve them well. And so I appreciate um, you bringing up the concerns that you did as well. Um, to Ms. Johnson and Ms. Kaplan, um, thank you guys for being here and for your advocacy on behalf of adult education. You know, we are glad we were able to work on that last year to add the additional funding um, and so I think one of the questions um, I have for either one of you, I'm, I'm not sure if Ms. Johnson's still here. I can't, I can't really see her, but um, maybe- I'm Ms. here, Kaplan. just, oh. just driving oh. right now. Oh, well, you know- We have to go. <laughs> that's okay. Drive safely. Don't, <laughs> don't crash because you're in a hurry. Um, so I'll, I'll ask Ms. Kaplan um, this, or, or maybe you can respond too, but when do you anticipate- um, a stabilization happening in terms of enrollment in the adult ed space. Well, ahead, I'll, I'll just, oh, go ahead. Uh, will you, I can't see you, Nicole, I'm sorry. I'll just say really quickly, we are seeing what we, we projected would happen. Um, you know, of course the pandemic has had some effect, but as the as things started to recover, we're seeing increased enrollment, at least at, at uh, AOH, but what happens is, you know, it, it really is impacted by what the K-12s are doing as well. So if kids are not in school, the adults that we're serving are not able to go to school, which then that's what we predicted would happen at the top when the pandemic first started. So um, I think if as long as kids are starting to stay in school, that kind of stabilization, if we're talking around enrollment, yes. The issue now, uh, sorry, Nicole, I'll, I'll talk quickly, is that, um, you know, the, the COVID relief funding did not, it was not adequate. I mean, I, I, I shared, we're at one over 1.3 million in cost, but we've only received 750,000 in COVID relief funding. So those are some of the issues around just stabilizing um, as we, we are in this new normal. And then I'll shut up. 
Let Nicole say something. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm actually over my time. Um, so I will. If you have any I more questions, I don't because I stepped out. So if you have any more. Oh, okay. Um, so I just wanted to say to the parents who testified uh, with PAVE, thank you all for being there. Um, and um, I know very much the things that you guys have been um, advocating on behalf or excuse me, advocating for as it pertains to school-based mental health um, and out of school time um, and some other issues there, but I appreciate you all sharing. Um, the other thing, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, I see Linda Jones has joined by phone. She was having trouble before in terms of audio. She's supposed to be the last person on this panel. Um, Ms. Jones, I don't know if you can hear me, but I definitely wanted to make sure that you have the opportunity to testify. For her to testify, she needs to unmute, and I can't remember. I think that's star six. Miss Jones, if you could hit star six. I may be wrong. It might be star something else or pound something, but I think it's like star. Okay, something. well, wait on instructions. Um, but that's those are all the questions I had, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to thank all the witnesses. As you know, I stepped out for about 15 minutes. Having been here since nine o'clock this morning, I want to thank Councilmember Henderson for filling in. Uh, so you all are excused. Uh, Ms. Jones, Linda Jones, uh, we'll keep you in and I'll see if I can get more definitive instructions on how you can unmute. Let me call the next group. Hello. Oh, there's Miss Jones. How you doing? Chairman, you're Are on mute now. To... Don't ready for me to speak? No, hold on a moment. Let me call the rest of the witnesses okay. and, and then I'll ask you to speak. No problem. Um, uh, Leticia Vinson, who's with PAVE, Ward 7 Citywide Board Member, Marcia Huff, also with PAVE, Ward 7 Policy Captain, Billy Lawson, Whittier Elementary PTO Board, Oscar Alcadiz Rosales, who's a teacher, Alexander Rose Hennig, who's a with Basis, Basis DC Public Charter School, Juan Aloha, who's a parent at Duke Ellington School of the Arts, Xavier Thompson, who's a student in the 10th grade at Duke Ellington School of the Arts, Shana Adams, who's also a DCPS student, K.C. Boyd, who's a librarian at Jefferson Academy, uh, Michelle Dunkley, who's at Duke, from Duke Ellington School of the Arts, Ron Sokolov, Joy Harrington, who's a parent, Maria Jones, Sheila Carson Carr, who's with Decoding Dyslexia DC, Shata Whittle, Tari Ewart, Kyra Childs, Ebony Rose Thompson, who is an elected member of the state, state, excuse me, elected member of the DC State Board of Education, representing Ward 7, Renee White, Ayana, Lori Carter, Emily Thomas DeWolf, Maria Almedo Malagon who's president of Langley Elementary PTO, and Ms. DeWolf is also from Langley, and Rosalind Taylor, who's the owner of Leah's Rainbow. That's all the witnesses listed on page seven of the witness list. While they're being let in, um, Linda Jones, why don't you uh, give your three minutes? All right, you say give you a few minutes? You have three minutes, so why don't you speak? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman Memberson and members of the committee as a whole. My name is Linda Jones. I was born, raised here in D.C., and I'm an award a paid PLE member, board member. I'm also a Blue graduate, and all three of my children attended D.C. public schools, both DCS and DCPS. Now that I am a grandmother and my eldest granddaughter is a high school junior at Thurgood Marshall Academy, and my youngest granddaughter is under three in daycare. First thing, first, thank you. 
thank you for your school time program investment of $22 million in the FY22 budget. Those are important investments, and I testify today because I want all kids to be able to access important OST programs such as summer youth employment programs, mentorship. This is so important for students who are going through transition, like my granddaughter, who is getting ready to apply for college in the fall. I am so proud of Kamari that when she was in 10th grade, she won Thurgood Marshall Academy Law Day, like they're good, provides opportunities for access to mentorship programs, pathways to college that can be made even stronger when the city invests in OST funding. Thurgood so good focus on academic, focuses on academic, but Kamari got more interested in the school when she was able to get involved with after-school arts programs. Right now, she is in a portrait painting group and is making good grades. It's important to mention that my granddaughter, Kamari, has an IEP. And, I, and since receiving it, she has been doing well this strong academic year. Support from her school has helped prepare her for the participation in the Marinburg Summer Youth Program, which she has been working with since the age of 15. One of the things about Kamari participating in the SYEP last summer is when she had a few academic issues and had to assess summer school and she was still able to get paid for her studies through the um, SYE. SYEP. It's just one other type of summer programs, but to increase access to many different types of summer programs, we are asking you to provide at least $25 million in local recurring funding for OST, OS, OST programs in the FY23. The funding will help create more programs like these, programs that will help students' academic needs, combating learning loss after virtual learning, while still offering skills building, mentorship, and employment. Opportunities that are positive for young people. It was good that our family could get information from the school, from the city, about signing up for this through the school. But seeing this type of information posted and provided, seeing this type of information posted in a Variety of places like supermarket churches, rec centers will make more accessible for families in Ward 8. By, before, by, by providing at least $25 million in local recurring funding for OST programs and by providing dedicated funding for schools for before, after school, summer, and winter programs, we can make it so that even more students like Mike Randall Kamari get the support they need and to make successful transition life after high school. Thank you for allowing me to testify and share that I want to see for our kids and our district. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Uh, also, Thank you. Uh, we have Lewis Wallace, who might call earlier. Lewis Wallace or Luis Wallace? Yes. Please proceed. Well, good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson and members of the Committee of the Whole. Thank you for the opportunity to address the council today. My name is Luis Wallace. I live in Ward 8 and I'm in the 11th grade. I attend the Global Kids Citywide Program where I receive substantial and supplemental enrichment about the world. Programs like Global Kids teaches us to connect our personal experiences with social, economic, and political issues around the world. We learn how to become a more informed and engaged member of our community and the world. We learned about critical international issues, global diplomacy, and human rights, and create peer education and service projects that educate and inspire the wider community to become engaged in civic responsibilities. Global Kids is also a member of the DC Out of School Time Coalition. I am here to testify about the importance of out of school time programming because students deserve to know that they have access to programs which are an outlet for creativity and fostering leadership needed today. I ask you to invest more in us, to ensure that we have the opportunities and futures that we deserve, and to ask the council to restore and protect funding for OST. My message for you, Global Kids Programs is a way for students to find safe spaces where they're able to be themselves without room for judgment, where we praise individuality and love everyone for their unique qualities. Global Kids Program provides opportunities for students to learn about topics not focused on in schools and build on this knowledge in order to find the solutions needed. Throughout the pandemic, programs like Global Kids were able to give me and many others 
a space to air our grievances. We were able to build friendships and thrive on social interaction, not otherwise awarded to us throughout the pandemic. We were able to build friendships and learn what it is to be a part of a family. Lastly, I would like to conclude with this. As the rise in crime in the district has increased, we need more resource, resources to better cope with programs like Global Kids, Students are able to find community amongst one another rather than the dangers offered to them outside. It is a way from students from all backgrounds and communities to find commonality while receiving global education and learning to become leaders for today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. Uh, Leticia Vincent. Good morning, Chairman Mendelssohn and members of the committee as a whole. My name is Letitia Vincent. I'm a proud parent of two children who attend Kip Shaw campus in Ward 6. I also serve with Parents Amplifying Voices in Education, PAVE, on the citywide board, as well as a representative for Ward 7. First, thank you for last year's budget investments and in fully funding the school's base mental health expansion, as well as investment of the 22 million in out of school time programs. For me, advocating for families to have access to adequate school-based mental health and out-of-school time programs means playing my part in creating equity in, in the district and to access to equal opportunity, especially for black and brown families who have historically faced immense barriers to access we deserve. When I moved to DC in 20, 2005, I was basically clueless about the school system. The reality of how challenging it was to find high quality schools for my children hit me like a smack in the face. And so with choosing, I had to rely on other people in the city that I trusted, which is how I ended up with Kip. As I talked to people and did my research and got more involved in the education advocacy, I hear many stories about basic educational needs going unmet in schools, unacceptable excuse me, unacceptable building facilities, no access to OST or adequate mental health supports. And I constantly wonder, how is this even real? How is this feasible? This is why I'm here. Not only am I advocating for OST, increased OST funding, which is 25 million in the reoccurring local dollars, but also the strategic planning centering family voices to make sure that the programs are created are actually matching students' needs and interests. In terms of social, um, excuse me, uh, school-based mental health programs, it is the reason why we are asking Deputy Mayor of Education and the DME and the Department of Behavioral Health, DBH, to develop clear, publicly transparent and strong accountability systems for any agency or organization providing mental health supports in schools and partnerships with families and youth. When I think about the possible nomination of Katinji Brown Jackson, the first black woman to be called to the Supreme Court, I know it represents a world of possibilities for our black and brown kids in DC. Before her nomination to the nation's highest court, Ms. Brown was seated in the DC's district court. It is my hope that the district not only continues to setting symbols, symbolic positive trends and representation, but also moves toward being a nationwide trendsetter in providing high quality education. It's true that with increased funding for OST, we can help to give everybody the resources they need, but it won't matter if we don't know how to use those resources. A good example of that is how many parents feel about Learn24 website. Sure, it exists, but people too often don't know about it and it's hard for them to use it if they do. The site should be a gateway to accessing if there's tutoring service, sports, culture exploration, drama. But if it can't, if it can't be, people don't have to realize it's even there. The issue of parents not knowing about available resources also rings true when it comes to mental health support. According to the 2021 PAVE survey, back to school survey, one in eight, which is about 12% of DC families struggle with having consistent access to mental health services and supports. And only 49% of the parents are even aware that mental health support uh, for their children is available in their schools. Ms. Vinson, you're over your time by a minute. Apologies. That's uh, okay. The rest of the content is in the submitted uh, 
testimony in writing? Which I actually do not have. Questions. I do not have your statement. So if you could resubmit it. I definitely will. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry to cut you off. We do have uh, witnesses have three minutes. And uh, if you're in gallery view, you'll see the clock in the top screen. Mar Marcia Huff, who's also with uh, PAVE. Greetings, Chairman Mendelson and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Marcia Huff, and I'm the proud parent of two children who attend Two Rivers Young, and we live in Ward 7. I serve with PAVE on the Ward 7 PLE board, and I also have the honor of serving as the Ward 7 policy captain. I'm here today because every family deserves access to high quality OST programs for their children that supports their individual needs where they can explore their passions and enrich their learning regardless of income, ward, or ability. I urge you to prioritize OST funding because it's critical for student and family success. Students of all ages need ways outside of the classroom to develop and sharpen skills, explore interests, and make friends. Unfortunately, not all students have access to high quality OST programs due to significant barriers, including cost, transportation, and access to information. Uh, we pay almost $500 a month for our children to attend aftercare. We're fortunate to have employers that are supportive and flexible when we need to adjust our schedules. Finding fun, engaging, convenient, and reasonably priced summer camp is a significant challenge. We have been fortunate to land DPR camp slots the last few years, but finding a slot in these camps is a major triumph because slots fill within minutes. The system favors those that are organized and have flexible work schedules. For years, we spent $300 to $500 a week for our son to attend camp, and DPR camps range from $55 to $90. Before the pandemic, our kids' school had various options for after-school enrichment. Our son participated in dance, gymnastics, engineering, science, yoga, art, music, etc. We were thankful for the assortment of on-site options because transportation would have been an issue. None of these activities were free and most cost between 150 and 250 per eight weeks. I assume if you needed financial assistance, you would have had to request it and it's not a great system. It's critical to redesign the OST voucher cost structure and requirements and work to ensure all families are aware of the available financial resources. We at PAVE put our heart and soul into creating policy solutions for OST. These solutions include increasing the funding for out-of-school time programs. We need at least $25 million in local reoccurring OST funds, um, requiring an additional $8 million in additional local reoccurring dollars, um, dedicated funding for schools for before and after care and summer programming, um, call, create a strategic plan with families, educators, um, OST providers and community partners to ensure access to end of end programs. Um, I, there's more in my testimony, but um, I'll leave it in the written. Um, thank you for allowing me to testify today and I hope that you prioritize investments in OST. Uh, thank you, Ms. Huff. And I do have your statement. Uh, and yes, we tried to pray for, give it more resources for the current fiscal year, and I trust the council will be supportive again. Julie Lawson, Whittier Elementary. Uh, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, council members, chairman. Uh, my name is Julie Patton Lawson. My son, Owen, is in the fifth grade at Whittier Elementary in Ward 4, where I've been on the PTO and the LSAT for five years. Uh, I am also a Ward 4 representative on the Parent Advisory Council to my school DC, the Common Lottery, and I served on the Community Working Group advising for the creation of Ida B. Wells Middle School and the modernization of the facilities and programming at Coolidge. I'm really grateful for how Whittier particularly and DCPS overall handled getting back to on-campus learning through COVID. I may be um, an outlier in that, but I Expecting perfection is unrealistic, but I felt our family was well informed and my son's needs were mostly met for academic, social, emotional support and protecting his and our family's health. My first ask today is that we recognize and give meaningful appreciation to our DCPS principals who are leading their schools with all of the anxieties of their staff, their students, the families, and also managing their own lives and families. A special shout out to our principal, Tiffany Johnson. I briefly also want to express appreciation for the work of the My School DC team, which manages the common lottery for DCPS and public charter schools. 
They are extremely receptive to parent feedback and dedicated to answering questions and making this process as clear, transparent, and trustworthy as possible. My final comments are about school modernizations and swing space. As you know, Whittier's facilities are a century old and staff and DGS spent inordinate and expensive amounts of time dealing with keeping the buildings functioning and safe. Modernization is on the horizon, but it's still going to be a couple of years of spit, faith, and duct tape to hold the place together. Once our day in the capital budget finally comes, we are looking at being relocated far outside the neighborhood for the one swing space DCPS maintains for Ward 4. Whittier has many amazing attributes and they all stem from being a true community school. Most of our families walk to school and build their relationships on the way. But we know we have our village around us. I worry that a swing space a couple neighborhoods away will weaken that community infrastructure, which will then reduce enrollment, which then reduces the school budget and then causes staffing changes. It's a very destabilizing move for our community. Whittier desperately needs a new facility, but I'm afraid that the current plan will have a long-term harm to the community and culture um, within that facility. I hope that DCPS, DME, and the council can identify closer swing space to keep the school community intact and strong. I'm very grateful for our experiences at Whittier. Look forward to being Wells Wolves this fall, and thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Looking to see Wells Wolves. Okay. Um, I'm told that uh, Dylan Craig has come in. Why don't you speak? Thank you. Hello, council members, and appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm Dylan Craig, an English teacher and the building representative for the WTU at Roosevelt Stay Opportunity Academy and a Ward 4 resident. I'm testifying today about our spacing issues in our building that we share with Roosevelt High School. At Roosevelt Stay, we serve students who come to us with a variety of needs. Many are here because they have somehow become disconnected with the educational system, and Roosevelt Stay strives to provide an environment that allows them to feel valued and remain focused on achieving their educational goals during a period in their life where it may feel like everything is working against them. Many have come to Roosevelt Stay as one of their last chances to re-engage with school, and they need an environment that lets them know we are taking this re-engagement as seriously as they are. The staff are working hard to let our students know we are taking it. We take their education as seriously as they, they do, but our building says the opposite. Due to our limited space in our shared building, we have staff that must frequently change classrooms throughout the day in order to make use of all the available spaces during a given period, creating issues with planning and classroom setup. We have our social workers all in one room, making it incredibly difficult to provide the services for sensitive issues they face every day. We have, a crowding, we have crowding in areas, making it uncomfortable and unsafe for students and staff and creating spaces not conducive to learning. We have students from Roosevelt High School coming to our hallways and our students going to theirs, creating significant disturbances for both schools. We do not have a PA system of our own, so we cannot make important announcements to staff and students that fosters a community feeling or strong communication. The limited availability we have in our building also leads to an overall feeling of unimportance, low priority, and even a stigma for our students. Again, this is incredibly harmful to a student body that has often already felt let down and abandoned by the educational system. Next year, we will potentially be adding more staff to serve our students, as, as will Roosevelt High School. This is fantastic, as we could all use all the support to give our students the learning opportunities they deserve, but we are afraid that we do not know where they will go. We are already being as creative as possible to use the limited amount of space we have been given. If we are truly in, to be an opportunity academy, we need the space to provide opportunity and show the students that they, will, they are not an afterthought and the educational system is for them and does care about them. We need the space for students and staff to be comfortable and feel respected, not like an add-on, not like a triviality. That is why I'm asking you to consider these spacing issues. Both schools need their own building. We need adequate space. We can't lose more space to Roosevelt High School. Roosevelt Stay is in need of more space, and we want what is best for both Roosevelt Stay and Roosevelt High School. But currently, the space provided is doing both schools a huge disservice. Thank you for the time and um, the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Craig, and I'm glad we were able to accommodate you after uh, the teaching day. Yeah, thank you. Akadiz Rosales, Rosales. Let's see if he's here. Uh, 
Uh, Alexander Rose Herring. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson and members of the committee of, of the council. My apologies. Thank you so much for having me here. My name is Alexander Rose Hennig. I'm the head of school at Basis DC Public Charter School. We serve a highly diverse student population in grades five through 12, and we're located in Ward 2, right in downtown and quarter. We have about 650 families who are your constituents who come from every ward, neighborhoods, and zip code in the city. We happen to be one of the top performing schools in the city. We're the top performing open enrollment high school and the top performing middle school overall, according to USA News and World Report's annual rankings published last spring. We were also named just one of three DC schools as a 2021 National Blue Ribbon School by the US Department of Education. BASIS has a simple mission. We aim to get all of our students access to and into the universities of their dreams. With 100% of our students earning college admission and with our average graduating senior earning merit-based scholarship of around $190,000, even during the pandemic, I would humbly suggest that we are coming close to achieving our mission. However, there's always room for improvement and growth. Speaking of improvement and growth, during tours and open houses, I talk about our mission and the simple principles we adhere to. One of those is accountability. We hold ourselves accountable to our students, to our curriculum, um, and to our advanced coursework. We hold ourselves accountable to our parents and our community, ensuring top service to all students, regardless of background, economic standing, race, religion, creed, sexual orientation, gender, uh, disability clarification, or otherwise. We hold ourselves accountable when we try to provide a supportive workplace for our tireless and truly amazing teachers. I'm here today to talk about how we as a city can continue to hold ourselves accountable. How do we demonstrate to our students, families, and importantly, our teachers, that we, the city of Washington, DC, are investing in equitable and effective schools? All DC schools need a fiscal year 2023 budget that shows a commitment to adequate funding. We're really encouraged by Mayor Bowser's pledged support to increase universal per pupil funding to 5.9% but we need to do more to keep up with rising costs in the city. The social security cost of living adjustment also is 5.9% benchmarking inflation, inflation at a similar rate. So even if schools apply all of the proposed increase directly to payroll, school staff would see a marginal benefit compared to inflation. This ignores the pandemic recovery that we know will be ongoing for many years, programs that are funded also by per people funding. Teachers also deserve a direct investment. Around 30% of the teachers citywide left their positions last year, and our school, while not losing quite that much, definitely lost teachers as well. I worry this year will be worse. We should be providing incentives for teachers to stay in their schools, investing in our teacher training pipeline, and creating incentives for things like home buying and targeted tax credits, in addition to increasing the universal per student funding formula by as much as possible. Of course, facilities are also a concern. I will leave that for my written testimony, but you just heard about that. So please help families, students, teachers in our school, schools like ours by increasing the per pupil funding, providing real monetary incentives for teachers and fully funding public charter school facilities in an equitable manner. Again, that's in my written testimony. Thank you again for all of your time and helping us as a city state uh, be accountable for our own continued uh, academic success. And uh, I appreciate you giving me the time to test it out. Thank you, Mr. Rose Hennick. And I remember touring your school. Juan Oloa. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to provide input on the Duke Ellington School of the Arts education budget negotiations. Uh, last year, the council included language in the Budget Support Act, directing DCPS to negotiate with Ellington and a timeline for implementing in the current budget cycle. I'm grateful for the BSA language and for the one-time grant the council provided Ellington. Uh, this allowed many of our teachers to receive an appropriate and long overdue pay increase. I'm here today as an 11-year DCPS parent and Ward 2 resident. As such, I worry about the future of Ellington, given the recent comments and communication from Chancellor Farabee. 
and DC, uh, DC public schools. To hear DCPS negotiations characterized on NBC as, quote, plans to assume full operation of Duke Ellington School of the Arts is frustrating. Adding to my concern is learning that the chancellor added uh, during that piece that the district is, quote, currently in discussions with Ellington to create a plan for a smooth transition. This mischaracterization of the negotiations continues. In a recent Georgetown article, my council member, Brooke Pinto, had to clarify that neither she nor Ward 2 School Board Representative Chang had, quote, requested DCPS assume operational control of Duke Ellington. Now, I, I'm not directly involved in the negotiations with DCPS. There are others here today who can speak to that with more specificity. Despite the language in the BSA, DCPS has been dragging their feet throughout this entire process and is not forthcoming with the information needed for Ellington to negotiate properly. Frankly, I do not trust that DCPS is negotiating in the best interest of any student at Ellington. Ironically, DCPS is a partner organization of the Duke Ellington School of the Arts Project, DSAP, which, is, which oversees the operation of the school. I dare say if DCPS had been more, a more active partner over the last two decades, we wouldn't be in this situation today. I've stated many times before this committee that the problem is the DCPS funding model. Uh, the, the funding model ignores our arts curriculum entirely and does not budget for it. We serve all eight wards, although we're based in Ward 2, Wards 5, 6, 7, and 8 make up the largest portion of our student population. We're nationally ranked, and the statistics bear that out year after year. All I am asking is that the arts have a permanent place at Ellington. Help us get DCPS to the negotiating table in good faith, and more importantly, a word I've heard repeated constantly today, full transparency. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Loa. Xavier Thompson. <clears throat> I do not see him. Sheena Adams. I do not see her. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Xavier Thompson. I live in Ward 4 and I'm 15 and I'm a proud member of Duke Allenton School of the Arts and Instrumental Music. And thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm here because I'm concerned about the future sustainability of Duke Allenton School of the Arts, given some of the recent comments and communication from School Chancellor Farabee and DC Public Schools. I'm concerned because I haven't been at the school for a full year and it's already changed my life for the better. The school has helped me with my self-confidence issues and it's been helpful to be around other students dedicated to their arts. I've never had as many teachers in my core art and arts academic courses that have been active in making sure we know what we're doing and what they're teaching, how to apply the knowledge and skills. Some of the teachers are the type of people that you can go to when you're really in need of help. Allenton classes have already begun to improve my work. I studied French horn and I picked it up like a few months before school started and I've grown a whole lot. The family atmosphere that the department staff nurtures without me learn how to work in groups has instilled the importance of collective effort, has improved my discipline, and my teachers and classmates have helped me to gain more confidence. This has built my confidence and I know it will prepare me for leadership in the future. I'm also a self-taught piano player and developing my music production skills through Project Create, an out-of-school time, out time program. My theory classes at Ellington have helped me out so much. Sometimes it's recognizing what a key a song is in and a lot of other things like creating bass lines and melodies. As I consider my future goals, there are several classes that I want to assure are available to me, such as jazz tech and composition. I share this to, with you today because it's important that we maintain our pre-professional program and extended day. In this program, I received mentorship, increased exposure to more information and new skills and the time to practice 
and receive constructive feedback to improve my craft. It is also important that our teachers are paid well because, because I want to keep them all at the school. I have to admit, Ellington has been a real challenge for me, but it's the best challenge I've ever had to deal with. I would also offer my support for the paved parents, call for increased out of school time program and in school mental health supports and accountability. There are very few programs in the city for students my age, or I struggle to find them. I'm grateful for my instructors of Project Create and gladly travel for Southeast for what I'm able to learn from the music production classes and the working artists that run the class. I've also been able to make money from the Beats I created, participate in panel discussions for local music conferences, and this spring we'll be releasing an album that we've been working on for a minute. All students, especially in high school, need access to quality programs that allow us to see our way to our careers in adulthood. We need to know what we are learning that will be useful in our future. As students, we go through a lot and you never know what your classmates are going through. Negotiating friend drama, family drama, just figuring out how you're feeling on your day to day and even making sense of the conflict that goes around in the rest of the world. It's difficult to learn when you're stressed, worried, anxious or fearful. Some of my friends, school is their only safe space. All students need access to qualified mental health professionals to help us succeed. I'm grateful for my family and the support of counselors and teachers at my school. All students need to have access to trusted adults to help them learn important social emotional skills before a crisis happens. Thank you for letting me testify again. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Shana Adams. Good afternoon, everyone. Just as Brown versus Board of Education alone could not completely eradicate segregation in this country, the same can be said for Bowling versus Sharp within the city. Today, I am here to, employ, to implore you to make the change to completely remove segregation from DC's public schools once and for all. Wilson is one of the most diverse schools in the district with the white and black populations being nearly equal. However, when I first entered the school in 2018, I was in an on-level pre-calculus class that was all black. When I switched to the honors pre-calculus class about two weeks later, I was faced with a predominantly white classroom in which there was only one other black student. The next year, I was the only black student in my AP Calculus BC class. This blatant racial divide is not a coincidence nor a one or two time occurrence. It is a trend that impacts students relentlessly. Last year, as co-founder of MAP, I partnered with students, teachers, and administration at my school to implement an an initiative that would destroy this racial divide. We wanted to remove on-level US history and English three from the curriculum and have all students take AP US history and AP English language composition. This AP for all initiative would have helped to restore equality within the school. However, DCPS shot this down, preserving racial segregation. I understand that not everyone is a fan of the AP for all initiative, but not liking one treatment is no reason to sit back and allow an infected wound to continue to fester. In addition to the AP for All initiative, I would like to propose another solution to the committee, AP for none. If the option between on-level and AP and honors classes is permitting racial segregation to continue, the most simple solution is to get rid of the option itself, AP for all or AP for none. Now the choice is yours. To close, I want to explicitly state that neither AP for all, for all nor AP for none will completely solve the issue of the racial divide within DCPS. Anyone who has walked into a school in Ward 8 and one in Ward 4 will know this. AP for all and AP for none will not completely solve the problem, but it is certainly a great start. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Casey Boyd. Uh, good afternoon. I'm sorry, am I mute? I can hear you. There's a little echo. Oh, wow. Um, do you have should more I come back? On, do you have um, more than one computer tuned into this uh, hearing? No, I can go out and come back in. Okay, yeah. why don't you try that? Okay. I'll come back to you. Uh, Michelle Dunkley? Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Members of the DC City Council Performance Oversight Committee. My name is Michelle Dunkley. I'm a proud first year student at Duke Ellington School of the Arts, and I'm here to take 
in the literary media and communications department. Duke Ellington has given me opportunities that no other school would have been able to offer. In just my first year, I finished a short film that was edited myself and filmed by my classmates. We had our film played in our LMC showcase to a large audience and pushed to compete in a national competition. This department has proven to have the necessary connections to help us succeed. A critical part of this success is our dual curriculum program. It allows the arts to be tied into both our core classes and the arts components. And our school has 98 to 100% graduation rate, which is well above the DCPS average. Thanks to the innovative curriculum and our school's very attentive administrators, I look forward to joining my classmates and attending college with their scholarships. However, to keep our future secure, we need all the grownups to work together, specifically the Duke Ellington School of the Arts Project Board and DCPS need to work together in good faith and transparency. We need a long-term commitment to preserve my school's innovative structure with teachers who are real artists, not generalists who read, from, read to us from old textbooks. We need to make sure that our school gets enough money to keep running like it's supposed to run. Duke Ellington is one of the crown jewels in the DCPS system, and it shines with children from all wards. We have amazing talent that my classmates have shown time and time again. However, without the proper funding, we are limited to what we can accomplish. Finally, regardless of how you decide, I want to say how thankful I am for the hard work that DCPS has done for the past two years. COVID-19 has made everyone's lives more difficult, but it's been difficult for the people that run the schools too. To this committee, DCPS, and the Duke Ellington School of the Arts Administration, no, thank you for all delay. you've done. I can't. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dunkey. Give me just... Thank you again, Ms. Dunkley. Uh, Ron Sacco, uh, uh, now I see Casey Boyd is back. Let's try again. Ms. Boyd? Okay, do I sound better now? You sound gorgeous. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. And of course, good afternoon. Um, to, uh, we really want, I really want to represent the voice of the DCPS librarian. Um, council members, it's my request to each and every one of you today to pass leg legislation for the student's right to read amendment. Uh, this historic action will ensure that school libraries in DCPS will be provided for all students, regardless of zip code and run by full-time certified librarians. By passing this bill, DCPS will also attract the much needed talent and send an indelible message that school library programs are supported and valued in this district. Numerous research studies have been conducted about the impact of students having access to school library programs and a certified school librarian. Consider the research of these scholars who have conducted research studies for school districts across the country that are very similar to DCPS. Dr. Stephen Krashen states, access to a school library results in more reading and children who are readers will develop acceptable levels of literacy. Dr. Keith Curry Lance states that test scores are higher where certified school librarians are used as literacy leaders in-service professional development providers, as curriculum designers, and as technology innovators. Next month, DCPS librarians will be celebrating School Library Month, just like many school librarians across the country. Every April, school librarians across this district host activities to help their school and their local community celebrate the essential role that school libraries strong school library programs play in transforming learning. I encourage all of you to visit a DCPS school library during this month of April and observe the dedicated full-time librarians in action. You will find a committed library practitioner that impacts the entire school community academically, supports our students' emotional needs, and challenges them with print and technology integration that ex expands their learning. DCPS must provide exemplary school library programs run by full-time certified librarians to ensure that the generations of students 
will receive resources and will help them succeed in life. You, the council members of the DC Council, can hold DCPS accountable in doing so. You, the, the council members, hold the keys in making this a reality. I ask again that you please pass the student's right to read amendment to protect the future of our children. Thank you for your time and urgency in addressing this matter. Thank you, Ms. Boy. Ron Sokolov. Yes, uh, oops, that's me. Um, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Mendelson, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Ron Sokolov. I'm a 24 year DC resident and a parent of three DCPS students in third, fourth, and eighth grade. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about DCPS's special education program um, and our experience there and highlight three areas I encourage the council uh, to explore and investigate. Uh, this is a personal matter for my family as our middle son who's in fourth grade has significant intellectual deficits and he is in an ILS class, uh, classroom at Ludlow Taylor in Ward 6 where we live. Um, the past two months have been particularly stressful for my family on top of the stress that everyone has been dealing with with uh, the pandemic. Um, in December, we learned from our teacher about DCPS's realignment plan for special ed in DCPS. And this plan was apparently um, created three years ago, uh, but I and my school and the teachers only learned about this, um, that they're going to kick out the ILS and the ELS programs at Lolo Taylor and reassign the students to other schools in December. So in the midst of everything going on and, and the disruption that special education um, that all students, um, including special education students, have um, faced, DCPS is saying now we're going to kick these kids out and assign them to another school. And I want to emphasize without any family, school, or teacher input or advance or re any real advance notice, and I'll get into that in a moment. Um, through a community-wide campaign that involved parents uh, of Ludlow Taylor, we we're able to um, get a reprieve for one year for one of the classrooms. There are three points I want to raise today. First, DCPS does not, in our experience, start with the needs of special education students when making decisions. And I'm re referring to DCPS downtown, not the school. Um, and second, their communication to special education families is extremely lacking, to put it nicely. And third, I'm formally asking the DC Council to investigate DCPS's realignment plan. I'm actually only going to hit on two of these in the interest of time. Um, with, the, with respect to the needs of special education students and putting their needs first, from the moment a special education child enter, a child enters a special education program at DCPS, our experience and anecdotally from speaking to a number of other parents, um, the child is treated more as a number than a person. We have no input into what school they will go to. We have no input into whether that school is the right fit whatsoever. When our son turned three, he was assigned to a school, which is a terrible fit, and we left DCPS for a charter school to come back to Ludlow Taylor, which has been an amazing experience thanks to, thanks to the two teachers there. But from the beginning, he was not, we were not engaged and involved in that decision. The realignment plan, which I know the next speaker witness is gonna to speak to, so if I could just ask for 30 seconds extra here, was created three years ago to move students with the supposed intent of having transparency from elementary school to middle school to high school. It was, not, was done with no input from the community, no input from the schools, no teachers, no administrators that we are aware of at all. And when we had a presentation on it from DCPS, which I fought hard to get, it was talked about literally from the perception of numbers. We need these numbers and we need to do that and we need to reallocate. Not once in the presentation were, were, were these students referenced as humans and as people. I think that this is something that's in its third year of implementation has caused in this whole issue that we've been dealing with. And I strongly encourage the council to, to, to speak to DCPS about it and understand what they're doing, how they've gone about it. And it's, it's Thank you, real Mr. Cool. Thank you. Sorry to cut you off. I don't have a copy of your statement and that would be helpful. I will, I will absolutely send that to you. Thank you. Thank you for Please. your time. Uh, Joy Harrington. Hi, I'm Joy Harrington. My husband, Roy Harrington Jr. and I live in Ward 8 with our uh, twins, Marsalis and Herson. This is my son, Marsalis. And this is my daughter, Herson. We're talking about living, breathing children, real people, not numbers, not data. 
Our children are both autistic. They both attend Ludlow Taylor Elementary. They're first graders there. My daughter is in the ELS program at Ludlow Taylor led by Janice Joseph, the teacher. And our son was granted admission this year through the lottery and through sibling preference because she was there first. It took a lot to get both of our children into one school and not just one school, but one with a high quality SPED program and a welcoming inclusive school community. But DCPS central office doesn't seem to care. As Ron uh, Sokolov, a fellow parent, was just talking about with this realignment plan, they're gonna close my daughter's PLS classroom at Ludlow Taylor, and the ILS classroom is slated to close last next year. Our school is gonna lose those classes, those students, and two very beloved and effective teachers, Ms. Joseph and Mr. Christopher Newhouse in ILS. This is Hurston in her class at uh, Ms. Taylor's class in Ms. Um, Joseph's classroom, um, helping with the morning meeting, which she enjoys doing, where she's developed a lot of confidence, has gotten really good at math. And our plan was to have her complete second grade with Miss Joseph and be ready for general education in third grade next year. DCPS doesn't seem to care. This is the second time that this realignment program that I didn't know anything about has disrupted my daughter's education and forced us to have to move her to another school. As Mr. Sokolov pointed out, the Ludlow Taylor community put up a fight. We petitioned Chancellor Faraby um, and the, in the central office to keep the ELS and ILS classrooms at Ludlow Taylor. Uh, we met with uh, Corinne Colgan and Regina Grimmett and other staff members. And when they explained or tried to explain the program to us, they didn't answer the two most pertinent questions. Why is this happening? And is there anything we can do about it? The plan as we were, as explained to us, as Ron pointed out, was that there was no family, no teacher, no principal input whatsoever. It's unclear how DCPS decided to disperse these students other than they tried to assign them as classes closest to home. As a SPED parent, I can tell you that if a child is in a classroom that's working, we don't care where it is in the district, we make it work. So that proximity argument is of no help to us whatsoever. We're in Ward 8, we don't have any difficulty getting our kids to LTE, which is in Ward 6. My fear is that this plan is just going to entrench segregation throughout DCPS. And whatever the school's intention, whatever the central office's intention is, they're hamstringing both Ludlow Taylor and our SPED students. This is a school that demanded that it keep its SPED program because it was working and the children were integral to the community. DCPS doesn't seem to care. So along with Ron, I am asking um, for what a lot of people have been asking for today, transparency. I want transparency about this realignment program, the point, the purpose, its effects, and what fat parents can do if they want to petition for different classes and situations for their children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harrington. Maria Jones. Hello, uh, I can't see the clock, so I'm gonna just start it. Thank you, good afternoon. My name is Maria P. Jones and I'm a Ward 5 resident. My daughter graduated from Duke Ellington in 2021 and is now attending Temple University where she is in the College of Theater and Media Arts. She's doing very well academically and in her major. This is due in large part to the amazing preparation that she received at Duke Ellington School of the Arts TDP department. When she came to Duke Ellington as a freshman in 2017, we vividly remember Mayor Bowser celebrating side by side with Ellington founder Peggy Cooper Kafritz as the brand new renovated school in Georgetown reopened that fall. Everything seemed promising as Mayor Bear Bowser cheerfully escorted Ms. Kafritz down the broad halls of the new school. Ms. Kafritz met Ellington students regularly, giving them her phone number and telling them to call if they needed any help with anything. She reiterated the mission of the academic and artistic institution to provide arts education for all of the children in Washington, D.C., particularly those in need. Then, on February 18, 2018, Peggy suddenly died and she was barely in the grave. We were still mourning that loss. And yet, just 10 short days later, with no respect for the deceased, out of nowhere, Asi appears unannounced at the school, illegally seizing sensitive student files. We had to fight the racist assault of Asi, unfairly attacking the school, the students, the families with its lies, accusing 300 children of residency fraud. Turns out only 25 students were guilty of this violation. It was the students and parents that had to fight. Mayor Bowser was nowhere to be found. She did not protect 
our children, her youngest constituents. Can you imagine? I do remember some of the council members who were there for us. Thank you, Robert Wright, Trayon Wright, Charles Allen, and Phil Mendelson and others. We did sue Asi. Asi lost the lawsuit. The judge demanded that Asi would be forced to follow the U.S. Constitution and grant students and families due process. We saved the school from closure by insisting on the truth. Asi never apologized for his false accusations accusations for bad-mouthing the school through the media with their untruths and attempting to ruthlessly displace hundreds of D.C. students from their high school. This was a cowardly assault because they waited until Peggy died because if she were alive, she would have come for them. So did they, good counsel. We need for you all to guarantee that you will uphold Peggy's mission of providing quality arts education to all children of Washington, D.C. Because as we speak, it is being jerked away from the people. They are killing its autonomy. They're weighing it down with bureaucracy. We have DC Public Schools, Asi, Chairwoman Chair, uh, Mary Che, have built up a case against this school so that they can justify its theft, its delivery to the children and entitled folks of Ward 3. But counsel, those of you of good conscience, please serve all of these children in this city. Do not throw out what Pe Peggy has built and whom she built it for. We do not want to look up and five years later, Duke Ellington will be a neighborhood school for Wilson's overflow with very little black children from east of the river. You know the contributions of Duke Ellington. I don't even have to go into how Duke Ellington has positively impacted this city, the region, the nation, and the world. Um, please, we urge you to take a second look Look at the phenomenal history of the school, what it has done for the families of Washington, D.C., but also study the pattern of sabotage of DCPS, city agencies, and neighborhood groups. This taking of Ellington somehow feels like residual from the same racist city codes that forced Black residents out of Georgetown in the 50s. Please tell me how it's different. Peggy P Cooper Cavers, we have you on speed dial. We need a celestial intervention, people of Washington, D.C., Call your public schools, 202-442-5885. Tell them and the council to respect Duke Ellington by negotiating fair Ms. and square, please. Thank I you so, so much, you, Chairman Minson. But you're you. more than a minute over your time, and no, you might we, get the I intervention. Thank you. you. It's worth it, though, right? And you might get the intervention from the living. Yes. Let's hope I'm so. going Let's to, see. I'm told that there's a meeting of the board, so I'm going to um, just Call Ebony Rose Thompson, move her up like four slots. Uh, so Ms. Thompson, if you could speak, then we can let you go. Okay, thank you. I greatly appreciate that. Our state board meeting starts in nine minutes. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. Uh, my name is Ebony Rose Thompson, and I'm humbled to represent War 7 on the state board of education. Uh, first on DCPS budget oversight, uh, the question I ask and I encourage you to ask is, do these changes to our school funding formula result in greater equity uh, and stability? I asked this question to both the chancellor and our budget panel at the SBOE meeting and got two very different answers. From the chancellor, I got a resounding yes. Um, from the panel, that was Mary Levy, Chelsea Coffin, uh, budget director, Jim Bodoff, uh, and one of our ANC uh, commissioners in War 7, Antoine Holmes. Uh, they pretty much told me absolutely not. Uh, it is possible they're both right. Unfortunately, we won't know until we see what it looks like as the rubber meets the road with individual schools. And when we see how the ESSER spending um, hits, which was not included in school budgets. This is the first year uh, I participated in the Woodson LSAT and I have been part of a conversation about cuts. Uh, still, we need to ensure the base amount of the UPSFF is keeping pace with both the adequacy study and inflation. We also await the increase in the at-risk weight. Uh, these investments are crucial at any point in time, but especially at an unprecedented time with unprecedented needs. That was the purpose of the ESSER funds, and we need to know more about how those have been and continue to be spent, uh, which leads me to a few cross-sector matters. 
Uh, we're still not doing enough around planning. The opening, closing, and siting of schools needs greater coordination and transparent citywide goals that feed a vision to ensure all children receive the education they deserve. Uh, the two-room schoolhouse that the DCPSB approved earlier this year makes me yet again question, what is it we're guaranteeing to all students? A nurse, a librarian, special education supports, no matter what needs students show up with, the promise of an attractive academic program is insufficient. If we have learned one thing from the pandemic, it is that to successfully support students, schools must be equipped to deal with issues that go beyond, beyond schoolhouse doors. In this vein, I support the calls for increasing school-based mental health resources, digital equity, and safe passage efforts. I also implore the council to consider increasing funding for literacy initiatives, both for adults and for children. In Ward 7, we have some of the highest illiter illiteracy rates in the city. I've been hearing organizations like Washington Literacy Council are in great need of funding. Um, and for our three adult facing orgs that remain, channeling about, I don't know, 500K to Aussie could result in a priceless, life changing investment for students they serve in communities like the one I represent. Third, I testified in this morning's DGS oversight hearing. I asked the committee members to imagine if our normal was every student in every part of the city walking into a beautiful, affirming state of the art space built for them to learn and grow. I can imagine it and I have no doubt you can too. A few stops on that path, uh, fixing the Marvin Gaye playground, uh, thinking about Burville, Plummer and Kelly Miller never worrying about their HVAC needs again, resolving the plumbing and draining, drainage issues at CW Harris and Woodson and Ann Beers having working sprinklers and finally being ADA compliant. Uh, how am I doing on time? I am all the way over. Uh, the last thing I'll say uh, is that I hope uh, the council, so I won't worry about it because Kimba said I'm over. So uh, thank you uh, for moving me up. I will submit written testimony, um, and I, I don't know if I'm here to answer questions. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to hold you for questions, uh, and I appreciate that you said you will submit your testimony in writing. That'd be useful to us because we could follow up on some of those DGS issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Sheila Carson Carr. Yes, good evening. Hello, I'm ready. Good, good afternoon. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Mendelson and the members of the Committee of the Whole for this opportunity to testify today. My name is Sheila Carson Carr and I'm a Ward 7 resident and a Coded Dyslexia co-founder. The Coded Dyslexia DC and its members thank you wholeheartedly for your wisdom and vision in enacting and funding DC law 23-191 addressing dyslexia and reading difficulty just over a year ago. This legislation calls for raising awareness among all teachers throughout the public and charter school system about the identification of students with reading difficulties, all K through two students to be screened yearly and for early educators to be retrained and prepared for teaching reading using curricula based in the science of reading. Finally, this legislation calls for a timely progress reporting to parents and to the council. In short, this, legisl this legislation represents a sea change in how children are taught to read in the District of Columbia. And once fully implemented, we reduce the number of students who require special aid and private placement. Tens of thousands of our children do not develop proficient reading skills, particularly children of color and those reading at risk. Park's 2019 test results shows 63% of DCPS and charter students are below proficiency, uh, proficient, proficient. And also according to 2019, RC students with um, disability landscape analysis, 90% of students with special need and 95% of those at risk are below um, proficient in reading. These students make up a vast majority of the DC school students. As promising as the dyslexia reading difficulty legislation is, however, it is, will only be as effective the, to the degree to which those responsible for implementation are given the tools and power to do so. The reading dyslexia law section 103 part B, beginning with school year 2022 and every day after, each educator employed by LEA, including those who receive training pursuant to the subsection A, shall uh, 
complete awareness training on reading difficulty provided by RC. We are pleased that RC has hit the ground running, even when without having the person who oversees the implementation of dyslexia law. However, as the law was given, as however, as the law was written now, does not have any empowerment or power to ensure that DCPS and charter school will comply. We're asking that this enforcement gap be addressed as soon as possible. The children do not have the luxury of time. These, these need, they need RC and LEA to get it right, right from the start. We're asking the council to ensure this legislation implemented in both by the letter and the spirit. We duly, with due accountability, DC, the code selected is ready to partner with RC to ensure success. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carson Carr, and uh, thank you for your uh, advocacy on this issue. Uh, thank you. Shata White Whittle, I don't believe she's here. Terry Ewart, I don't believe she's here. Kiara Childs. Kiara Childs. Thank you. I'm coming. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, good afternoon. My name is Kiara Childs. And my daughter Peyton is a first grader in Friendship Public Charter School online. I'm speaking here today because it's important for my child and thousands of other families across the city who have chosen to do virtual learning or who has homeschooled to also have access to both face-to-face interpersonal connections and real life communities outside of virtual spaces. I live in Anacostia where at times it feels like violent incidents always happen. But I'm especially concerned about having a space where my daughter will feel both physically and emotionally safe. We all know kids need safe places to learn, play, and become active members of their community. I feel like there has always been issues, but for the most part, I had these things growing up in the district and I want like the same for her. I'm here advocating for the district to provide 25 million to OST funding for the district to provide dedicated funds for before, school, after school, and summer and winter programs. I'm also calling for you to redesign the call structures and requirements for vouchers, financial aid that lower income families can get the access they need. Over almost one half a district, a DC student, sorry, 45% is an OST program, but participation varies with funding. Those in low income, low income families are less likely than those in high income families to participate at all. Our family often go out of state, Maryland, and to private institutions for our OST needs. That's because there are just large variety, not a large variety of programs available in my area. Peyton is at the age where she needs opportunity for social and emotional learning. I like to see more programs with activities where she can learn useful skills and learn how to interact with other kids and adults. I like to see the DPR summer and after school program, both at schools and recreation centers, as a home away from home for the kids in the city. A lot of young people need help mentoring, but are afraid to ask. When we have community of adults that know them personally are and are invested in helping to guide them, they will also have a low chance of getting in trouble. When I think of what I wanna see from the district terms of family and community engagement, I want to prioritize making sure that parents are in the loop and decision making not just one-time basis, but throughout the process especially in cases of responding when negative incidents occur. The city gets a lot of money in terms of partnership, but it's not. It's more about the funds. We need to make sure the money is going to where it will make the best and serve the most families. We need to develop our community and help it grow. Thank you for allowing me to testify and share what I want to see for our kids and our district. Thank you, Ms. Childs. Renee White. Yana Sutton. Lori Carter. Emily Thomas DeWolf.
Maria Almado Malagan. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for letting me to testify today. I'm Maria Almedo Malagon. I am the mother of a fourth grader and a pre-K-3 student at Langley Elementary. I'm also president of the School Parent Teacher Association. This is our fifth year at Langley. My daughter Sarah started there in kindergarten. Langley is a school full of exceptional teachers and staff, committed families, and lots of love. Our school motto is in this place you are loved, and it is true. Everyone feels love in our community. Langley Elementary is a community that welcomes everyone. We are working class families, middle class, families dealing with homelessness. We are Black, white, Hispanic, Asians, immigrants, not immigrants, girls, boys, and non-binary. And we work in Langley all together. But there's so much that love can do. Uh, our school building is in dire need of repairs. The floor with our cafeteria and gym doesn't have a working bathroom. So kids and teachers have to walk two flights of stairs to wash their hands or use the restroom during meals or during PE. We have a large special education edu uh, population. And I have seen teachers and aides carrying special needs students up to two flights of stairs to use the restroom. Is this how children in such a privileged city have to live? Is this how children in a pandemic have to live where they can wash their hands next to the room where they eat breakfast and lunch? That's unacceptable. We are grateful for the much needed roof and bathroom repairs that our building had had in the last year, but it took a lot of time. Some work orders go months without attention and there is very little transparency on how work projects are prioritized or who decides what is considered urgent. We were grateful that the major included money in her latest budget for HVAC upgrades for Langley. In the summer, our kids and teachers swelter and in the winter they freeze. We hope the process of getting that installed can move along smoothly so that you can start the work as soon as school is out in the summer, which is the only time the work can happen because the students aren't in the building. If the project gets caught in the bureaucracy and is delayed, we have to wait an entire year to get the HVAC upgrades that our students and teachers need. We are also grateful that DCPS was able to finally install an elevator in our five-story building, and we are hopeful we can start to use it very soon. But we still have five nine spaces with worn, outdated carpet that has been there for years. Our halls always desperately need a fresh coat of paint. One of my fellow moms attended Langley uh, about 30 years ago, and she said that it's still looking exactly the same. That's not okay. We have had discussions about a full renovation, and we were told that one for our school would not be available until, and listen to this, one of my fellow born members, unborn child, she's currently pregnant, <laughs> go to middle school. That is not okay. That means that we have to wait over 10 years for a full renovation for our school. We know that we have to wait for the full modernization based on current law, even if it's not okay. But there are updates and repairs that can be done right now that will make a huge difference in our school communities. These aren't projects that the PTO and community members should not be expected to do for ourselves. We currently need it for our staff, family, and, co and communities. Today, on behalf of Langley Elementary Children, I respectfully ask you to step for our students and our teachers and install a bathroom next to our cafeteria, update our carpeting, and paint our hallways. Install the HVAC in a timely manner, and take care of these small projects that will make a world of a difference for our school. We love our school and we want our school building to better reflect the amazing work that our teachers and students do every day. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Amado Malaga. Uh, Emily Thomas DeWolf. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks, Maria, for your testimony. I'm going to follow up on that. Maria is one of the, my fellow parents and friends at Langley Elementary. Um, my name is Emily Thomas. My daughter, Florence, is in kindergarten at Langley Elementary, and it's our local neighborhood school in Ward 5. This is our family's third year at Langley, and I can't wait to send my son there next year. We absolutely love it. And our love for Langley started with the strong community that we found here. It's a really close-knit and diverse group of families. We're 70% Black, 12% Hispanic. 16% white, 2% Asian. We're a Title I school and every kid qualifies for free breakfast and lunch. We have the highest percent special needs students in a neighborhood school in the district and over half of our kids are considered at risk and 9% experience homelessness. 
But we've made really huge leaps forward these past couple of years at Langley. We have a great new conscious discipline program and Langley is really a school on the rise. One of the things that does really concern families constantly is the condition of the school facilities and building. And our teachers and staff have really moved mountains to make the classrooms cheerful and safe, but the communal spaces in the school, particularly the bathrooms and the hallways are really not up to an acceptable standard. The hallways need repainting. Ceiling tiles are missing in bathrooms as a result of leaks that have been ongoing for a, a while. Children spot rodents and roaches in the building because of these holes. And worst of all, kids have no place to wash their hands or use the restroom on the floor with their cafeteria and gym. They have to walk up two flights of stairs, as Maria said, to find a working bathroom. It's unsanitary, it's an added burden to the teachers who have to escort them. And behind me, you see the broken and decrepit bathroom that we're asking to have refurbished into a clean and working bathroom. There are funds available to make this happen, small capital repair funds. It's just a matter of prioritizing our students. Langley families have stepped up. We write and win grants. We maintain the playground and our beautiful garden. We fundraise. With over half of our students being at risk, our community cannot fundraise the hundreds of thousands of dollars it would take to refurbish our bathrooms or every single hallway. DCPS does need to maintain our facility to a basic standard level of sanitation and safety, a standard that we see at other schools, but not at Langley. And it's also a retention issue. We're surrounded, Langley is surrounded by charter schools with superior facilities. And we watch families move to charters, not because of the teachers or the test scores, but because the facilities are nicer. And we don't wanna see our neighborhood school neglected. And this isn't unique to Langley. A parent at Burroughs in Ward 5 sent me images of leaking pipes and falling plaster, a long list of unresolved work orders and a bro broken HVAC like at Langley. And her first grader had to wear a coat in her classroom this winter which is really, really unacceptable for these kids. Unkept facilities do not send a message to our kids that they're prioritized, important, and valued by our city. And Ward 3 schools do not look like this. And Ward 2 schools don't look like this. Schools should be a refuge for our kids, particularly the most vulnerable ones. I'm respectfully asking that funds be allocated for the small capital improvements that we need at Langley Elementary to make this a place where every student feels valued and safe and loved. And I just want to close out by saying I really appreciate the time to testify at this hearing. And I just want to mention that having a full day to spend on Zoom is a privilege and really not accessible and feasible to everyone. And I wish that this wasn't the only way to get things done. But thank you so much for uh, hearing my testimony. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Uh, and you go by Ms. Uh, Thomas, not DeWolf. Yes, either's fine. OK, well, thank you. And I have to say, um, if I didn't know um, Zoom technology, I would say you were the first witness we've had at a hearing ever who testified from a bathroom. Um, and I don't, I really shouldn't be making light of it because uh, yeah, I get the point. Thank are, you, sir. Are the issues with Langley more about just making it a bit more decent before it goes through a full modernization or is it problems with ongoing maintenance? I think it's twofold. So there's ongoing maintenance and then there's getting it up to a certain standard. So Langley has had some small improvements over the past years, which then bumped us to the back of the line after the peace legislation, which we support, but again, it bumped us to the back of the line. And so we, as Maria mentioned, aren't scheduled for a full modernization for a long time. So it's maintenance issues, but largely these bathrooms and the issues that you see behind you are um, things that would need capital improvements, I believe. And, and that's exactly right. We, we need a full modernization. My daughter, who has been there since kindergarten, just stepped next to me and asked if Emily was showing the adult bathroom, which she say, and I quote, yes, that's the adult bathroom, which is a slightly worse than our bathroom, which the, reflecting that they have, the kids have working bathrooms, but I'm not going to say that they are ideal. They are just working bathrooms. And again, they don't even have a bathroom for either adults or kids in the cafeteria floor That's or, or the PE floor. It's, it's zero. I think we would love to have a full modernization sooner than we are, we are expected. We understand the rules. We don't love them, but we understand the rules. However, we need certain small projects that we know that could be done relatively quickly relatively soon before we keep losing families, before it keeps being such a terrible process for, for our student population, especially our special education students. I think it's unbelievable what they have to deal every day. One more thing I'm so sorry uh, is that I just wanna say 
by the time this school gets fully renovated, it's gonna have really gentrified and changed. And the students that need it the most and are very deserving are here now. And so we'd like to see this happen for students that are attending now for you know, our more vulnerable students as there's more and more you know, change happening in our schools. You know, by the time it gets a full modernization, the school's gonna look different. Yeah, uh, make a good point there. Uh, I will, um, I'll put it on the list of schools for me to visit to uh, look at firsthand at the facilities. I don't know how quickly I'll be able to get to the school. My staff informed you I got a few that are already on the list. Uh, do you have the same, how long has your principal been there? This is her second year. Second year. Okay. Because I think I visited uh, about three or four years ago. Um, thank you. I do have a couple of questions for other folks. Um, uh, Shana Adams, uh, if you're still here. Uh, yes, I'm still here. Um, I was kind of struck by the AP for all or AP for none. Why not instead trying to get more diversity in the AP classes? Yes, that's also um, a very possible solution. The only issue is that because there are so many factors that go into um, getting diversity into the AP classes, um, it, it can be a difficult. And I feel like it is like if that's the role that um, DCPS or whoever wants to take, I am definitely here to support it. I just wanted to for the testimony just to give like the most simple solution that I could come up with. But it is definitely possible to um, take things as they are and just to continue to promote more diversity. Yes. Uh, well, I think ultimately that's what we want is we want diversity instead of to um, eliminate uh, programs. Thank you for your testimony. I had one other question uh, for Julie Lawson, if she's still here. I'm here. Um, this might be a little unfair for me to ask this question of you earlier. There was quite a bit of testimony regarding Tuesdale, and I believe one of the witnesses suggested that what DCPS could do for swing space is to use the field at uh, Coolidge. And I think in your testimony, you said that you have been involved with the Coolidge community. Um, do you have any thoughts on swing space? And if that's unfair, then just dodge the question. No need to dodge. Um, we have a lot of conversations between Truesdale, LaSalle Bacchus, and Whittier because all of us are very community focused schools and all are on the modernization list for the next maybe seven or eight years. And part of the reason that we're staggered out is because of the lack of swing space. There's only that one facility at Sharp. Um, Truesdale is supposed to go to Garnet Patterson down in Shaw, Logan Circle, which is way out of the neighborhood and is not even ADA accessible or compliant. Um, so, you know, I've been thinking about all of these places. We had a school facility that was up for sale last summer, and I asked DCPS to look into purchasing it to use as board for East swing space, um, but Friendship bought it instead um, to expand their campus. Um, we have a, it was the former Hope Lamond public charter school on Kansas and North Capitol Northeast. <laughs> Um, but um, so I really would urge that instead of planning around planning our modernization schedule around the availability of buildings that aren't even in the neighborhood to be, we have all this infrastructure money coming in. Can it be used to acquire a building or a property or build modular on open space that the district already owns to be used for all of these schools to both speed them up, but also keep those communities intact. And I would welcome as you, uh, plan a trip to Langley to have you also come to Whittier. Um, I will add, you asked me about the Coolidge connection. The fields that we are looking at and that um, the Truesdell parents referenced are actually the DPR fields outside of the Coolidge Stadium. Okay, and I'm guessing that they're used quite a bit. Uh, they were prior to the pandemic and then, well, right before the pandemic, they were renovated. The fields themselves were redone to be regraded and have better drainage and lighting. Um, the grass is all a mess again. Um, and with the pandemic, they weren't used that much. I'll note that the, well, we're proud to have Senator Satchel Page, which is our neighborhood Little League team, finally got the permits to use Bryce Harper Field. The majority of the permits for Little League on that field are for the... Um, 
the Capital City Little League, which serves Ward 3. And my son would ask me when he was playing Little League, why do I have to drive past all these other kids who don't live in the neighborhood playing on the field across from my school and we have to drive to Fort Lincoln? Where is the Bryce Harper Field? Bryce Harper Field is next to the Tacoma Aquatic Center. Oh, okay. We are very blessed with a great open space in Tacoma and um, I feel that we could be better using it for the community benefit. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, each of you, for your testimony. Thank you. Appreciate uh, the time you all put into this, and uh, the testimony is helpful. Uh, with that, you are excused, and I'm going to call the next uh, group of uh, witnesses. I'm working off of page eight of the witness list. Uh, Donovan Holly, who's a teacher, Community Education Research Group. Dominic Spencer, who's director of Jubilee Jump, Jumpstart. Angel Wood, Woodley, or Angel Woodley, uh, teacher at Kitty University. Dane Anderson, chief operating officer at KIPP DC. Vera Brinkley, chief of staff at DC Prep. Kenyon Weaver, Maury Lelsat, parent representative. Carlene Reed, who's an elected representative to the State Board of Education, uh, representing Ward 8. Renee Powell, Mary McCain, who's with PAVE, Ward 8 PLE board member. Nikki Mulugeta, who's a student at Duke Ellington School of the Arts. Renee Davis, who's a PAVE citywide board member. Steve Beam, a DCPS parent. Lakeisha battle Krim, who's a PAVE citywide board member. Flor Baruca, Nora Lopez. Uh, I have Les, Les Esther Johnson, but she already testified. Marie Tata, uh, the next uh, group of folks are all from the Young Women's Project. Marie Tata, Jean Pierre Roberts, or Jean Pierre Roberts, Carmen Brito. Trayvon Smallwood, Juliana Lopez, Brianna Jenkins, Chase Cunningham, Navia Bright, I'm gonna keep going, Cyan Teckle, Kaylin Leak, Danielle Bigby. All those folks are with the Young Women's Project. Rukwaya Anbar Shaheen, who's with DC Action, and One more, I believe Suzanne Wells. Give me a moment. Uh, I'm actually going to start with Suzanne Wells. Um, everyone has three minutes. If you are in gallery view, you should be able to see the clock in the top row of your screen. Please be mindful of the time. Uh, Ms. Wells, sorry to keep you waiting. Thank you. My name is Suzanne Wells, and I'm the president of the Ward 6 Public Schools Parent Organization. I first want to discuss DCPS's handling of COVID. On the whole, I believe DCPS did a good job of balancing bringing students back into school buildings with safety precautions to protect students and staff from COVID. However, I believe DCPS was woefully inadequate in addressing concerns of families who did not feel safe in sending their children back to the classroom, either because their children were not vaccinated or because they had immunocompromised family members. Unfortunately, there simply were not enough virtual learning opportunities for these families. This led to families having to organize for more virtual learning opportunities, DCPS arguing against the legitimate concerns of these families, and the council having to pass legislation for DCPS to create more virtual learning opportunities. This could have been avoided if DCPS had been more open to expanding virtual learning opportunities. 
Second, I wanna discuss DCPS's development of a new budget model. We knew for quite a while that DCPS was planning changes to the comprehensive staffing model. We had a very reasonable ask that DCPS show us before final decisions are made on the budget model, what the school budgets would be under the comprehensive staffing model and under the new model. Being able to compare the budgets would lead to greater understanding of the different budgeting approaches. DCPS simply refused to show comparisons of the two models. That decision alone led to less understanding of the new budget model and did not engender trust. Schools have now received their initial budget allocations. What has become clear from our member schools is that many schools whose budgets allow them to keep their current staff are only able to do so because of COVID recovery funds that were added to the school budgets. We are very concerned about the budget cuts that are expected next year when the COVID recovery funds are not available. We are also seeing that at-risk dollars are having to be used to cover school-wide positions because some schools are simply not receiving the funds they need to maintain their current staff. In closing, I want to urge the funding of two initiatives our organization has long supported, the work of digital equity in DC education and outdoor education. We urge the mayor to invest in robust technology supports and infrastructure for DCPS to address the digital divide. We also urge the mayor to address to invest in programs like food prints that provide garden-based learning and hands-on experiences our students deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wells. Uh, Donovan Holly. I'm looking to see, I don't see Donovan Holly here. Dominique Spencer. Hello, I'm here. Please proceed. Good afternoon, Councilman Mendelson and members of the committee. My name is Dominique Spencer and I am the Director of Education Services at Jubilee Jumpstart. Jubilee Jumpstart is a nonprofit NACI accredited center that provides dual language with an emphasis on Spanish language to children six weeks to five years old, located in Ward 1 in the Adams Morgan neighborhood. As a member of Under 3DC, a coalition that is committed to securing a strong start for every infant and toddler in DC, my testimony today will focus on the importance of your vote to increase early childhood educator compensation. This year's supplement will go a long way toward making life a little easier for the teaching staff at Jubilee Jumpstart. On behalf of our teachers, I thank you. As a director in the early childhood community, I'm acutely aware of the impact teachers have on high quality education. Teachers are pivotal. Every day for at least eight hours, they must show up as their best and give so much to our youngest learners. They set the tone for their classroom. This supplement for teachers will take away some of the immediate burdens teachers have. Imagine a teacher being able to quit one of two part-time jobs or paying a debt to a previously attended college so they can return to school for a degree or having money to secure housing in a safer neighborhood or figuring out how to shorten their daily commute and ride Metro instead of taking several buses because Metro costs too much. All of these burdens are what my teachers face. This is how the supplement will help them. This is why Aussie needs to push and get these supplements out to teachers as soon as possible. When teachers can arrive at work feeling less stressed and able to focus on the classroom, everyone grows. As an additional piece, the continued equity and support of raising salaries makes this field more respected and becomes a viable career choice for some of the best and brightest, which our children deserve and have a human right to. We are well aware that early childhood education holds up this economy. Without us, people cannot work and the economy would stall. This equity and compensation helps to create a pipeline of teachers. We need to keep attracting college students to this field. We need to be able to retain the high quality teachers we have. If you want to change this city, continue to focus on strengthening teachers in every way. I thank you for your time and support for a strong, high quality, effective and connected early childhood system in the district. Thank you for the opportunity and I am available for follow-up questions. Thank you, Ms. Spencer. Uh, Angel or Angel Wood Woodley? 
and I don't think I see them. Uh, Dane Anderson. Please proceed. Great, thank you, Chair Mendelson, members of the council. Uh, my name is Dane Anderson. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at KIPP DC. Thank you for providing the space today to share what schools need in the coming year to best serve students, families, and communities. As the council is well aware, the last two years have been amongst the most challenging in the history of public education. School systems across the district, including KIPP DC, are having to focus simultaneously on everything from addressing learning gaps to safety protocols to, having, to adding more mental health services. At KIPP DC, uh, we're proud of a lot of things over the last few years, uh, but I wanted to just list a few. Uh, that, that we've put in place to address some of the new challenges facing our students, staff, and families. Uh, the first is uh, having a two devices for every student, one at home and one at school, with over 19,000 devices distributed across our schools. Second is offering free tutoring and enrichment programming to almost 40% of our students last summer, including spending $1.7 million to enable KIPP DC students to attend summer camp with partners like the Washington Urban Debate League and the Washington Youth Baseball Academy. And third, adding a uh, close to 10% increase in our school capacity on the staffing side. This was about, uh, this was over a hundred school-based roles, roles to support the unique challenges of reopening schools in a pandemic. Uh, given this list of new expenditures, we wanna share our appreciation to the council and uh, the, the mayor's administration for increasing education funding by 5.9% next year. We especially appreciate that the funding announcement came early so the LEAs can make important personnel and programmatic investments now with confidence to prepare for the beginning of next school year. In light of the challenges that I've talked about here and that all of us have been experiencing, we do advocate that DC's education agencies collectively focus on a few priorities uh, over the next year. The first is to increase the facilities allowance to 3.1%. As you've heard from many others today, facility costs have risen dramatically because of inflation, increase in contracted wages, maintenance and materials costs, and the need to prioritize investment in the upkeep of older buildings. Second, we encourage uh, clear COVID vaccine messaging to families and students as soon as possible. I know that's something that the council has worked on and we are appreciative of that. But we believe it's one of the most impactful steps that the district can take to keep students in school. Um, for this year and for next year. The third is to prioritize legislation and funding to increase student safety, specifically finalizing the comprehensive safe passage and safe routes legislation to help minimize the impact of violence and traffic on student safety. And the fourth is to increase access to school nurses and mental health clinicians. Um, we really believe in more equitably staffing school nurses. Some of our nurses at our schools have a student load of over a thousand students it's not fair to those nurses, students, or to staff. And then last, to expand the DBH successful school mental health pilot from this year to provide more mental health support for students. Thank you again to Aussie, PCSB, DME, and the State Board of Education for your continued partnership as we address these and so many other challenges. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Anderson. Uh, Barry Brinkley. Good evening, Chairman Middleton and other members of the council. My name is Barry Brinkley and I'm the Chief of Staff at DC Prep. I'm testifying tonight about how DC Prep is addressing its health challenges during the pandemic and the impact on our stat staff and students. DC Prep is in its 19th year of operation is now a network of six schools serving 2,100 students in wards five, seven, and eight in grades pre-K through eighth. DC Prep is considered the highest performing network of charter schools in the city. And at the time of the last rating, all of our prep schools were rated tier one by the Public Charter School Board. DC Prep prides itself on many things, including our commitment to our students. We are extremely proud of the rigorous academic program we provide, as well as our focus on student identity. Our commitment lasts beyond the years our students are in our school buildings as we make a 10 year commitment to our alumni as they go to, through, to and through college and career through our Prep Next program. I want to say thank you to Chairman Mendelson and your staff for visiting our Anacostia Middle Campus a few weeks ago. We're really grateful that the council has taken a stance that schools should be open. Like us, you recognize the need for stability for our students. And with that being said, it is instrumental that the additional that it is instrumental to have additional resources to provide our schools with the right support to continue to brave this pandemic and address the impact it continues to have on our students, staff, and on all of our schools. 
In terms of where we are presently, as we all know, it's been a challenging year, not just at DC Prep, but across the district and across the country. It takes a lot to keep schools open as the safety of our students and staff are top priority. As our school teams continue to work extremely hard to ensure safety on all of our campuses, we still continue to observe the repercussions of the pandemic on the mental health of our students, families, and our staff. Therefore, it is especially important for the council to invest in mental health support for schools. Our students have missed a significant amount of in-person learning at a critical time in their growth and development, particularly their mental and emotional health. We often hear about the resilience of our young people, but this should not exclude them from, re from receiving the necessary support to cope with life challenges caused by this pandemic. In addition, our school staff, including our teachers and school leaders, are also still dealing with this pandemic and trying to return to some sense of in-person normalcy at a time where normalcy has not been clearly defined. We urge the council to consider mental health services for educators so we can continue to retain top talent in our classrooms and school buildings. This ensures our students continue to have the best and brightest adults supporting them. Thank you for the time to this evening and I'm available for questions. Oh, thank you, Mr. Franklin. Kenyon Weaver. Thank you, Chairman and members of the council. Uh, my name is Kenyon Weaver. I'm a parent of two children at Maury Elementary. I'm also an elected parent representative to the Maury LSAT. My testimony today is first about how DCPS's new budget formula fails our school. Second, how the chancellor and DCPS's response to our concerns indicate they are more concerned with the formulas than the actual funding. And third, to please ask the council for action and to require uh, the mayor and chancellor to correct the results or at the very least directly funded the school at the level that the mayor and chancellor have repeatedly rolled out, which is the $12,419 per student figure minimum. So first, how DCPS's budget fails Maury. Next year, Maury is projected to receive 38 new students. That's an 8% increase in student population. And also next year, Maury Elementary will be able to hire precisely zero new class classroom teachers while maintaining its current staffing level. Once again, zero. On its face, this is an absurd result. And practically it puts at risk everything that Maury has had success with over the years, because this is what will happen next year. The four current classes of third graders will be forced into three classrooms of fourth graders. Why? Because there's not enough funding for an additional classroom teacher, an additional fourth grade teacher. Maury's one art teacher, one music, one librarian, one world languages teacher will have to now teach all 547 students as there's no funding for additional support there. And our overworked front office staff will once again, year after year, have no relief, even as the workload has dramatically increased. When we addressed these to the chancellor, he wrote back and he said, and I quote, Maury does serve a large number of students and we care deeply that their needs met. We believe that under the updated budget model, they will be, but they won't be just as we explained in the letter. And it seems that the chancellor is more interested in defending the formulas rather than the results. And it seems wrong the DCPS is promising sufficient funding uh, and not being held accountable for that actual funding. It seems wrong that Moria Elementary has a budget that is forced to use the mayor's recovery funds simply to keep current teachers and staff in place because there's not enough funding to cover salary increases, even while facing an 8% influx. I see my time is coming to an end. So uh, my third point uh, is to ask the council to require to correct these absurd results, make them redo it, or at least uh, reach the level of the 12,419 per student. And I'll just note, Maury's per pupil spending by DCPS's own numbers is 10,949, almost 2,000 less. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Carlene Reed. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson, and um, like my colleague uh, 
Ebony Rose Thompson. I am in between our SBOE working session, but thank you. Uh, I'm Dr. Carlene Reed, the Ward 8 member to the DC State Board of Education. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, each of the council members that have sponsored either education related bills throughout the year, especially bills that were in direct connection with SBOE recommendations, letters, and outreach to individual members. As you know, the DC State Board of Education's greatest asset is our platform to listen around education issues. And your partnership on issues brings action to the voices of many who come to the SBOE with not just their issues, but ideas for improving the quality of education for all DC students. Um, as a board eight representative, the areas of concern or accountability that I have received communications about throughout the year have frequently related to bullying, often involving children with special needs, building maintenance concerns, COVID-19 mitigation and recovery, and student safety, whether that be traffic safety, building safety, or community violence. I recognize that each of these issues requires some interagency work, so I look forward to hearing from our government partners in education on how their agencies are addressing these issues uh, within, uh, within and across organizations. Other areas um, that I hope we can explore as a city to promote quality education experiences are, can we please revisit the Place PACE Act to ensure that it is not, uh, to ensure that it's furthering equity and building mod modernizations. Ward A continues to lag in full modernizations for DCPS schools. Um, and also, uh, we also need to explore some maintenance for public charter schools, especially our single site charters that are not tied to large networks that may have resources that may need resources to offset these costs. I know one single site charter this winter who was struggling with some heat issues while I'm watching other charters build whole schools. Um, we, we need to make sure that all have equal access to quality buildings. Um, explore mandates to out of school time providers um, to being credentialed by OSI to accept vouchers. So essentially mandating out of school time providers to um, accept vouchers. Um, I'm running out of time, so I can't elaborate on that. Uh, DC remains one of the few states that, pro um, that provides universal preschool. However, children with disabilities under IDA Part B are still forced to be placed into DCPS. Um, states who have qual uh, more quality indicators related to our child care centers often provide IDA Part B, not just Part C, which is early intervention services in their child care centers. So like Aussie to explore that. Um, the SBOE passed recommendations for reducing bias and increasing support in school accountability framework, known as the STAR rating system. Ward 8 disproportionately has um, four out of the uh, bottom 5% of schools represented. Um, and we just want an, an equal opportunity um, to show truly what schools are doing within buildings. Um, I appreciate the Public Charter School Board for taking the time to reevaluate the process for new schools um, and engagement efforts. Ward 8 will have over 45 schools very soon. I um, mean, it is key that new schools and expansions complement the community. Um, and I look forward to engaging with the PCSB in this process. Um, I have a couple more. Uh, we've seen families, more families electing homeschooling. Um, and we are looking for, we had a panel actually of, uh, pan, of parents who came to the SBOE um, asking for more supports around homeschooling, especially again, children with disabilities. Um, and resources, other resources that they were asking for were connecting to extracurricular programming and dual enrollment. My last one is exploring standards or criteria for virtual learning. Uh, this year, the PCSDB approved two full-time virtual programs. Um, we want to, one, I want to make sure the DCPS has an opportunity for a virtual person, a permanent virtual option. Uh, however, we also want to explore quality around those, um, the opening of virtual schools, unfortunately across the country, virtual schooling. Um, there has been virtual schools who are tied to fraudulent behavior. Um, I think BC can get ahead of uh, some of these issues by establishing processes and standards related to creating permanent virtual options. I thank you for the extra minute um, and have a good evening. Thank you, but I'm at a little bit of a disadvantage because I don't have a copy of your statement. Yes, I need to proofread it and I will send it this evening. Okay, please, because uh, I could look at it and um, maybe use it at the hearing tomorrow. Thank you, Chairman Mendelson. Have a good evening. You too, thank you, Dr. Reed. Uh, Renee Powell. Renee I'm Powell. Yes, I'm right here. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, Councilman Mendelson and other committee members, my name is Renee Powell, and I'm a parent of two special needs children that attend the DC schools. I'm a Ward 7 resident, and I'm grateful for this opportunity to testify and to share my family experiences with some of the education sectors in DC. 
Unfortunately, I know too well the struggles of getting my children the support they really need and receiving free appropriate public education. Both of my children have IEPs and the journey um, to secure those I mean, for them have been a long and sometimes disheartening one. To speak to, speak to one of the experiences of my children, uh, he had a difficult time in DCPS schools and the charter schools that they attend. Far too often, my concerns about their emotional and mental development and how it impacts on their educational performance was ignored and dismissed. I recognized early that, I recognized early on that I needed to have different professionals in place, such as therapists, to address the different needs of my child. And also that my child needed to have more diagnostic testing and unlimited needed and, un, and unlimited needs um, that would fit in their IEP programs. My concerns were ignored. The school ignored me. Aussie dismissed me. It took two years uh, for me to get professional advocate for my children to get the IEP that they really needed. I had to turn to the children's advocacy uh, for the attorney and those who know what I'm talking about really know um, how in depth they can really be. And getting the IEP, it covered everything that I needed. And also to, again, I had another battle. Getting the IEP, it covered everything, again, like I said, that I needed. Instead of working with me to ensure that my children had all the services I needed, I was treated, I was treated like as if I didn't know anything. And I think that I speak for some other parents, a lot of parents who have children with special needs and with the COVID that's going on, it was really an inconvenience for us struggling day to day to make sure that our children receive the adequate education. To uh, closing, I said, every parent deserves to be heard and more ever to be listened. Uh, what I'm asking for the panel and for the committee to understand, and that is an IEP is the child's makeup, but also too, it has to be where the teachers, the counselors, everyone comes together and have an understanding of what the IEP does for this child and what are the needs. I wanna thank you. Uh, for listening to me and taking your time, Councilman Mendelson and others on the panel to understand that is, this is very important. And for us to have a successful school year and for next year and the years coming forth, we have to understand that when certain children have IEPs, teachers need to be really trained, counselors need to be really trained on what to look for, on how to handle children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Powell. The next witness is Mary McCain. Good afternoon, Council Member. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Member Mendelson. How are you? I'm Mary McCain. I am um, a ward. I am a ward eight PLE member of Pay. Thank you for your time, and thank you for the rest of the members of the committee as a whole. My name is Mary McCain. I'm a proud grand grandparent of Zion Jones, who is a kindergartner at Boone Elementary in Ward 8. I also serve as also serve on parent amplifying voices in education on Ward 8 board. Thank you for prioritizing kids like my grandson by fully funding school-based mental health expansion and adding four million to DBH Medicaid funding community-based behavioral health services. In the past before the pandemic, I've testified in front of you to speak about my grandson and how important it is to fund the school-based mental health priorities, which gave him access to services that he needs to develop and learn. Today, I want to share where we are now. While the district needs both more funding and and for the council to support generating comprehensive map of what mental health supports currently, of what mental health supports currently exist in the school. This, this will make sure that families can access already, what already exists and the gaps that 
and gaps and meeting gaps. I'm sorry, excuse me. And meeting gaps that exist and meeting students' needs in mental health. I also want to share how important it is for the W Mayor of Education and the Department of Behavioral Health to create strong accountability systems for an age for any agency or organization providing mental health supports to schools in partnership with families and youth. Zion is a survivor of physical and emotional abuse and his, re and his resilience is one of the reasons I'm so proud of how good he is in school and other things. The traumatic events which are the reason why he is currently in the custody of me, myself and his family is why, why he needs mental health support and access to behavioral specialists was important. Development on his pre-K pre, pre years Sorry, Take a moment. Development during his pre-K years, but this year our family house caught on fire and we lost everything. This was a very traumatic event for us. In addition to the existing traumas that has already impacted his mental health and things that he needs to need support makes it more necessary and urgent for Zion. Right now, our family is working with the courts so that so that our family and his parents can share custody. Yet at this time, we need the most services and they're not being offered as well as they should be. Throughout the process of our custody hearings, we have had so many issues coordinating access with care with the courts through the DBH system and the schools. None of it is making sense or making it easy for him as he's transitioning between both homes and school getting the same level of care and services that he does that he does need with me and at school and with his parents. And transition from in-person to virtual learning and back to in-person school, there was somehow a gap in the way things were able to be done for him. And then when the custody changed, he needed to get a new evaluation, which took up to like three months in order for us to get in-person services with DBH. And it required me to make a whole lot of phone calls. And sometimes the calls are not getting returned and I have to keep calling back to get updates as to where things are going. Right now we're currently experiencing a gap where we're um, trying to get access to going in person so he can get an in-person assessment. With everything that's going, you're about two minutes, two minutes and 32 and a half minutes over your time. Okay, I'm sorry. Can you wrap up, please? I'm sorry. But all I was, all I was asking is for accountability for the system so, so we can figure out how to bridge the gap for not just I am, but all families that may be experiencing the same troubles. Thank you, I'm sorry. I don't apologize, but thank you. Uh, Mickey Mulligetta. I do not see, so I'll move on. Renee Davis, I don't see that person. Uh, Steve Beam. Chairman, can you hear me okay? Yes. Terrific. Um, appreciate you set, set, setting this up today. I appreciate you having Having us. I appreciate you sitting through this all day long. All the other council members also thank you. I, I think this is a testament to the passion we have in DC for our public school system. That's fantastic. It would have been 
a shame if you had thrown this meeting and nobody showed up. Um, so we're here, but we're here because we all need help. D different reasons. I wish I could summarize the great points I've heard today. We're here because we need help. We're here because DCPS isn't listening to us. We're here because we need actual council oversight, actual actions. We need, we need you to help stand up for us. I'm gonna make um, two points. I'm here to talk about budget. I'm here to talk about testing. Um, regarding budget, it's amazing to me the amount of time and, and burden that we put on our LSATs and parents with this budget process. Uh, DCBS talks about this being transparent. They talk about this being you know, an open discussion back and forth. What can we do to serve these schools as best we can? Um, I'm gonna pause for one minute. Is my timer going? Cause on my screen, it still says three and chairman, you know, I'll just keep going. Thanks. Okay. I'll, I'll take a minute off of that. Um, just want to keep, just want to keep myself honest here. Um, so the churn in these, the churn in these budgets is a concern to me because every time that we tell a school that they don't know what they're working with, they spend time that's not teaching. They spend time not working with children. They spend time not working with students. A principal can't plan effectively if they don't know what their budget is. We have to do better than that. We can't be taking a, a, a half a slot here and a half a slot there. We know what these schools are going to look like. We need to be better about planning one, three, five years in advance. We know what the population statistics look like and we can do better than that. I know that we can. I think Kenyon Weaver, I think Kenyon Weaver before me made a great point. I'm concerned to see the chancellor defunding defending formula instead of results. I think it's important. I, a baseline is a great place to start, but it, it, it really concerns me to hear that schools take some of these different funds and use them as slush funds to cover things that they need to have covered. Um, I, I, I hear that the at-risk dollars get slushed around wherever they need to be. That's got to stop. We need to fund schools appropriately. I'm going to pause there and move on to testing. I have a proud parent of two kids. They come home and they tell me all they do is take tests, Chairman. Um, we call them, te we hire teachers, not testers, I hope. And, 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 and every minute that we spend testing is probably a minute that we're not spending teaching. I know that other people today have testified more eloquently than I will with examples of calendars, with examples of sort of what a week looks like for a teacher that has to provide all those tests. We hire teachers to teach. I think we, that we need to let them teach. Um, last point regarding funding. I, is too many schools fall below what the mayor said the minimum baseline was going to be. I'm not sure how that happens. And, and, and I know that when my LSAT reached out to the chancellor with a very thoughtful letter, which I attached as my testimony, and I promise I'll wrap up quick. We get, we got a, we got a form letter in response chairman. And so what that does is that really undermines how a, a trust in the system, right? So if we're going to ask parents to be involved, but then disrespect them with a form letter when things are submitted, asking genuine questions about a process, if we're going to send a form letter back, that's how you chase parents out of public school if they feel they're not being heard. I know budgets are tough. I think we can do better. I think DC recently spent 300 million bucks on streetlights, if I'm not mistaken. I happily volunteer to help change light bulbs in those street lights. If it means any of that money can go to any of these issues you've heard about with public schools today, chairman, we can do better than this. I'm counting on you for results, not strongly worded letters, not more meetings, results to every one of these genuine concerns that people have presented today. I appreciate your time, but don't let it be wasteful. Put your time today to good use. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bean. <clears throat> what school are you at? I'm at Maury Elementary, proudly. We were, I think we're Ward 6, Ward 7 now. It's an amazingly diverse school. I couldn't be happier. It's, it's I, I wish every school in the district looked like we did. It's great. But I don't understand how DCPS can somehow look at the rising enrollment numbers and not, I mean, we're the lowest funded, no matter how you slice it, we don't have enough teachers for the next year. Thank you. Uh, I, I I may come back to you when we're done with all the witnesses. Thank you, sir. Lakeisha Battlecrim. Lakeisha Battlecrim, I saw you for a second. You disappeared.
I think you disappeared for real. Uh, Flor Baruca. Yes, I'm here. Please proceed. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon, members of the community of the hub. My name is Flor Buruca. I live in War Four, and I am a mother of three children, two that are in public school, is an a one years old my baby. One of my children attend Ida B. Wells and the other attend Benjamin Banneger High School. I am also a parent member of the organization Many Language One Voice. Many students in different public schools have re regarding the meal meals they are being given. I want to talk about my children's school. They had told me that the meals are very unpleasant, that and that they and most of their classmates do not like them, but that if they don't eat the then they have to be hungry all day long. Um, the lasagna which was the only food my daughter's like uh, has been take always. She is very sad because she has to wait, wait until she gets, so, she gets home to eat something healthy and, and tasty. We know that this, this affects the children's health and learning. They can't focus on their study. They have a little angry because, because energy because we know that poorly house child and child be hungry during the day. So I wonder why not modify There's meal sensi we know that you can change the menu with more varieties of options. So, so a salad and, and fruit, something healthy and at the same time enjoy. Since we know that DCPS participates in some federal programs that are supposed to provide healthy food to a school, but they keep getting the some bad food. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to, to bring my opinion. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, you're muted. Thank you, uh, Ms. Baruka. And it would help if we had a copy of your statement. Of the last nine witnesses, uh, only three uh, have given us their statements. And that puts us at a bit of a disadvantage. So um, if you would uh, get us their statements, I would appreciate it. The next witness is Nora Lopez. I don't believe she's here. Uh, Marie Tata. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson and members of the committee. My name is Marie. I'm 17 years old and live in Ward 4. I attend Wilson High School and I'm a youth advocate with the Young Women's Project. I'm currently working with on the mental health campaign team. I came to talk today about youth mental health issues and to share the work that YWP, my YWP peers and I are doing to increase student access to mental health and wellness information, resources, and services. I've been with YWP since my freshman year, and I've worked on issues related to sexual health, youth employment, and now school-based mental health. 
In 2020, YWP launched the mental health campaign after seeing the mental health crisis many students were experiencing. Students were dealing with depression, loss of sleep, and a lot of stress. I work with 60 fellow leaders who attend DCPS and charter high schools. Many high school students are experiencing a mental health crisis. YWP leaders conducted a survey with DC students and found that students were experiencing a range of problems, including toxic stress, trouble sleeping, depression, and even suicide. Students also don't know where to go for help. We are surveying our peers again, and we hope to have results in a few weeks. I'm lucky that the amount of stress I have in my life does not affect my ability to do day-to-day -day tasks, but the same can't be said for many of my peers. Some of my peers feel like the amount of work they have is overwhelming, and they would much rather not do it and push it to the side. Others overwork themselves by staying up late to study and complete assignments. Often students don't know how to manage their stress. Last semester, I noticed peers skipping lunch to complete assignments and have even seen students breaking down crying because of their stress. I wish my school did a better job of sharing mental health information and resources. I also wish there were groups where we could talk with our peers and receive support, which could happen during lunch or after school. At Wilson, there are two counselors per grade and the students get assigned counselors based on their last name. Everyone knows their counselor's doors are always open, but since COVID, there are limits on how many students can work with them or they might not be in their office. My counselor is on the fourth floor, so many students don't want to go all the way up to that floor just to check and see if they can talk. If you can't reach them during lunch before school or don't have a free period, then you might be out of luck when it comes to having a conversation with them. As a member of the YWP mental wellness team, I've been working on a virtual wellness center for my school. Virtual wellness centers can be online resources where students can receive information on important mental health topics and learn how to connect with counselors or other practitioners. The first room I created was on the topic of stress and I'm currently working on emotional health. Our work is important because students need information and resources now. Many schools don't have resources and often counselors are overworked and not available all the time. The virtual wellness centers are available all the time as long as the team has a link, they can access the center. It'll be easy to share the information by text or social media. We hope to launch them by the end of the month. Based on what I've seen at my school and what I know about my team member school, I have two recommendations. The first one is to require DCPS and DCPS public charter schools to include a link on their website homepages that directly take youth to mental health team and services. The second one is require and fund after school wellness programs in all schools. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you. Uh, next is uh, Jean-Pierre Roberts. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson and other members of the Committee of the Whole. My name is Jean-Pierre Roberts. I'm a senior attending Woodrow Wilson High School, and I'm also a peer educator and youth advocate at the Young Women's Project. I'm here today to testify on the growing educational gap between students of color and white students due to the lack of accessibility, support, and general encouragement for students of color to enroll and participate in AP classes. I've taken several AP classes at this point in my academic career. I have personally experienced the benefits of having a GPA boost from a 4.0 scale in on-level classes to a 5.0 scale in AP classes which allowed me to have a GPA over four and the competitive advantage it gives me over my peers who remain in on-level classes. There are also financial benefits of not having to take uh, certain courses in college because passing the AP exam can earn you college credits and thus save you money as you won't have to pay for those courses. At the same time, I've also witnessed the lack of diversity in AP classrooms. Of all the AP classes I've taken part in, which is six, I have had maybe 12 or 15 classmates who were of color across all six of those classes, so around two per course. This has affected me in a way that I haven't been able to be comfortable in AP spaces, as I'm often the only student of color in my AP class, and it forces me into a corner where I am not set up to succeed because I don't feel inclined to work with my classmates, and my classmates don't feel inclined to work with me. I've also witnessed the lack of support given to students of color in AP classes and the lack of encouragement they receive to even enroll in AP classes to begin with. The administration advises students to enroll in AP classes maybe once or twice during scheduling, and that's about it. They don't fully discuss the benefits or talk about it uh, before or after the scheduling period. Based on what I've heard from my peers, their parents rarely ever advise them during scheduling, and as a result, don't encourage their students to enroll in AP classes. As a result, students of colors have notably lower GPAs as compared to their white counterparts and have a weaker competitive advantage in college application, scholarship application, and general education spaces. At Wilson, we see the trends for lower GPAs for students of color done through a beacon, our school newspaper 2020 study where Black students had an average 
of about a 2.6 GPA compared to the white counterparts who had about a 3.2 GPA on average. Although it is possible to argue that COVID influenced this gap, that just goes to show the lack of initiative by DCPS to ensure that students of all races were engaged with online schools, which supports the idea that DCPS is also failing to encourage those same students to enroll in AP classes and reap those benefits. Regardless of the effects of COVID, the GPA boost given by AP classes could have easily, easily closed the gap that that 2.6 as that 2.6 would jump up to nearly a three as AP courses are on a 5.0 scale rather than a 4.0 scale. In a study conducted by the US Department of Education in 2019, it was shown that 44% of white high school students in the US participated in AP courses, while only 30% of black high school students in the US participated. A 10% deficit between black students and white students enrolling doesn't sound like much until you consider that 10% of the white population is much greater than that of 10% of the black population. College boards themselves have released data from 2019 showing that the students nationwide who participated in AP exams, only 8.8% of those were black, while 49.5% of those were white. This gap is immense countrywide. And with DC being a political epicenter, that where's a better place to begin closing the educational gap than here? Uh, my suggestion is to simply address this problem, or to simply address this problem is uh, or conduct outreach directly to students of color and, and, and get, encourage them to enroll and participate in AP classes. Uh, this should be done through mandatory meetings, uh, assemblies, at, assemblies at schools, also engaging with parents. And then the second uh, suggestion I have, which is the preferable one, is to simply have AP for all students. Uh, courses like US History and AP Language Arts, specifically at Wilson, are already being taught the, on the, or the same coursework is already being taught for on-level classes as it is for AP classes, and all the students are su succeeding just the same. Uh, again, AP for all is something that needs to be seriously considered, but the problem of students of color not being engaged with and encouraged to enroll in AP classes needs to be addressed. Thank you for your time and attention. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Roberts. Uh, Carmen Brito or Brito? Hello, Chairman Mendelson and members of the committee. My name is Carmen Brito. It is nice to meet you all today. Thank you for allowing me to testify on this day. I am 16 years old. From Ward 3, I am a 10th grader at Wilson High School. I am a youth advocate and work for the Young Women's Project on mental health on the mental health team. Um, I joined YWP staff during the summer of 2021 because I wanted to learn about mental health and raise awareness about problems we, fa we as youth face on a daily basis. Youth leaders launched a mental health campaign in 2019 to connect youth with services and expand classroom and health education. This year, we have 60 youth leaders on the ground in 16 schools working together to build a citywide school here led mental health and wellness system. My testimony today focuses on the work on the virtual wellness centers project in YWP and what we what we can what has been done or what can be done to expand mental health services in schools. Mental health is an important issue for me during the pandemic I was blessed with supportive people by my side. The stress from virtual learning overwhelms me and the stress from covid my mood um Brought my mood and mental health down. I'm lucky my grades didn't drop. It was hard to be able to communicate with loved ones, like friends and family. It is also hard to communicate with teachers and counselors during that time. Now learning in person is less stressful. I'm able to make new friends and relationships as well as work out with my communications better with my teachers and counselors. Wilson is also been doing a good job of communicating at COVID cases. Classes are getting harder though. Most students have fewer breaks and some teachers started to work um, to hand out more work. The Wilson website also has a um, new folder of mental health resources for students that have not had before. These resources include numerous hotlines, types of mental health services, and mental health counseling, as well as electronic counseling. Wilson also has a Wellness Wednesday for parents, as well as newsletters. Wilson also has been working on a campaign that is No Place for Hate, working on what works on students with bullying problems and help spread positivity. One main project we've been working on uh, to connect peers with resources is in the virtual wellness centers. The virtual wellness centers will hopefully help connect students with mental health resources and support them, like reaching out to counselors and clinicians. Each staff member picked two issues to focus on. I worked on stress along with Marie and Elizabeth, and I'm working on a ther art therapy room now. Within each room of our stress Google Slides, we have interactive clickable books, posters, and TVs and video resources on different types of stress and ways to deal with stress, as well as links to hotlines and wellness support and teach others about stress, not to mention stress about and how it affects different groups like BIPOC and LGBTQ community. Eventually, each um, virtual wellness center room will have 15 rooms, including stress, toxic stress, trauma, as well as 
resilience building rooms like physical health, uh, exercise, sleep, nutrition, and emotional health, meditation, breathing, positive thinking, etc. Um, we've also been working on resilience building rooms, uh, which will have different ways to cope with problems facing things like meditation, exercise, self-care, journaling, therapy, and many other practices. With these resilience building rooms, the Youth Wellness Women Young, young Women's Program hopes that students will have access to resources regarding different resilience building subjects, uh, such as emotional health, physical health, personal agency, and much more. In late March, we will launch these uh, rooms to 16 different high schools within DC. What I require from DCPS is um, schools to DCPS schools to include links in their websites and homepages to take that takes you directly to mental health um, team and services. Right now, most websites do not have links which require you to search up at the staff directory to figure out what they can, what or who they can contact for support. Require, um, second, require and fund after school wellness programs. And in all schools, students need groups that will help them build support skills and strengthen. You're a minute over your time. So, oh. grab, like in 10 seconds, wrap up. Okay. Um, Basically, we need more um, after school programs that help with social skills and students with stress um, and fund mental health classes that require students uh, that require mental health classes like um, learning about stress and different ways of coping and building relationships with other students. Um, thank you for listening to my testimony. Thank you. Uh, the next witness, Trevon Smallwood, I believe, is not here. Juliana Lopez, I think, is not here. Brianna. Jenkins, I think, is not here. Chase Cunningham. Hello, Chairman Mendelssohn and members of the committee. I am Chase Cunningham, and I am a freshman at Bard High School Early College. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify today. I'm a 15-year-old that lives in Ward 7 after high school. I plan to attend college and medical school to become a dermatologist. I'm a youth advocate with the Young Women's Project and I joined November 2021. I'm here today to talk about student mental health and wellness and share the work my YWP peers and I are doing to increase student access to mental health information and resources. Most of my stress is from school. I worry about my grades a lot because I want to do my best and, and I always want to get a perfect score. And sometimes I'm hard on myself. I also stress um, how to navigate um, social situations. Um, I think my school could do a better job in supporting students. Um, I see, I see, I see teachers pulling students who, who have been in fights to help to check in on them, but they don't ever check in on students who have witnessed fights. Fights are, um, affect all students, not just ones who are involved. We receive emails that are mostly about community service, internships, school programs, and other announcements. Most of my most of the information is sent by our counselors. If we, if we need, if I ever would need help with this, um, anything, I will go to my principal because I have a good relationship with her. And I also might go to a language, my language arts teacher because we have a positive relationship and he's a very positive teacher overall. At YWP, we are creating virtual wellness centers. I hope that they will uplift my peers so they know they have support. These are Google slide presentations that will connect students to wellness resources and, and school-based mental health su to support them, including how to reach counselors. When, when we were home during, due to the pandemic, I had a lot of anxiety during a time of uncertainty and many of us still deal with anxiety or stress during these uncertain times. And I want, to, I want the youth to know that they have support. I have some recommendations for schools in the future, in the near future. All students should be required to, all schools should be required to have a home button on their page that will take students directly to the mental, to mental health teams and services. And two, schools should also have wellness programs for students to help, to help, to help cope with um, things and have a positive mindset. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Cunningham. Uh, Navia Bright, I believe is not here. Cyan Teckel. Hello, Chairman Mendelson and members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. 
pleasure to share my experiences and the issues that we've been facing. My name is Sian Teklehab Tagaber, and I'm a junior at Base DC. I'm also a Ward 2 resident. In college, I'd like to pursue a career in journalism and advocacy. Currently, I'm a youth advocate with the Young Women's Project's Youth Justice Campaign with a focus on the mental health of DCPS and DCPCS students. The Young Women's Project is a nonprofit organization that provides youth with the resources and opportunities to become active members of their community, looking for solutions to issues that plague them, especially in schools. I join them because I also have a vested interest in creating a safe, nurturing space for my peers. So I believe that YWP is an essential contributor to that goal. I'm testifying today to discuss student mental health and share the work my teammates are doing to increase student accessibility to mental health and wellness information and resources. Two years ago, the Youth Justice Campaign has launched the Mental Health Campaign, focusing on the increased rates of toxic stress, depression, and suicide amongst younger DC residents. The lack of access to counseling and wellness programs at schools was and still is a driving force in these alarming rates. So the campaign is sought to counter these discrepancies in youth mental health access. Personally, I attend a rigorous school and experience burnout often. My school hasn't been totally adamant about providing mental health support for upperclassmen. Burnout is a prevalent issue in our community because we haven't been well equipped with the resources or skills to remedy exhaustion and overworking. We take many AP or advanced placement courses. I personally take six AP courses out of my seven total courses. So the inability to cope with the aforementioned issues can have adverse effects on our mental health. Prior to the virtual year, students were provided with seminars on depression a few times a year. But since we've returned in person, those seminars haven't occurred as far as I know. Because of a lack of introduction and accessibility, I don't personally know the mental health support staff at my school, nor do I know how to contact them. In the past, once I started to feel the onset of burnout, I didn't understand it. So I couldn't recognize what I was experiencing and this had a psychological impact on me because I kept pushing myself to work harder. In the present day, I still don't feel like I received support from my school. The only outreach that I received has been from teachers with whom I built personal connections with. Through my own efforts and my work with the Young Women's Project, I've been able to learn more and find resources that help me manage my mental health and handle the effects of my burnout. I don't know students accessing resources through my school, but more so accessing them from outside. My partner and I have been compiling effective resources in our virtual wellness center to be made available to CPS and DCPCS students. Our center focuses on resilience building and the development of healthy coping habits. We've seen through every source analyzing their efficacy and resources, and I've learned that VWC can be made for anyone and there are steps you can take personally to build resilience because it's a safe space for people to access mental health resources. Despite resilience being discussed as a one is born with, we've found through our research that it's actually one that can be developed. Providing the resources and space for students to learn about resilience allows them the opportunity to develop their own resilience and bounce back from what they struggle with. The Virtual Wellness Center as a whole is necessary because it provides access to resources that can help with the overall well-being of students, especially those who don't have access to these resources elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Akilin Leek. Hello, Chairman Mendelssohn and all members of the committee, and thank you for allowing me to testify this evening. I am Kaylin Leek, and I am an 18-year-old mother-to-be speaking from Ward 7. I'm currently a senior at H.D. Woodson High School. One thing, I'm a, one thing I am passionate about is advocating for youth justice and giving my peers an open ear and heart. And I'm proud to say that I am a youth advocate with the Youth Women's Project, also known as YWP. I chose to be a part of the team because I feel that we, DC youth, need to be more involved in accessing needed resources to address mental health and reduce juvenile crime in the community. I am here today to share my work on the YWP mental health campaign and push for better mental health support for students. Stress and anxiety affects my life, especially when I'm in the school building and there's a lot going on. Just this week, there was an incident that caused a lot of stress and made me worry about my safety. I also find that toxic stress is impacting my peers because many lack a stable family or live in toxic households. This distracts them at school and keeps them from doing their work. I feel as though many students lack knowledge of existing resources or they might know about them, but they don't want the help or they deny it. This might be because they fear judgment or feel, feel embarrassed for needing help, or they simply just don't know how to ask for help. Here at YWP, I have been working on creating a virtual wellness center. This will be a place online where students can get, can, well, excuse me. This will be a place online where students can go for wellness information and resources. I created a room on toxic stress. I am doing this work because I feel like the youth deserve to be heard and need more access to important information. 
There is too much crime in the area, especially involving youth. It's very shocking and drastic. A lot can change if students have someone to talk to and know how to manage their stress. I have three recommendations that we think will make a difference. When it comes to school websites, I believe all high schools should be required to have a link on their homepage that will take students directly to the mental health team and services. More wellness programs should be set in place. Students need programs and support groups to help them deal with stress and address their mental health needs. My school specifically should have regular grade meetings and assemblies where they can come together and share available resources and students can meet the mental health staff. There should also include mental health information in our announcements and put up posters. There should also be more available resources to students who are trying to reach out for mental health assistance through the school website. It has been a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Leek. I understand Trayvon Smallwood has joined us. Mr. Smallwood. Uh, Mr. Smallwood, I think I saw you unmuted and now you're muted. All right, well, then I'm going to turn to Danielle Bigby. Ms. Bigby. I'm here. Um, hello, Chairman Mendelson and members of the committee. My name is Danielle Bigby. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. It's nice to meet you all. I'm a student at Thurgood Marshall Academy, and I live in Ward 7. I'm a youth advocate at the youth women's Pro Young Women's Project YWP, working on mental health campaign team. YWP is a DC nonprofit that builds the leadership and power of young people to solve community problems, especially in schools. I am testifying today to discuss, to discuss student mental health and share the work my team teammates are doing to increase student accessibility to mental health and wellness and resources. For me, mental health and wellness has been hard, which is why I originally intended to join WIP. I've gone through therapy outside of my school before to help me. And during virtual learning, my school has talked about mental health and wellness a lot, but now we don't talk about it as much. They just tell us to seek help with clinicals in our school. I wish they had done more to, to reach out to students about needing help. They should educate students more on what a counselor does because they might need to talk to someone, but they don't know the limitations of what their counselor can do for them. And also sharing information that could be helpful so they know what to expect and understand what personal information can be kept confidential. I talk to school counselors now and I don't go to therapy, thank God. I feel my school is prioritizing something other than the mental health and well being of students. They're doing the bare minimum for us. They aren't doing anything special. In addition, they have not followed COVID protocols enough to keep us safe. There are many students who don't wear their mask properly and don't follow the six feet apart rule. They even went as far as to keep homecoming during the pandemic, which resulted, resulted in school closing days due to majority of students testing positive for COVID. The school also does not use consistent information when it's needed. They report case, cases late and then don't ensure that students who are in close contact don't come to school. On the topic of mental health, I believe that virtual wellness centers, online sources that includes resources for teens on things such as stress traumas and resilience will be useful to students who need help at the moment, especially when they can't leave their homes to see the topic I've worked on is trauma, and we focus on identifying types of trauma and their causes. We have included resources for youth to seek immediate help, such as hotlines, and learn more about what trauma is and how it impacts them. I think that VWC could especially help at YWP could especially help at TMA and would 
help conflict resolution, people respond to things directly. Um, differently, if you learn how to identify what they are feeling and experiencing, they might understand better ways on how to approach things differently and have a better quality of life. I strongly believe that this is something that we should be addressing because what we do impacts students and who will one day be influencers, businessmen, and leaders of our country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bigby. I don't have a copy of your testimony, your statement. And there were several other individuals for whom I did not have copies of their statements. Um, although from the Young Women's Project, I think everyone, except for you and Ms. Uh, Teckel, I didn't have her statement either. If you could make sure we get it, I'd appreciate that. And I do want to thank uh, each of you from the Young Women's Project. Um, your testimony was very well put together and uh, is helpful and uh, makes a, a forceful case for um, dealing with the social emotional effects of the pandemic. Uh, I did want to just address for um, just a moment. Uh, before I turn to any questions, let me see if Trevon Smallwood, if he uh, has audio. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, hello, Chairman Mendelson. Um, I'm a member of the YWP program. Um, I'm here today to talk about mental health and sharing. Uh, mental health. Um, many high school students are struggling with mental health nowadays. Uh, mostly due to uh, jo joining back to the physical school community after COVID. Um, for example, uh, my school, uh, Ron Brown, we've been having some challenges with uh, lots of the, I would say, difficulties of being physically uh, in person. Um, since returning back to virtual learning, I will say there was a few steps that uh, schools have taken to improve. I think that uh, schools, well, from my personal opinion, opinion and view on many schools, schools uh, sometimes set up QR codes. Um, many teachers can send out updates. And uh, some schools actually have teachers that go and contact parents. Um, since I'm in ninth grade, I believe that I see a future in the school I'm in now. Um, I know that many of these, many of the other members of YWP are much older than me and have seen like the fullness of high school and seeing like the lows and the highs of high school. I think that if we are given help by high powers like yourself, I think that uh, the high school journey will be more proficient for mental, more proficient mentally for many students like myself uh, for the future. Thanks for letting me talk today. Uh, thank you, Mr. Smallwood. So give me just a second here. I'm just gonna be a um, minute or two. Uh, some of you may not have heard me talk about the uh, budgeting with the uh, previous witnesses. The, uh, in a sense, I'm not surprised at what's happening with the budget this year. Uh, DCPS has always had its own, what I will call secret calculations for how to fund schools. And in my view, schools are not the highest priority when it comes to uh, funding, which is a bit shocking to put it that way. Uh, and that's why I introduced a bill, Bill 24-570, which is pending, which is called the Schools First in Budgeting Amendment Act, which would set forth a, um, a formula, so to speak, by which schools would be funded, beginning with their current budget, which may not be the best, 
and I don't mean current as of uh, 2022, current as of whenever one is doing the calculation each year. And, uh, and then adding to it for inflation, adding to it for enrollment increases where those enrollment increases require additional teachers, not deducting from it if there's a reduction in enrollment unless that reduction results in eliminating a class, let's say an elementary school eliminating a class or eliminating a grade. Uh, you can look at the details. Again, it's Bill 24-570. And as I've said several times, I don't think that we have the bill um, quite right yet, but I still believe that that's the best approach because as long as DCPS has its own formula, and uh, there were some who complained that its formula was secret this year, but one never really fully understands what their formula is. And as long as it is there, solely theirs, uh, they, will, they can change it any way they want to. I, I can't explain why a school has no change in enrollment or actually sees enrollment growth and yet is not seeing additional dollars. And there are too many schools where there's a complaint that they simply don't have the resources. Uh, there was testimony near the beginning of this hearing uh, from Mary Levy, who uh, indicated that, uh, I can find her testimony, that um, uh, 61, 61 of 116 schools are currently budgeted for less next year than what they actually have this year. When you factor in um, next year's prices, 76 of 116 schools have budgets insufficient to maintain existing staff and other resources. Um, I realize that the approach is not perfect, but in my view, if we can just get to stability, we will have achieved an enormous improvement over this uh, annual trauma of parents fighting to try to avoid a cut. A last year, cuts in librarians, I don't know what may be cut this year. Of course, we don't have the budget yet, the council. And uh, so we haven't seen all the details. Maybe this hearing will prompt um, the mayor to make some additional adjustments to the uh, budget for DCPS. Um, but uh, I think um, there's a lot of good intention around trying to <clears throat> I don't know, seek transparency or to have a formula that DCPS has. And I just don't think after 20 years of experience that, that that's going to work. I think the council has to prescribe how the schools will be funded. And if the schools are funded first, and then what's left over goes to uh, central administration, some of which is school support, uh, but that, um, that way we know that uh, schools can build and build their communities and keep their communities um, instead of what we have now. Um, Mr. Beam, I think you said you were with Murray. Uh, there are some schools that are seeing cuts because they're losing a funding for a student enrichment program. Is that the case with Murray? I don't want to speak and get something wrong. I'm not entirely positive. I know what Kenyon Weaver and I probably submitted to you would be the best place to look. I do know that we are looking at one of the larger enrollment increases in the elementary schools with one of the lowest funding baselines with multipliers at any of the elementary schools. I realize it gets tricky with the formula when it comes down to at risk, et cetera, and special education. My big confusion with some of that, and I suspect you see this at, at other schools, is I'm not sure where the clairvoyance comes from when central office somehow has an idea how many special education numbers we have for next year, how many at risk we have for next year. That's 40 kids who aren't in the school yet. I don't know what their situation is. And I suspect DCPS doesn't either, but we're getting short change on those numbers. Now I would expect at a minimum that those 40 students who are probably a reasonable cross section of what the school looks like now, which means whatever those numbers were before that should be reflected in that increase. There's no reason for a school with nearly 40 more kids to not have another teacher next year. And just to make a finer point, and I know I'm new to a bunch of this budget stuff, at least when it comes to schools, I've done budgets for all sorts of agencies in town here. It concerns me that these at-risk dollars, from what I hear, and again, new, and I guess this isn't a surprise to you if it is, I apologize. It sounds like those at-risk dollars are looked at as a slush fund. If schools have a great 
PTA coffer that can cough up the money for ink and printer paper and pencils, then that at risk dollar amount goes to a teacher, goes to a special, goes to whatever the school wants to use it for. I, I was heartened to hear about your bill, to read through it. I, I'm hoping that, that what you're prescribing could lead to a lot less of that. It concerns me that schools are able to take advantage of the system like that. It doesn't seem, I know, I know equity gets tossed around a lot. That doesn't sound very equitable to me. Well, when you say schools take advantage, uh, I don't know too many schools, individual schools within DCPS that are ever happy about the budget. Fair. Even if they're taking a cut, I'm not, I don't see too many that are happy. I, I, it is my sense that with what the uh, DCPS did this year, that the high schools are coming out better off. And right. I, I think that's a bad thing. Uh, I think that, uh, Chairman, I think that's fantastic. I'm all for more school funding. My concern with that bill becomes, so we're going to fund, we're going to fund high schools. You're looking at me, a very engaged elementary school parent. I'm not seeing elementary school dollars. What makes you think I'm going to keep my kids in DCPS through high school if I have to talk to you about this every single year? I mean, I, I love know. seeing you. I love seeing you. I don't want you getting sick of me. I think we can do good work together. But, but Chairman, if we've got to fight for our dollars every year, I'm going to come to middle school and I'm going to say, man, maybe a private school isn't yanking my chain. Maybe Montgomery County, maybe Prince George's County isn't going to do this to me every year. And then what happens? I I get the point, although I, you lost me when you said you love seeing me. No other witness today, and there have been about 150, said they love seeing me. But I appreciate Chairman, you, you being here all day, I hope, sends a message for how seriously you want to take these issues and how hard you want to work for them. It would be absolutely ridiculous of you to sit here all day long and not want to fight as hard as you can for everybody that testified today. Yeah. I appreciate you being here. We're all happy to see you. We just want the action and the results and the oversight. We are so yes. appreciative. Well, I introduced, I introduced a couple of bills and we had a hearing in January and included in the hearing was discussion of DCPS's new formula. Um, and what a month and a half later, maybe almost two months later, I'm convinced that the approach I take with bill 24-570 um, is the right way to go. Although it, uh, I emphasize it's not perfect. I, it needs to be, it still needs to be refined, but um, uh, you're absolutely right. Elementary school shouldn't be seeing cuts, and middle school shouldn't be seeing cuts. Uh, I don't know why. A, I don't know why we don't look at a school in the same way that any business operates. Uh, yes, a school is a component of DCPS, but a school is also its own business entity, and businesses don't go from one year to the next. Well, I'm not sure what next year is going to be like financially, and actually having to fight to just maintain its current staffing um, when, when its mission hasn't changed. It's and, a big waste of time for a principal and her staff who do a fantastic job. Uh, more is a great success yes. story. We're straddling six and seven here now. It, I, I'm hoping that, that, that you or whoever else we can work with can work with us to, 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 to convince yeah. the chancellor to adjust a couple of those numbers. Well, and it's discouraging to the parents to have to fight and to fight for a year. It kills more. It kills morale, and 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 it's really disingenuous to ask for any sort of input and then get a form letter back. I think that form letter is really sticking in my craw, and 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 hopefully we can fix something with that. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to testify, uh, Miss Wells. Uh, I have the feeling that you want to say something too, and you did. I'm just waiting to see if you had any questions. I don't think I do. Uh, you made a couple of points, and one of them had to do with the budget. And uh, I know that you've been uh, keeping on top of on top of all this. So uh, I do not. I'm looking at my notes. I don't have any other questions for any of the witnesses here. I appreciate your sticking around to the uh, bitter end. Uh, your testimony is useful with uh, our preparation for the hearing tomorrow, which starts at 9 a.m. with the agency heads. I don't have the list in front of me, but it's the Deputy Mayor for Education, the Office of the State Superintendent of Education, DC Public School System, that would be the Chancellor, the DC Public Charter School Board, the State Board of Education. Um, I don't have the schedule in front of me, but we will be getting the budget from the mayor on March 16th and our education related hearings or hearings on the education budgets will be roughly a month from now, the end of this month.
the end of March. There'll be one day of hearings with um, hearing from uh, non-government witnesses and then one day of testimony from government witnesses. So again, thank you to all of you. That's gonna Thanks, keep sir. us hearing. And um, again, thank you to all of you. The time is 6.42 in the evening and this hearing is adjourned.